All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's two-in-one event that starts off with a debate on the important question, does the geologic column exist? And I am thrilled to have Doc and also Dr. Kent Hoven here to engage this question. Gentlemen, let's get acquainted before we get into our opening statements and opening arguments. Kent, let's start with you, brother. You were just here a couple days ago for a throwdown in the debate octagon with Atheist Jr. on the topic of embryology. Excellent debate. And so it's great to have you back for debate number 354. How you doing today? I'm doing great. God's good, brother. We love it here in Lenox, Alabama. I got Dinosaur Adventure Land. I got to give a tour today. I love giving tours on the Jeep through the mud puddles and all that stuff. Come on down. It's a Christian camp teaching science in the Bible. And we believe the evolution theory is the dumbest religion in the world. Dumb. Ken, tell us how you really feel about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Appreciate the, the intro there. Doc, it's good to have you as well. If I'm not mistaken, this is your second debate with Kent here. And round one, focused on fossils today, we're focusing on the geologic column. So Doc, how you doing today? And also a little bit about yourself. That's correct. And I'm all right. Uh, howdy there, folks. I'm Doc Tordino, or Doc for short. I am a paleontology student, currently working my way through starting my career. Might become an actual doctor sometime soon, but We'll have to see on that. And uh, I mean, I had an okay day, spent most of it cleaning fossils. There you go. Sounds like an interesting day. Doc, good to have you. Kent, good to have you as well. Now to the audience, this is going to be a two-in-one event. So we're going to be debating the topic for the first hour. And then the second hour will comprise audience questions. So if you do have a question, please make sure to send it in and tag me and also opening up the mic for some impromptu Q&A live and also some discussion and debate. Once we hit the two hour mark, Kent is going to get some well-deserved rest and then we'll continue here for a couple hours and just open it up for a more general open mic night on all things creation evolution. But our first portion of tonight's event again is a debate on the geologic column, Doc versus Kent. And so what we're going to do is hand it right over to Doc for a 10-minute opening statement. And so whenever you're ready, let me know. I can start your timer and also get your slides up, up if you're required. All righty. If you wouldn't mind just popping the title up and I'll let you know when to start. Perfect. Uh, so welcome to this debate on the geologic column, folks. Once again, I'm Doc Dino. Here's my side. Hope you enjoy. Let's begin. So, kind of important to this whole discussion, what is geology and what is the geologic column? Well, geology is the study of the Earth, what it's made of, and how it changes. The geologic column is more commonly known as the geologic record. Every layer of rock everywhere on Earth is a part of that record. There's no single pillar of rock that has that title. What's beneath your feet right now is part of the record. And well, it's a geologic record, so rocks are involved. So how do those form? Well, first, there's a few basic types. The first type of rock is called igneous. This is rock that forms from a melt. So you can think of stuff like basalt and a lava flow, or the very famous Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Up next are sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rocks are formed from the fragments of older rock layers. And sometimes the skeletons of many tiny dead organisms, but they're a special kind, I guess you could say. And there's a lot of types. We have flood deposits, we have sand dunes, all kind of stuff. Then the last category is metamorphic rock. This is rock that has been changed by heat and or pressure. The atoms are the same, they've just been rearranged. You can see a couple different types of metamorphic rock below. And, well, that gives away that these rocks change. See, rocks form from pre-existing material and are made of minerals. And every type of rock can morph into a different type. 
it's a really complex web of relationships, referred to as the rock cycle. You can look up more about that if you're interested. But what's important is that all of these changes and processes can and have been recreated in laboratories. We know how these things happen. And when rocks come together, they form layers. They're laid down over time. And that can be a short amount of time, like a lava flow, or a long amount of time, like the mud at the bottom of a lake. Sedimentary rocks, in particular, can form in a wide variety of ways, all of which are very diagnostic. So if we look at a sedimentary rock layer, we can get a good grasp on its depositional environment. That's a where and how the rock formed. And as long as those conditions stay consistent, the rocks will form a continuous layer. Those conditions that form different rocks are very well known. They can be recreated in the lab, and most of them can be observed forming in the field. And I said there are diagnostic characteristics. Some of them are like the size of the particles. Like, are they clay, sand, or boulders? Uh, how uniform they are? And if there are structures preserved in the rock, believe it or not, we can see preserved ripples or mud cracks. Whole bunch of different things. And these rock layers, just like the rocks that make them up, change as well. They can move. They can be buried and squished. They can be pushed around and broken, cooked by lava. And they can be eroded, in part or in whole. Over on the right there is a really good video illustrating how mountains are made and the layers within the rock, within the mountains. It's going to play in this experiment, but we're going to move on. So if we know how rocks form and how they change, we can figure out their history, right? Well, over on the right side of the screen is something called a block diagram. Block diagrams are a drawing of the rocks in an area and how they conform to one another, how they match up. And by looking at diagrams like these, which are reconstructed from the field, we can figure out an area's history. As an example, let's look at layers C and E. When were those made? Well, we probably can't get an exact age, but we can figure out how old they are compared to the surrounding rock. See, this red arrow here points to, or, sorry, points to an erosion line. That line cuts off the top of this pink granite, and layer C is on top of the line, meaning that layer C formed after the granite, because it's sedimentary rock. It had to deposit on something. And then we have this structure here. This is called a volcanic dike. Volcanic dikes are big tubes of magma that punch up through a bunch of different rock layers. But they need rock layers there to punch through. That means that layer C here had to form after the granite, but before the dike. And then we have layer E up here on top of it all. What this tells us is that layer... What this tells us is the granite formed first, then layer C, then the dike, then layer E. This process is called relative dating. It's kind of like saying that Kent is older than me. Or sorry, it's like saying that Kent is older than Donnie, and Donnie is older than me, therefore I am younger than Kent. It doesn't tell you what our actual ages are, but it just says that I was formed more recently. If we want to tell the exact age of rock layers, we have to get a bit more complicated. The most common method for figuring this out is called radiometric dating. There's a lot of types but some of the most commonly used ones in geology are uranium lead dating and potassium argon dating. Not carbon dating, which we'll probably get into later. Now, the crystals that we use for uranium lead and potassium argon, it's very easy to tell if they've been warped or distorted by heat or radiation. So, we can make sure to use undamaged crystals for our measurements so they're not thrown off. We're also very careful in collecting them. And we collect a ton of samples, just to make sure we have a good well, sampling. That's pretty basic science. Now these are usually done, these methods are usually done on volcanic rock. 
And using them, we can get an age range for layer C, since it's bordered by two volcanic rocks. It had to form between them, and then layer E had to form after all of them. If you want to see a video that explains it all really well, you can check out this one by the channel today I found out. I'm going to share the link to this presentation with Donnie. I'll ask him to share it with all of you. It's pretty neat. Now, before I finish, I want to address some of Kent's common arguments I've seen in the past. The first being polystrate fossils. Kent says that petrified trees connect all the layers of rock. It's not quite right. He usually points to two different structures that he calls petrified trees. The first being volcanic dikes, which we've already gone over. The other are a type of ancient plant that grew for a long time in very swampy areas. Swamps that were subject to local floods, meaning that a lot of sediment built up all around them. Those plants were pretty similar to today's horsetails, so they were just fine with getting flooded. Kent also says we use circular reasoning for our dating methods. That we use fossils to date the rocks and rocks to date the fossils. That's not accurate at all. Rock layers are not officially dated by fossils, but their age can be guessed about by the fossils they contain. These ages are not considered official. They're guesses. A stand-in for until we can do actual dating. He also says we don't know if radioactive elements decayed at the same rate in the past. That's not true either. Radioactive elements release heat and radiation, and if those processes occurred faster in the past, we would have a lot more broken and warped crystals. We can say this with certainty because we can make those crystals in the lab and subject them to heat and radiation. Now, especially if Kent wants to say that the necessary decay occurred in the last 6,000 years, the world would be a ball of lava. That's part of what's called the heat problem, and there's no natural mechanism that could remove all that heat. Now, lastly, Kent says that all of the rock layers were deposited in the flood of Noah. That's not quite accurate. This right here is a flood deposit. We know what these look like in the rock, and we don't see them all over the Earth, especially the type of flood that a global flood would be. This right here, this flood, this flood deposit is a basic sequence of layers that anyone familiar with geology should be able to recognize. And they should also recognize that what we see all over the world is far more complex. The complex set of sedimentary metamorphic and igneous rock layers don't follow the simple process of a flood deposit. And we know that because we have flood deposits of all sizes, from little splashes to mega floods that covered multiple US states. And every flood follows that exact same pattern that we don't see all over the world. Thank you for listening. All right, Doc, thank you very much for that 10 minute opening statement. Good timing. I do appreciate it to the audience. Anybody just joining us at the hour mark, we will be taking some questions and opening up the show for some open mic. So stay tuned for that. Okay, Kent, we're now going to hand it over to you and you have 10 minutes. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you for having me tonight. I take the position like I have for many years. There is no such thing as a geologic column. It does not exist anywhere except in the textbook. They've, they've, this whole thing was made up in the 1830s to try to discredit the Bible, to claim the earth is billions of years old. I, I keep asking you, the atheists this question. Maybe we'll get an answer tonight. They claim the top layer is younger. I keep asking the question, where did it come from? How can it possibly be younger? Is it coming from outer space? These Every speck of dirt in the universe is the same age, whether it's 6,000 or 6 trillion. Every speck of dirt's the same age. I don't know how they don't get that. Moving it from here to here doesn't change the date of it. Melting it down and having it come out as lava and being redeposited, it's still the same molecule. It, they don't get it. Every speck of dirt in the world, in the universe, is the same age. Anyway, Charles Lyell made up, began making up this geologic column in the late, eight, late 1700s. And he was a close friend of Charles Darwin. He's best known as his book, The Principles of Geology, which I got on the shelf here. James Hutton was involved in this. This whole geologic column was invented in the 18, early 1800s 
It doesn't exist. It's fiction. They claim the top layer is younger. I keep asking them, where's it coming from? Outer space? They claim the uh, uh, Archean era is 2.5 billion years old at the bottom. And then the Holocene at the top is only 10,000 years old. Well, there's a whole lot of dirt in the Holocene, a whole lot of material. Where was all that hiding for 2.49991, whatever? Where was it hiding? Did it come from outer space? It's not logical to say we moved it from here to here, therefore it's a new age. Look at this. I have a fish fossil here. I have a coffee cup made two years ago. I'm going to put this fossil on top of my coffee cup. Now this fish is less than two years old. It's on top. Mm -hmm. This is the stupid logic that they go through to try to claim these, these layers are different ages. This geologic column, though, that they teach is the Bible for the atheist. And I can understand very well why the evolutionists try to defend the existence of this non-existent geologic column, because that's their Bible. I'm attacking the foundation of their religion. I know that full well, and I intend to keep doing it, okay? No such thing. Uh, they, this guides their thinking through life, through the world around them, through history. They think, well, back in terms, back in the Cenozoic era, or back in the Jurassic period, there's no such thing as a Jurassic period. No such thing. If you get a jar with sand, rocks, clay, water, shake it up, it'll settle into layers in a few minutes. Are the layers different ages? No. We flip these sand toys over all the time and make multiple layers. Uh, are the layers different ages? No. They're all the same age. They're all in here at the same time. This thing made, oh, gee whiz, 25 layers in just a couple minutes while I sat it here. They're not different ages. I don't know how you cannot understand that. How can the top layer be younger? Is it coming from outer space? There's a good article on creation.com. Does the geologic column, does it exist? Anywhere. Let's see. The global stack of index fossils exists nowhere on Earth. Most index fossils do not usually overlie each other at the same locality. So even those in places where all the systems have been assigned, the column is still hypothetical. Locally, many of the systems have not been assigned index fossils by the index fossil contained in the strata but indirect methods to take the column for granted. You can read the whole article for yourself on creation.com. One unanswerable argument to the hypothetical character of the column is nowhere in the world does the complete column exist. And he will argue, oh, yes, it exists in North Dakota, et cetera, et cetera. If you add up the total uh, thickness of these different layers that they're supposed to be, North Dakota has, I think, 10 or 12 percent of the geologic column. They, they, there's, well, that's another, I'll get to that later, okay? Erosion, they argue, is why the complete column is never found. I'm going to cover on my program, Genesis Baptist Church, here soon. I was ready for tonight about the, the different uh, erosion of the continents is a great evidence the Earth is not billions of years old. Because as it erodes into the ocean, it wipes out this geologic column they've got. They say, well, there's isostatic rebound. The continents are rising. Yes, I know, but the top is washing off. It's washed off enough times by rising and washing off. The whole, your whole column would be gone about 60 times. We'll cover that another night on my program. Okay. So while defending the column, they have invented ad hoc reasons to explain the missing geologic periods, which they do not do, which they they did not deny the hypothetical nature of the column. A good article there. It's a fact the earth has layers of rock. Nobody argues about that. The evolutionist says these layers form slowly over millions of years and they're different ages. The creationist says hey, these layers are all from the flood of Noah. All happened in one year. They're tidal marks. The moon pulling the tide up and down, up and down. If the earth were covered in water, <clears throat> like during Noah's flood, <clears throat> the tide would not be banging into continents, getting interrupted, so the tide could become harmonic. They've done studies on this and say, if the earth were covered in water, and there's plenty of water out there to cover the earth, okay, a mile and a half deep. If the earth were covered in water, then the tide would become harmonic and go up and down about uh, a mile and a half. I'm, I'm sorry, go up and down uh, 200 feet. It'd be a mile and a half deep. Be, the water would go up and down 200 feet. Well, if the water's coming up 200 feet for a tidal surge, where's all the water coming from to fill the bump? Uh, sideways. It's a sideways movement of the water that made all the layers that we see on the earth, or nearly all of them, okay, from moving back and forth. The water going back and forth is going to make hundreds and hundreds of layers. Each one's a different tide which is why you can have trees and these all kinds of uh, fossils standing up, running through the different layers. Each layer is about six hours, 12 and a half minutes different, not millions of years. But you evolutionists are always trying to erase that line and make your interpretation be part of the fact. 
No, it's a fact the Earth has layers. That's a fact. It is not a fact that they're different ages, okay? It's the Bible for the evolution. It can only be found one place in the world, and that's the textbook. This textbook admitted it. If there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. Huh. If it existed, it'd be 100 miles thick. The one in North Dakota, I think, is, I forget, 10 or 12 percent, nothing, nothing near what they need, okay? And it's just, it's, even then, that's not the geologic column. It's just the layers that they hope can happen, the sandstone, shale, slate, et cetera. Uh, it's a lie. Lie number seven, I'll video, get my video number seven, get the whole video, oh, video number four. Lies in the textbook in the Creation Seminar Series, 50 bucks for the whole thing, 18 hours. You can watch it, copy it, send it back, get your money back, minus shipping. I can't beat that. Article, a detailed ex examination of the young earth creation is claimed that the column does not exist. It is shown that the entire geologic column exists in North Dakota, talk origins. Or you can read uh, the article I just referenced a minute ago. Uh, there it go. Right here, creation.com deals with the North Dakota uh, site. Okay, if you want to talk about that. Let's see. I'll get up here a little further. Right here. There is no question the earth has layers. I live in a gravel pit. We have all kinds, of, as part of my tour, I give tours every day, drive the Jeep around 140 acres and show the different layers and strata and erosion mark. There's no question the earth has layers. I taught earth science for 15 years. I agree, the earth has layers. Are they different ages? Maybe by a few hours, by, by the flood, the tide, that these are tidal surges doing this. We have salt domes that push up through the layers. You can study all that in earth science class. There's no question the, the, the crust of the earth is pretty complex. It's gone through some rough times. Uh, index fossils are found out of order all over the place. And they'll say, well, that area flipped over. They've always got an excuse for why it isn't what they want, okay? They've already decided what they want, and if it's not that way, they have, they have a list of excuses they can use to explain why it's not that way. And there's no such thing as a fossil record. There are fossils by the trillions, but none of them talk, and none of them have a date on them. There is no such thing as a fossil record. They go by what they call the law of superposition. If it's on top, it has to be younger. That is pure baloney right there, the law of superposition. If the layers are forming sideways with a sideways current of the water and five or six layers are forming at the same time, then the top layer is not necessarily younger. You could have a fossil on top that's actually older than a fossil underneath. I'd, get, I'd ask you to watch the uh, video, excellent video, Experiments in Stratification, uh, done many years ago in the, in the Colorado laboratory. So uh, I agree there is, uh, different layers to the earth, but the, the idea that they're different ages is baloney. Look at that, that cup was made two years ago, there's that fossil, that's less than two. Here's a trilobite on top, wow. Trilobites are younger, less than two years old. I got them in the column right here. The fossil record helps archeologists and geologists place important events. events. Okay, my, my sending is, and I think the debate tonight is on this topic, does the, is the geologic column, does it exist? I would say no, doesn't exist anywhere. And it's, it's, it's based on literally false assumptions. All the layers formed in one year Noah's flood. You mentioned the polystrata trees. I've got a bunch of them here, and I cover the tree, the, the, uh, I forget how to pronounce the hard name, that he, the type of tree that he's talking about from swamps. Okay? Petrified trees standing up are found all over the world, connecting all these layers. I think that one in Yellowstone is part of the Yellowstone Petrified Forest, and that's not one of those trees. Okay, Petrified trees in the vertical position, uh, Nova Scotia has a bunch of them, all formed in because each tide made these layers. The layers are not different ages. So I stand by my position. The geologic column does not exist. This one goes through a seam of coal, more rock layers, and another different seam of coal. How did that happen? It's gotta be all same age. Okay, my time's up, thank you. All right, gentlemen. Thank you for the 10 minute opening statement. Now we do have several points on the table pertaining to our topic tonight, the geologic column. Why don't we first take a couple minutes each, let's say two to three minutes each in the form of a rebuttal. In that way, we know that we're gonna have enough time to make the points and rebuttals that, that we feel are necessary. So doc, let's throw it back to you. Take two to three minutes to address whatever you'd like to. Go ahead. Sure. Well, um, first I will, I will acknowledge that Ken's probably spent a lot of time putting his presentation together in advance, so I don't blame him for not addressing most of my points already, but um, I did address most of the points he made in his opening in mine. Um, so I hope he, well, I hope we can have a good discussion about going through those in the future. Um, 
see the muddy drawer forms layers. Well, we can talk about that. Fish on, no, cup on top of fish. No, fish on top of cup. That's the order it was. We can go over that. Nowhere does the full column exist. I agree. I said that on my first page. And, um, I don't know. The only thing I really want to note is I don't feel it's appropriate to try to make money while trying to save my soul, Kent. Don't really appreciate you shouting out your $50 course. Other than that, I'm good. All right. Thank you, Doc, for that uninterrupted rebuttal. Allow me to restart the timer. Kent, take between two to three minutes, and then I think it'll be appropriate to jump into some discussion. Kent, go ahead. Okay, Doc, you are more than welcome to not buy my videos if you like. No problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, people, I, I, this, I did this for Jackson Rowe on the same thing. I know you're frantic to defend the silly evolution religion you believe in so strongly, and you've been indoctrinated. You're a student in paleontology, and they're pouring this into you, I know, and you're swallowing the Kool-Aid. You should not, okay? But I appreciate your zeal for your religion. It does not matter what kind of trees they are standing up running through the rocks. Here we have these trees that get to be 160 feet tall, the uh, uh, lepidodrum, lep lepidendron, and you claim that because they grow in swamps, that, that explains all the layers. It wouldn't matter what kind of tree it is, it's still going through different layers. And there's no such thing as a Carboniferous period. All over the world, we see layers to the rock. I, I've been to Grand Canyon, I've been to what, 37 countries now in all 50 states many times. I've studied this, I love it. All over the world, we find rock layers that are bent. Now, wait a minute, bent rock layers. And if you look at them carefully, as I've done many times, go up to them and look at them really close, like a Crystal Cove State Park in Los Angeles, California. You get up and look at these rocks, you say, wow, let's really examine them. There are no cracks in the, if the layers are different ages, the, the bottom one would have hardened before the next one's laid down. And they're all bent with no cracks, indicating they were all soft at the same time. If you bend a stack of pancakes while they're soft, you won't get internal uh, uh, fracture marks. These rocks have no internal uh, fracture marks. All the layers of the earth were laid down in one year, Noah's flood. So as far as the earth being a hot ball of lava, if the creation story is true, I don't know where you get that. The Bible says God made it under water. That would not be a hot ball of water. Radiometric dating, we can talk about that if you'd like, but it wouldn't matter. It's all based on assumptions, which are eight assumptions we can talk about for radiometric dating. Let's see, did I cover all his arguments? You're saying rock layers are part of the record. There is no record. The rocks don't talk. You are putting your interpretation on them. The rocks don't talk at all. There's no such thing as a fossil record or a geologic record. There's a bunch of layers to the earth, and they don't talk. I think it's much more logical to say all these layers are the same age. They're all in here at the same time, and the top layer is not necessarily younger. Okay, go ahead. All right, Kent, appreciate it. Gentlemen, that is 10 minutes worth of opening arguments and now roughly two to three minutes of rebuttal. So let's jump into some free-flowing discussion where we can ask each other questions, of course, relevant to tonight's topic. Does the geologic column exist? And so, Doc, mm. let's throw it back to you and, and help help us with our discussion. Go ahead. All right. Well, I guess first thing I can go over. Uh, why are there curvy rock layers? That's a fun one. Uh, before I answer that, Kent, um, I know you're paying attention during my opening. Uh, do you remember what the third type of rock I talked about was? You know, there was igneous and sedimentary. Do you remember what the other one was? Metamorphic. It's been changed by heat or pressure. I understand it really well. Yeah, metamorphic. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, and go ahead. what happens when rocks heat up? When rocks heat up? If it depends, yeah, what it, depends, it depends on how much you heat them. They might just hurt your hand when you pick it up if it's hot, or if it gets too hot, it would melt. But even then, it's not changing oh, okay. the age of the molecules, is it? C correct, it doesn't. So the rocks heat up, and as they heat up, like a lot of materials, like, say, metal or plastic, they get softer. Right. And they can move easier right. if they're hot and well if rocks were say confined in some manner say under a bunch of other rocks and on top of a bunch of other rocks then they wouldn't be able to break apart 
but they would still be really hot and under a lot of pressure, and hot rocks can move. So I think that pretty well explains your curvy rock layers. And also you mentioned that they don't have cracks. A lot of them do. I've seen a lot of these in person as well. Uh, out in the field and in the classroom, online. I've seen a ton of them. A lot of them do have cracks. But uh, a lot of them are pretty small. Some you need to get in there with a hand lens or a microscope. But they are there. So, so which is it? They do have cracks or they don't have cracks? You said both here. They do have cracks. They just might not be big enough for you to see with the naked eye. It depends on how hot they were and how pressurized they were. So it's your contention that all these curvy rock layers are uh, metamorphic rock. Is that your contention? If it could be demonstrated they're all sedimentary, then what would you say? Well, if a wide sand or a, well, you asked me a question. Most of them are metamorphic. There can be sedimentary rocks that can be a bit curvy. Those form in a slightly different way. But we do know how those form. Would you like to hear? You mean rhyolite? Is that what you're talking about? Well, no, oh, rhyolite's yeah. volcanic. Yeah, tell me how they tell me how they form. Sure. So sometimes sediment will form on a slope, say in the ocean, and it can be partially lithified, partially turned to stone, and there can be underwater earthquakes. Well, uh, Kent, before this debate, we agreed not to flip through our slides while the other person's talking. Anyway, I didn't understand, I didn't understand a word of that. What, talk more clearly. What did you say? Prior to the debate, we both agreed to not flip through our slides while the other person was talking. I'd appreciate it if you didn't. I don't um, remember agreeing. I don't remember agreeing to that, but uh, okay. You did in the email, but very I did, well. I didn't answer an email at all. I don't hardly ever do an email. But anyway, sorry if it bothers mm. you. Odd. Anyway. Uh, underwater sea quakes can happen, we register them, and they can cause those partially held together se sediments to slip down a slope. And they form all bunched up. It's actually pretty cool. We can do that in the lab. Um, so we can get metamorphic rocks that are all curvy. We can get sedimentary rocks that are also all curvy. They're pretty easy to explain. They don't have to be fully unsolid okay. sediment. Well, maybe you could be the first one to ever answer this question. If the top layer is younger, where did it come from? Can you win a first place medal twice? Because I did answer that in our last debate. Do you not remember? No, tell, tell me one more time. I, I have a bad memory. Sure, sure, sure. So most of the atoms, uh, they're going to be the same age. Um, and I told you in my opening... Igneous rocks form from melted material. Sedimentary rocks form from pre-existing material, and so do metamorphic rocks. They all come from pre-existing material. Correct. After the Earth was formed, whether it was by conventional science method or, we can say, God created the Earth and the heavens, once that happened, all the material needed was there. It's just right. been moving around ever since. That's been my point. So moving it from here to the top of my coffee cup made it a brand new age. I well, just moved it up not here. quite. Oh, yeah. This is only two years the old. I know. The, fish, really. the age of the fish in the cup did not change, but their positions are new. Kent, if you cut down a bunch of 50-year-old trees and use them to build a house, how old is the house? Well, yeah. But if I was going to, every molecule in the house is, according to you, 4.6 billion years old. Every yes, molecule. Yes, but if you use them to build a house today, how old is the house? Well, that, that's a good point. You can, you're going to date the house by when it got built, when it got moved into, when the age of the materials that are in the house. Yeah, I might have bought the bricks and set them there for 20 years before I used them. So, yeah, that, that's the whole When point. the house was finished being built. If that's what you yesterday, want to go by. Right, sure. How you old is the house? Yeah, you can date it that way. Usually you can take the toilet and lift the lid up and look at the date on the back of the toilet to tell if it's a new house when it was built. Uh, usually they start with a new toilet. But uh, you're missing the point, though. All the layers, you're claiming that these layers are different ages, and we can, we can know the age of these layers. By, yes. how, do you know, how do you know if, 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 you find, if you find a layer of rock, how would you tell if it's Jurassic limestone or Cambrian limestone or Mississippian limestone? 
Don't each of these eras contain limestone? How do you, what's the difference between well, Jurassic limestone and Permian limestone? Well, before we get to that topic, uh, we want to go one topic at a time. Okay. So let's say 50 years ago, your grandpa cut down a bunch of trees and used them to build a shack. Then he built another shack 10 years later with some of the remaining wood. And then some more 10 years later, and so on and so forth. All of the wood that makes up these shacks is the same age. Okay. But the shacks are different ages. That's okay. what we are measuring when we measure the age of a rock layer. We're measuring the oh. time that the layer was formed. Not that the atoms in the layer were formed. Okay. Does that make well, sense I'm to you? To I'm going to form a new layer on top of my coffee cup. So this one has got to be younger than this one. Has to be. Yeah, the formation of the layer. layers just happened, even if the constituents it was have been around on my for desk a while. Before. It was sitting on the desk before, but I moved it now on top. So now mm -hmm. it's younger. Isn't it younger? No, it was moved oh. and deposited. The particle is still the same age. The formation is new. And we can so date by, the ages of formation. So by taking the 50-year-old logs and building a cabin 20 years later, or a shack, I'm sorry, the, is the, is it 30 years old or 50 years old? Is that your question? Because that would be my question, too. How would you date it? Would you give it an age? The of age of the shack old? starts when the layer is finished. The age of the shack is when the shack is finished forming. If we're okay. talking about rock layers, really easy way to do this is with radiometric dating. The rock is made of minerals, and the minerals form in a sequence over time. And we can use those minerals and the radioactive elements within them to figure out how old the minerals are, the rock is, and the layer is. Okay, I'm sure you're aware that the geologic column was created in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and radiometric dating didn't come around for 120 years until 1950, Willard Libby, University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So how did they know the age before Willard Libby came along? They gave them ages. We didn't. We just had guesses. That's... During that point in time, we just used relative dating, really. Some people tried to put estimates on the ages of rocks, but those were usually pretty tentative. We didn't get absolute dating until the in, until we learned about radiometric dating. And you're are right. you aware of, you're aware of all the assumptions involved in radiomet radiometric dating? Would, is that what you, I thought the, the debate tonight's on geologic column, but if you want to bring we'll go to that, we certainly can. Uh, well, you dating. brought up the topic. What now? You asked how old, how we know how old they are. You brought up the topic. Well, how did how did Hutton know how old they were? Because he gave them an age. Hutton gave an estimate. He didn't know the actual age. Well, how, how did he? Lyle gave estimate? estimates too. So did, oh, uh, what was that famous physicist Isaac Newton? No, mm -hmm. I don't know. Someone who did a lot of things with heat. A lot of people tried to give estimates, but it wasn't until radiometric dating that we stumbled on a way to actually give an actual date. Okay. And actually on the topic of old geologists, you say that the geologic column was invented for what purpose again? Well, most of these geologists who were involved in this were trying, trying to get away from the idea of Noah's flood being the explanation for the layers. Up until that time, up until the late 1700s, the average person thought they'd see layers in the earth. Wow, this is a result of Noah's flood. But see, that, that Noah's flood brings the idea of God's judgment on the world. Oh, they don't like that. Let's find a way to get rid of God, get rid of the flood, get rid of the judgment, and we can live our life the way we want. Well, That's what they really want. See, I, I'm not sure that quite fits. Considering yeah. all the early geologists I can think of were very Water. devout Christians. Oh, I don't know. Some of Charles them might have been. Was, James Hutton was, William Buckland all the ones I can think of, at least in the 17 to 1800s, they were very devout Christians to their dying uh, breath. And they, uh, in fact, they wanted to study the natural world to bring glory or to understand the glory of God. And right. up until the uh, 1800s, a lot of them did say that the flood probably caused the layers. We just learned more since then. Right, but see, that was back before they had DVD players and they couldn't watch my videos because that would have really rescued them from coming up with such a dumb idea that they did. I can help them. That we should study the natural world to better understand God? 
I think studying the natural world is wonderful. I do it all the time. I love, I did a whole series on making babies with 50 some different animals and plants and how they make babies. And I asked the evolutionist to please answer, how did this evolve? Nobody took the bait. Nobody did one of them. I love studying the natural world. We have a science center here, a theme park. We have a petting zoo. I love studying nature. To me, every time I look at it, I say, wow, God, you are so smart. You're amazing. I don't have a problem praising God. Well, I do, if I you love studying nature and you love praising God, how do you recognize a flood deposit? What do floods look like in the rock? Can you tell me? Well, if the flood, with what we call tidal pumping, see, the earth is turning and it is round for you flat earthers, knock it off, okay? The moon is up there, right, about this size, okay? The moon is pulling oh. on water on the earth right now, and it lifts it up mm -hmm. uh, about five feet in Florida, different heights in different areas, and it holds that bump called the tidal bulge. The earth is spinning around under the bulge. So the water is mm -hmm. always being sucked in from the east at the same speed the earth is turning. At the North Pole, mm -hmm. it's turning zero. At the equator, 1037.6. Lenox, Alabama, 31.3 degrees north. We're turning 886 miles an hour. So the water is going sideways at that speed uh, to stay under the bump. It still happens today, okay? Mm -hmm. But because it gets interrupted all the time, banging into North America, South America, et cetera, you don't get the effect that you would get during Noah's flood coming up and down 200 feet. Oh, I see. Uh, harmonic, harmonic type. So, so it's the sideways movement mm -hmm. of the water that made all the layers. So, uh, Kent, that... That actually, ooh, I got a, I got a fun question. So, if water is moving in a direction, say west, uh, if the water creates dunes or ripples under the water, what direction will the dunes or ripples be moving? Well, that can go all sorts of crazy things. Watch the video "Experiments in Stratification," where they did exactly that with a, a three-foot high, four-foot wide flume with the water moving through it and they poured different density materials into there, it made all sorts of crazy patterns. Uh, you can get a, you can get a, an underwater dune, you are correct. That'll cause the, the layers to be deformed, all kinds of crazy ways. I don't think well, you can find no, anything on earth that can't be explained with Noah's flood. Well, Kent, that wasn't my question. What direction will the dunes be migrating in? Because we can figure that out. Well, if the tide's If the water is moving we'll, west, what okay, way will the dunes be moving? It's gonna be complicated now. If the tide's coming up, it's going to suck water in. If the tide's going down, it's going to push the water out. So you can probably get both directions. I don't think that's quite right, because the Earth is constantly rotating, so the tidal bulge would be going in the same direction constantly, and so would the water. And that would well, produce, say, sand dunes moving west. No. So we shouldn't have any sand dunes that are going east that That's were formed by water, should we? No, no? because no? If it, it has to pull the bump up, and then it has to empty the bump. Now there's where it starts going the other direction, or even north-south. I think you can get all kinds of things. Plus, if at the same hmm. time, if you have the crust of the earth all cracked up from Noah's flood, when the fountains of the deep broke open, the pole plates the size of Texas might have shifted and turned. And you might have had dunes that were made during the flood facing one way, and now they're reoriented. Do you agree the Earth has tectonic plates, and they're moving around, shifting around, even now? Yes, they do. Okay, good. And Me how too. quickly do those plates move? Oh, it depends on a lot of different factors. It's, it's, too, it's too hard to give an answer to that. I, I think when they were freshly cracked, before they had a chance to seed into each other, well, during Noah's flood, they might have moved a lot faster than they are now. Really? Most of them now are locked in. They don't move at all. Uh, stationary fault. There's hmm. strike faults and slip faults, and none of them are my fault, but okay. The earth has cracks, and the, the, some are not moving at all. Some are moving, I don't know, the one in Japan, I think it's the fast, or maybe Iceland is the fastest moving one. Uh, so I don't, I don't know the number. I could look it up, though. Okay. Um, and the faster they move, the more heat they produce from friction, right? Well, that depends. Underwater, a lot of that would be dissipated depending upon the thickness of the water. It would, the friction would generate heat which could be dissipated through other factors like deep water, and you wouldn't feel it you know, 100 miles away. But I think the, mm. the, the, heat, the heat coming out, the hot water coming out, would kill the organisms by the trillions, especially things like diatoms. They would snow to the bottom, and you would get thick layers of diatomaceous earth from Noah's flood. I mean, the one in California, Lompoc, mm -hmm. California, I think I mean, it's 300 feet thick. You would diatoms. have a lot of diatoms. Interesting. Well, see... 
Wait, wait. A lot are, of people have done the math on fast moving plates. Hang on. A lot there of people, including creationists. And the numbers they consistently come up with are enough to completely boil away all of the water on Earth and turn the planet into lava. Okay, now you um, so want I, me to I'm not sure to... that works, Kent. I'm not sure that okay. works. So because you're not sure how it works, therefore all the universe fit in a dot smaller than an atom and exploded 13.7 billion years ago, and the Earth well, formed as a hot That's of irrelevant, rock. sir. What? That is irrelevant. We're talking about the rock layers and how the rock forms. Right, I, right. Said, I said earlier, God could have created the Earth, but the Earth has been moving around since then. And, well, honestly, I don't know. We don't really have flood deposits. Like, we have lots of rock layers that formed in a lot of different ways, which we know because we can recreate them in the lab and see them forming today. And I, I don't think a flood can really create, say, sand dunes that were formed above water. Okay, well, I'll show you the video when we get to heaven. Try to get the video to wherever you are at the time, and maybe you can watch it. Mm. If you if you oh, saw that it happen, threat, Kent, that's a lovely threat. Thank you. That's a threat. So happy you're rooting for my immortal soul. Thank you. I would love to see you give your heart to the Lord and get saved. I don't know, but if you're not saved and going to hell, then I'll, I'll try to. Maybe God will explain it to you. Let me show you the video. Well, Here's see, what the happened. funny thing. Sure the funny thing is, Kent, a lot of geologists are Christians. Like a lot of them. Right. And I've already mentioned the founders of geology. Pretty sure all of them were Christians. There's a lot of very important ones still alive today. So I'm not sure a belief in a young earth is necessary to be saved. Especially since if God created the earth, well, I'm not sure why you would ignore God's creation when it's screaming that it's an older age. Uh, I, don't uh, hear it, I don't hear it screaming anything. I got all kinds of fossils. They don't talk at all. I look at the fossils and say, wow, this poor thing died in the flood of Noah, a petrified closed clam. Clams mm -hmm. open as soon as they die. We got hundreds of petrified closed clams in our Some museum. Do. Clams also like to bury themselves in the mud, and they can't open themselves when they're buried. And some right. don't even open up at all. I'm just not understanding your verbiage here. Can you, what is it, the microphone or what is it? Why am I? Sure. Clams like to bury themselves. Right. And when they're buried, they can't open. A lot of clams also just don't open when they die. Some do, but not all do. Okay. Some slam shut tighter. So clams. So I'm not that sure are that's closed. the evidence you're thinking it is. Wait a minute. Clams that are closed and petrified buried themselves and committed suicide? Don't they normally bury themselves and then come back out? No. Not all of them, especially if they die while buried. So they're committing suicide? No, they just die like every other living thing. So they're too stupid to know, hey, I can't, shouldn't bury myself like this? No, that's how they make their living, and that's how they keep themselves safe. So they make their living by going down deep and dying? Badgers dig burrows too and they die in those burrows they're not stupid that's what they do to keep safe they intentionally die isn't it more logical well, they to don't say want so? to die but they do oh. die there yeah that's sad well they find them all over the world including the top mount everest so you get petrified clams mm -hmm. that are closed by the thousands by the millions there's a place in tennessee there's probably millions of them in one hillside so the point my point would be uh well bigger picture the Bible says at the end of time, there would be scoffers who would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. I think the flood is the best explanation for all the fossils that we have. Put my slide up there for a minute. I think the fossils are sorted a little bit. Like I've said many times, they're sorted based upon habitat. Clams would usually be found under birds because clams live at the bottom and they're the first ones buried. Birds are the last ones buried in a locality if there's a flood. It might be sorted based upon intelligence or mobility or habitat or body density. There are other reasons besides the clam evolved into a bird. You well, guys look at the first, fossils I wouldn't in order say that and, bit, but I would say that I would say that doesn't really work 
like your uh, your methods there. I don't think that really works. Say, uh, as an example, do you know what a whale is? I didn't understand. Do I know what a whale is? Is that what you said? Do you know what a whale is? Yes. Oh, there's, so I don't know how many different kinds. I think nearly 100 different kinds of whales. But yes, I got the general picture. Sure. Okay. Do you know what a mosasaur is? I can't hear you. What a what? What a, a mosasaur, mosasaur is. I, I did not understand a word of that. A mosasaur. Mosasaur? Yes. Okay. I know. Okay. And do you know what an ichthyosaur is? Ichthyosaur? Yes, sir. Okay. All of these animals would have roughly the same density. They'd have roughly the same mobility, intelligence, and same habitat. They all live in the open ocean. And yet they are always separated in the rock. Why is that? Well, maybe they don't hang out together. I bet, you know, I've, I've, I've heard, uh, I've asked quite a few evolutionists, has anybody ever found human and chicken footprints in the same rock strata? So far, nobody's come up with an answer. If we've never found human and chicken footprints in the same rock strata, that proves humans and chickens didn't live at the same time. So with the fact that we, don't find, a whale in, that we don't find a mosasaur and a whale and an ichthyosaur in the same rock, therefore that proves what? They don't hang out together. Well, I mean, do you have evidence for that? Or can there be another mechanism that explains it? I've got evidence they because don't hang out together because they're not found, found oh. together. We do find them in the same geographic area. Like, let's say we find them all in Wyoming or, say, Pakistan or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we find them in rock layers that are at different heights. Why is that? Well, the flood of Noah would have deposited layers and the tide going up and down would have made many, many layers. Noah was in that ark for a year. And you get that, what, mm -hmm. that right now in the Pacific Ocean, they're what they call trash islands. Because of the Coriolis effect of the Earth spinning, the oceans have a current. A north of the hemisphere, they spin one way, south of I mean, the equator, south of the equator, they spin the other way. But these ocean currents, because of the Coriolis and the drag of the Earth, they, they, the, the trash is swirling and ending up in huge, what they call trash islands. I think during Noah's flood, you get the same effect with dead carcasses floating, and they would be separated a little bit based upon density or mobility or body texture or resistance to water flow. All kinds of things can do that, mm -hmm. but you would get you get buried, you get giant trash piles of dead animals. They might have died a thousand I, miles away. That's an interesting hypothesis. I think it beats um, the idea that all the animals came from a dot beats that hypothesis big time. Well, I never said that, Kent. In fact, I do, do, said do I'm not saying big, that. Oh, do you believe the Big Bang theory? Irrelevant to this discussion. So you don't want to answer it. I understand. Go ahead. No, it's just irrelevant. Okay, I'm not. What is this that. a topic about? Know. Geologic column. You think all these layers of rock are uh, different ages? Okay. So did all these, did it all has these nothing atoms, to do with the Big Bang. Well, did all these atoms that make up the geologic column come from a Big Bang? That would be relevant. If all the they're all probably about they, the same age. Yeah, did they come from a Big Bang? Is that where it all started? They're all about the same age. So they all came from a Big Bang. That's a you're not, your Honor, he's not answering the question. I'll answer for him. No, yes, Kent, I am answering it, just not in a way you like. They are okay. all the same age, regardless of if they came from the big, regardless of if they came from the Big Bang or if God created them. They are the same age. I agree with you on that. So you're agreeing? There's no geologic column then. The ages aren't different. The ages can't be different. Thank no, you. Kent, okay. because I've already explained how I've already explained how rocks form and how rock layers form. And that the layers can form at different times. So if you move it to the top, like you take the 50-year-old logs and build a 10-year-old cabin. Or I'm going to move my fish again one more time. Maybe you'll get it. It's now on top, top of the coffee cup, which I know is two years old. So this fish has got to be less than two years old. Moving no, it from it one area to another. That formation another. is, that particular formation is new. It can be made of older parts. Just like rock layers are often made of older parts. Okay, so they're telling the kids they're in made school. Made of old atoms. Well, they're telling the kids in school that the uh, Carboniferous era is, what, 450 million years old? Uh, Cambrian era, mm -hmm. 100 million years old. Uh, so how do they know the Cambrian era is 100 million years old? I think the Cambrian's a bit older than 100 million. Okay. 
let me get it up here. I, 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 get, I collect public school textbooks. I've got hundreds of them. So I keep asking the question, where's this dirt coming from? I got too many slides here, brother. Uh, so Kent, yes. before I answer that, I have already answered that. What did I say before? You've said a lot of things before. I don't remember everything you said. They came from pre-existing material. They can be from a malt, or they can be solid right. pieces of previous rock, or they can be older rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure. Sure, metamorphic They're rocks. pre-existing material. Therefore, it's a new age now. It's a brand new age because it got melted and recycled into metamorphic rock. Is that your, is that your answer? The layer is a new age. The layer is the same age? Well, so oh, yeah, if, let's say, we have a sedimentary rock layer, and that layer gets metamorphosed, right? the original sedimentary layer is still the same age, but the date of the metamorphism, that's new. It's still the same rock layer. It's been changed. So I've got this 100 million year old sedimentary rock, and we melted it and put it on top as a volcano came out as a lava flow or something, and it's now a new, it's now the same age? As it was before? Well, or did if it? you melted it and then allowed it to cool, it would right. form new crystals. And the crystals okay. would record a date of zero. Well, the crystals are still made of the same atoms. Now, come on, we didn't form new crystals. Yes, we formed they crystals. are made of the same. Again, Kent, the atoms are the same, but they can form new crystals. Right. So when you're dating that with carbon dating by these crystals, or not carbon dating, potassium, argon, rubidium, nope. strontium, but one of these, you're nope. actually dating right. the time the crystal formed, not the layer. Correct. Yes. You're dating the time the crystal formed, and the crystal is in the rock, and the rock is in the layer. If that rock is native to that layer, and that crystal is native to that rock, which we can check, then, since we know the age of the crystal, we know the age of the rock, and the age of the layer. Okay. Um, many evolutionists have admitted or agreed that they do use circular reasoning to, de to date these things. There you go. <laughs> I've already American addressed that, Kent. Please don't. Oh, no, I want the audience to hear this. This is from the Ameri mm -hmm. American Journal of Science. Okay, what, nearly 50 years ago. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply. Hmm. Arguing in a circle, Encyclopedia Botanica. A succession of organisms is determined by a study of their remains in the rocks, and the relative age of the rocks is determined by the organisms. Circular reasoning. Fossils have been and so still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks. Wait a minute, this is 1983. This is a long time after they invented carbon dating, but they're still dating them by the fossils. I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So, Kent, one yes, topic sir. at a time, please. Okay, sure. So, is, so our dating methods do not use circular reasoning. They don't? We do not officially date the ages of rocks by the fossils they contain. When we find a fossil in a rock layer, we can provide a tentative age. Say, for example, uh, for the last hundred years, we've been finding E. rexes. And every time we date the rock layer it came from, we get an age of between 66 and 70 million years. Every single time we find a T. rex. Now you so say if we, we go to a new place. You say we. You're involved we in this? You're doing this? Okay. The scientific community can't. Ah, okay. They didn't ask so if me. we go to a new they place didn't. and we They'd find a T Rex in a rock formation, we can guess based on all of our previous data, it's probably between 66 and 70 million years old. Now, that's not an official date. Okay. If, if but it's a guess. Found, if somebody found a T Rex tooth embedded in a human skull, and they took it to the mm -hmm. university and said, what, what is this? How could a T-Rex from 66 million years ago bite the head off of a human? What would you say? Uh, would they throw out the fossil because it can't be true? Would they redate everything? Nope. There have been all kinds of strange things found that don't match your geologic column. 
So, Kent, I've been, that the would be a very fascinating fossil, and I would love to see that. Okay. But okay, I don't think you can produce anything like that. It I would cause us to rethink a lot of things, though. Okay, I have been to and walked in the dinosaur footprints in Glen Rose, Texas, that have human footprints mm -hmm. superimposed. Sometimes the human step in the dinosaur footprint. And sometimes the dinosaur step mm -hmm. over the human footprint obliterated part of it. You can see the trail yes. of the man's track with six so, feet. So, so Kent, those can, can be, be a true, few different it? things. Well, Kent, let me address what you said. Those can be a few different things. Some of them aren't Donnie, human tracks at all. I can't understand what he's saying. Can you fix the microphone? It's blabbering. I can't understand it. Talk clearly. Well, if you stop it? talking, you could hear me better. Okay. I'm trying. <clears throat> Gentlemen, let's do this because we just had 30 minutes of really good free-flowing discussion. There's been some healthy crosstalk, but that's okay because we did get our 10 minutes of openings. We also got our three-minute uninterrupted rebuttals. Let's go back to equally timed responses. That way it'll be easier to hear each other without any crosstalk and echo. So, Doc, let's hand it to you. Feel free to make a couple points, maybe ask a question, and then we'll hand it to Kent, then we'll throw it back to you, and, and we'll go that way for the last 10 minutes here before Q&A. Go ahead. Sure. So, the dinosaur and human tracks from Glen Rose, Texas. First off, a lot of the human tracks, quote-unquote, are not human. They are not. We know how those form. Those are dinosaur tracks. If you want, I can go through the exact process and how they formed. Otherwise, we have what are called concretions, which are very common in that formation, that rock formation, that rock layer. And some of them have oblong shapes, like a human foot, but they're concretions. In the last case, there's a lot of fakes. A lot of fake human, Fred Flintstone-looking feet over laughably bad dinosaur footprints. In fact, Kent, I've seen you use one of those photos in your slide, and it is the fakest-looking track I have ever seen. Hey, we have some castings here of those footprints in our museum. I've been there. I've walked in them. I knew you, you can't accept it, no matter how perfect it is, with the mud squeezed up between the toes and the, the width of the foot compared to the length and the stride and the, and the uh, arch under the foot, all perfect. Mm -hmm. It can't be true because it doesn't match your religion. You're doing very you well at trying to defend your religion, but that's all you're doing. If you're a religious zealot, you don't want to believe dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. They did. There's lots of evidence for that. There's even evidence some may still be alive. You guys have with your geologic column the trilobite as the index fossil for the Cambrian era, yet it's got the most complex eye ever in the world. 1,300 lenses. The trilobite is the first one to evolve. 450 billion or million years ago, it's got it's more complex than our eyes today. The trilobite eye, well, I've got see ways we got stuff. I think we're going, but this goes into the geologic column again. The trilobite is supposed to be the index fossil of the Cambrian era, and yet they're not only one of the most complicated eyes ever found in nature. They find some huge trilobites, okay, fossils, okay, and they've got this complex eye. And there probably are some trilobites still alive today. If, they, if I found a living trilobite and brought it to you, and you watch it crawl around in the table or a laboratory under the water, what would you say? If you found a living dinosaur, if they caught one in the Congo swamp and put it in the Brooklyn Zoo, they would put a sign next to it that said, wow, one survived for 70 million years because they're not going to give up their geologic column. That's their Bible. Trilobite eyes are the most complex eye we know of. And that's the first creature to evolve? Stop and think. May I address getting, that? Yeah, we're getting yep. the dinosaur the human footprint here for you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so first off, trilobite is being complex. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And they weren't the first life forms. We have plenty of fossils going back much farther than the earliest trilobite. Other than that, um... If we found a trilobite living today, I would love it. That'd be really, really cool. We do not have those. And no, the giant sea lice you showed on your screen a minute ago don't count. Those are isopods. They're a completely different type of animal. Uh, is that the dino-human footprint? 
Okay, we'll throw it back to Kent. Kent, I think you have to unmute on your end if you're – yeah, you're I'm, good. I'm, I'm good. Go ahead. This is a casting of a dinosaur footprint with a human stepping in the footprint. You can see the toe marks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a clear human left foot. Uh, so I think you're mistaken. If it was proven without beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were human and dinosaur footprints together, if, mm -hmm. if it could be proven, and I think there have been, I forget how many, 56 human footprints found in this, in this area, uh, Glen Row, Texas, uh, you, you can see it's the man walking. You can see the stride of the man walking. I'm sorry, it was a human footprint. But I know that doesn't fit your religion, and you can't believe that because it, it would mess up everything for you. You got to get a degree, you know, in this stuff. So, dinosaur and human footprints. Let's see, right here. Okay, sorry, Kent. Could you pop up that picture or pop up that uh that mold thing you have again, please? The mold. Yep. Yep. There we go. Here is the dinosaur okay. track. The human yep. track goes this way. There's the yep. heel down. The heel is down here. Hmm. Yeah, that no. doesn't look like a dinosaur track. Oh, it can't be. I know it can't be. Yes, I know. No, Kent, it's just that I've seen a lot of dinosaur tracks. That does not look like a dinosaur track. I'm sorry. Whoever you paid or whoever you paid for that ripped you off. Whatever you paid for that degree, you're getting this place to money too. If you're going to teach you, you know, we came from a rock and the layers are different ages. You should get your I'm money back. It doesn't tell me that. Gentlemen, and, uh, unless, Donnie, would you mind popping up something on screen? It's garbled again, Donnie. What's going on? He's just asking um, if he can share his screen. Go ahead. So what you're looking at here is the main way a lot of the man tracks at Glen Rose actually formed. They are from a group of dinosaurs that had very long metatarsals, which is the bones that lead to your heel. And when they stepped into very soft mud, their toes would sink in and their metatarsals would press against the mud. We can see this happening today with birds like cassowaries or emus. And they make tracks just like this, but with two toes. The toe, the mud above the toes squishes together, and we can see this really easily, especially in color photographs. And we especially know this because there are places where the trackway returns to a normal dinosaur footprint in the same trackway. There. Okay. Kent, we'll throw it back to you. Go ahead. What are your thoughts on okay. that? Okay. Well, I'm get, get calling. I have 50,000 slides. I'm trying to get there as quick as I can. Uh, I'm just asking if it could be proven that the footprints were found together, you still would not accept it because it goes against your theory. Uh, I, no, this is I would accept it, Kent. It'd be very fascinating, and I'd love to see that. It's just I've never seen you show anything that either looks real or can be verified. Uh, this is one of the obvious dinosaur tracks in Glen Rose, Texas. Would you accept that that's a dinosaur track? It appears to be one, yeah. Okay. Uh, we will get the casting in a minute, but uh, the, the, point is, the point is, I'll make a different point. If we could prove that dinosaurs and humans live together, if we could prove mm -hmm. that trilobites and humans live together, if we mm -hmm. could prove that any of these so-called index fossils you're claiming, if we could prove that these live together, would you accept it? Yes, it would you be would. fascinating, and I would love to see that. Okay. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. They have here the trilobite as index fossil for the Cambrian era. If you found a trilobite in a rock layer, what age would you give that rock layer, and why? Well, it depends on the trilobite. There have been thousands of trilobite species. Right, right. So are if the trilobites I recall, all of them are found between the Cambrian and Permian. So a pretty wide stretch of time. It would depend. Sure. But it would all be millions of years, right? Well, yes. Okay. We found no evidence that the Earth is younger. Oh. You've, you've and I still have yet to see any evidence. I have 
heard your hypotheses, which you don't really have any evidence for, or at least none that I've seen. Um, whereas everything I brought up, at least in my opening, can be verified by pretty simple experiments. Gentlemen, Doc, since you kickstarted the conversation, Kent, let's give you a real quick final word on the discussion. We'll jump into three minute closing statements and then we'll take some live audience questions before okay. we reach the two hour mark. Go ahead, the, Kent. The layers are dated by the types of fossils they contain. That's how they were for 120 years. Now carbon dating or potassium argon or rubidium strontium or the different crystal dating comes along. And can't find it, Titus? About yay big, this big, weighs 10 pounds, aluminum casting of a human footprint. No? Okay. Well, Bobby knows where it is. Where'd Bobby go? Anyway. Okay. We have a, come visit our museum. Uh, we will give you the tour. Like we've had several evolutionists come. We'll do the debate right here, and I can hear you better. Right, sit at the, right next to me. Uh, my position is all the layers would have formed in one big flood in the days of Noah from the tide going up, down, up, down, which is also sucking it in and out, in and out. If you look at these layers and claim they're different ages, you're crazy. These layers are all in here at the same time. Hydrologic sorting is water moving sideways, sorting animals based upon a lot of different factors and for forming all the, the layers that we have today. To believe that all the layers in the geologic column and the whole earth itself fit in a dot smaller than an atom is insane. You couldn't squeeze a cup of water into a dot smaller than an atom. But you guys have, it's, it's, that's dumber than the flat earthers, in my humble opinion, okay? And they're those who can't figure out if they're male or female. So I think it's crazy to, to say all this came from a dot and all the layers are different ages when every molecule is the same age. All the fossils formed during Noah's flood. Fossils aren't forming today. Tell me where fossils are forming. It's not hard, it's not hard to find fossils. There are trillions of them, but they're not forming today. They were all formed because of Noah's flood. And there may be a little sorting to them for lots of different various reasons, just like the trash heaps are sorted in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. As the water swirls around, the denser stuff goes to the middle and the lighter stuff to the outside. So anyway, I think it's, the flood is a much better explanation for all we see of the geologic column. And I stand by my uh, position that there is no such thing. All the layers are the same age. Okay, thank you, Kat. Doc, if there's anything you'd like to respond to there or simply wrap up your thoughts and points from the discussion, go ahead. We'll give you three minutes and then we'll give Kent three minutes. Then we're going to take some live questions. Go ahead. Sure thing. Okay. So we date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rock layers. No, Kent, we don't. I've explained why several times during this debate. I wish you would stop saying that. In other news, well, in other news, you provided no real evidence for a global flood. Once again, you provided your hypothesis and no real supporting evidence. And Donnie, would you mind uh, popping up what I am sharing right now? Yeah, you're good. So I just want to say as a closing... To the folks out there listening, you can accept conventional geology and still be a Christian. Countless Christians do all over the world, and in fact, there have been thousands of important geologists, paleontologists, and biologists who were and still are Christians for their entire lives. Most of the important figures in the history of geology have been Christians, and were to their dying breath. And over here on the right, if you're interested and want to pause and read, is a quote from Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who I'm sure many of you recognize. She found a way to reconcile her faith with the evidence of the natural world without throwing away either. You can too. Please look into the stuff that was brought up tonight. I guarantee you'll learn more about God's creation. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Kent, you get three minutes. Well, I love the way they, they constantly use the word accept. You can accept evolution as if, you know, if, if you don't believe in it, you're dumb or something. No, you, you believe in evolution. You believe in the geologic column. It's not something you accept. I accept the fact that there's a fish fossil in this rock. I accept that. I can see it. I'm holding it. I do not accept the idea that they're millions of years different in, 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 in millions of years old. Okay. I don't accept that. I believe this fish fossil, probably fossilized, died in Noah's flood. 
So uh, you, you could also accept the Bible and still be a paleontologist and learn about different rocks and learn how different the hardness of the rocks and learn about drilling water wells and oil wells. There's a lot of useful stuff in paleontology, but I'm, I'm gonna point out my last, I, I got time here. They do have circular reasoning. This is from, let's see, Niles Eldridge, a famous atheist, I don't know if he's atheist, a big name evolutionist. He said, paleontologists cannot operate this way. There's no simple way to look at a fossil and say how old it is, unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. And this poses something of a problem. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time? This was in 1985, 30 years after they invented dating methods, okay? The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. Stratigraphy cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using temporal concepts. Circularity is inherent. It's circular reasoning. The charge of circular reasoning can be handled several ways. It can be ignored, not the concern of the public. In other words, none of your business how we do it. It can be denied, call down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a practice or it can be avoided. There, it is circular reasoning. Uh, <clears throat> this guy at uh, I, I, I own a College, are the authorities maintaining on one hand that evolution is documented by geology and geology is documented by evolution? Isn't that a circular argument? Yes, it is. You cannot possibly know the age of these layers. Uh, the geologic column simply doesn't exist. All the layers form by lateral movement of the water during Noah's flood. Tidal pumping up, down, up, down, brings the water in, out, in, out of the tidal surge. Watch experiments in stratification. And the video has been out for, what, 30 years now? Just watch it. They show it happening. And you still would all want to believe it. So I feel sorry for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kat, for that closing statement. And to the both of you for wrapping up your thoughts and points. I got a few questions here from the audience. So we'll engage those. And then I'll bring in a, a couple people for some live open mic before we reach the, the two hour mark. And then we'll transition to a general open mic at that point. And so, okay, let's start, I guess, here. Super chat from Robin Webster. Appreciate it. $5 super chat. Uh, Robin's not specifying anybody, so let's work through it together. Find out who it's for. Why does every fossil fuel company use the geological column and radiometric dating to locate oil? A failed drill, I think Robin meant. A failed drill can cost oh, uh, up to 20. Oh, I'm sorry, Doc. Go ahead. Oh, well, uh, still like an oil pump. Oh, okay. And uh, okay. I believe this is for Kent. Okay. Kent, what are your thoughts? Go ahead. Well, I don't think there's any question. They've studied. I lived in East Texas, Longview, Texas. We had uh, 30,000 oil wells just in our county there. Uh, and there, a lot of people in our church worked in the oil field. And I used to love studying this kind of stuff. There's no question. It's pretty well known. If you hit certain types of rock, there's probably going to be oil under that. And there are oil fields all over the United States. The layers of rock all formed in Noah's flood. The oil's down there from the animals that drowned in Noah's flood. If, if, if it's millions of years different in age, and if the oil is millions of years old, the pressure would have dissipated. They do what's called a frack job to fracture the rock purposely to get more oil to come in to pump the well out to re resurrect an old well. So we had guys in our church that that's what they did, fracking for a living. I think the, pre the, the pressure they find down there is incredible in these oil pockets sometimes, and it'll come squirting up out of the ground, a geyser, a, a, oil, a, a gusher. So I think the oil pressure is an indication it's not been there for millions of years. And the fact that they can locate oil, it's under it's typically under certain types of rock, has nothing to do with the rock being millions of years old. I think the fact that there's so much oil in the ground indicates a lot of animals drowned, drowned in the flood. I think everybody agrees oils from fish and other animals that died and were buried in, they can make oil under pressure in the laboratory in, in I think, 20 minutes. Uh, they're taking turkey guts. There's a factory somewhere. They take turkey guts from a turkey slaughterhouse, squeeze it, and make oil in 20 minutes. Cost still costs more than drilling, but it can be done. But I think the oil's there from the flood. The fact that they can find it, they can predict it under a layer. The fact that the guy who found it believes the earth is millions of, or that layer doesn't make it doesn't make it true. A, a Christian, a creationist, a Bible believer could also say, "Wow, these layers in this area because of Noah's flood made them in this this uh, this order, and we're probably going to find oil here." You're right, it costs a lot of money to miss the oil, but they hit it a awful lot of times down there. I bought, bought some today at the oil company. 
Can I, I say you. something to this real quick, Donnie? Right. Uh, so the reason why we use the geologic column or geologic record and radiometric dating is because a lot of oil is found under and in certain rock layers from certain environments and from certain times in the past. Same for coal. Like most of the coal we have is from the Carboniferous, which is about 300 million years ago. A lot of oil is more complicated, but usually found in what were once offshore deposits. Because most oil is from stuff like algae and plankton, not from most other like larger animals. You know, stuff that would survive pretty well in a high tide. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doc. Kent, if you'd like to, you can have a quick final word since the question was for you. Sure. Well, to stick with the question, the fact that they find oil under certain predictable rock layers does not indicate the age of the rock layer. The person who's studying for that or looking for that may indeed believe it's a certain age, but that doesn't make it a certain age. He just believes that. He's been taught that. Okay? So I think a person who believes that flood geology could just as well find oil or coal. There's more coal in the ground right now than there is all the trees in the world couldn't make all the coal that we have in the ground. All the trees in the world. I think the whole world was different before the flood. It was all much more habitable. Today it's 70% underwater and 10% under ice caps. So I think the earth was created to be inhabited, like God says, and it was much more plant life, much more algae, much more everything, much more uh, uh, trees, but beautiful designed to be inhabited. All right, I appreciate it, Kent. Now we got one for you, Doc. Subtle moments of absurdity. Question for Doc. Can you show physical evidence anywhere on Earth of the geologic column exactly as it is shown in the textbook diagrams? So the geologic column as shown in textbook diagrams is a simplification of the real rock record. The real rock record is much more complicated than that and scattered all over the earth. So no, there is no singular column, as I said in my opening. But all the layers overlap one another and intermingle. And using what we know of their relationships, we can reconstruct what the environments used to be like. It's pretty neat. Okay, thank you, Doc. Kent, any thoughts? Hey, that was a complicated way for him to say, no, he can't show that, okay? It doesn't exist. Sideways movement of the, of the fluid. Here's the experiments, experiments in stratification. Watch the video. They show clearly, as the water's moving sideways, multiple layers form at the same time. They, the layers form downstream. To say the top layer's younger still begs the question, where is it coming from? All the layers form quickly. Our gravel pit where I live has got trillions of rounded rocks, indicating they were in a rock tumbler, like sideways movement of the water back and forth. It's going to round off the rocks. Well, come get all you want. They call it river rock. It's not river rock. It's flood rock from Noah's flood. So anyway, I stand by my ground. The geologic column does not exist. The layers all formed during Noah's flood, or nearly all of them, with sideways movement of the water from the tidal pumping, tidal search. Well, I mean, they call it river rock, and because it is found in rivers. A lot. Rivers round rock, especially braided river systems, which produce big gravel pits like the one you live in. Wouldn't be surprised if it used to be a braided river system. Would you be surprised if it used to be part of Noah's flood? Layers of Give rock. Evidence of a global flood. Okay, the layers of rock that start here in Alabama go to North Carolina, 500 miles. That's a big river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is the Mississippi, the Amazon, and the Nile. Talking 500 miles and by about 300 miles the other direction. It's a gravel patch. It's not a river. It's a flood. But worldwide flood made these gravel layers. Can you show me a map? I'd be yeah, interested to see that. Come down. You can see my... Uh, I'll give you some rounded rocks. But you is. How many do we have? A lot. Uh, I grew up on the Mississippi. I have plenty. Truck, 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 truck loads. Okay. All right, gentlemen, we got a question for the each of you in. So I appreciate it, Kent and Doc. Let's spend some time here with the live uh, open mic audience here. So uh, Brian, appreciate uh, having you, Mr. Archaeopteryx, our first two guests here. Uh, Brian, you were the first backstage. So to be fair, let's give you the floor. And so what question did you have in mind and who would you like to, I guess, direct it towards? 
Uh, Dr. Dino, Doc here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was wanting to inquire about what you said about the uh, the uh, clams uh, being found uh, or uh, or buried themselves under. Uh, are you aware of why they do that? Uh, from what I know, a lot of it is for protection, but I could be wrong. I don't study them. Care to educate me? No. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's for protection from predators because of the way their shells are, because they they can easily be crushed. Um, are you aware that, uh, that that it's not just clams that are found all over the world in close position? Uh, other mollusk shells are also found like that all over the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not just and many clams. of them also bury themselves, and many of them, not all of them, also not die them. shut. Not all of them, but uh, many. Yeah. Do. And you know the part that actually holds the two shells together. Uh, it's made of a very mm -hmm. soft organic material that degrades only hours after they die. Not all of them. Some of them, it's a very strong ligament that can last for it's months after they die. Plenty of time calcium, for them to get buried. Calcium, calcium carbonate is what it is. It's oh, that, that is a rock. That's basically a rock. That's pretty solid. It can last but, for yeah, years. But it, but it can still degrade. It, well, it degrades... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, it says it's a, a network of organic tissue. Okay, that can last a while. It's a chill. It, like, again, still, no, plenty of mollusks too. close up when they die. Plenty of them do. Some but of I'm, them uh, require energy to open. The fact that these things are found all over the world, and the fact mm -hmm. that various mollusk shells are also found, and the fact that they're found in close position, I think it's strong evidence in favor of rapid barrel. Um, I do think I do applaud that your your attempt was a uh, uh, a good attempt. I mean, it was at least at least an effort to try to explain that. Um, and and it is a fact that they do do that. So uh, I I applaud you on that one. But it's it's it doesn't really account for it because uh, of the fact that that lots of different mollusk shells are also found all over the world, not just clams. And it's all over the world that they're found. On top of that. Uh, very few of them are ever found not like that. Uh, and, of course, they can actually survive there for a while, too, because they have this thing that comes out of them that actually takes in salt water and, and things like that so uh, or, or so they can breathe or something like that. Um, but anyway. Hey, Brian, um, I'm going to stop you there. I appreciate it. No. My sorry. man. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I did a little research on this before I came on there. Sorry about that. No but worries. Anyway, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to, to, to ask you about that. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. Bring that point up. Uh, do you have anything to say on that, Kent? Uh, yeah, I, I believe what the, the tube they put up is called a siphon, if I'm not mistaken. But they don't go down there and bury themselves to commit suicide. They go down there, hide from a predator, come right back up. Okay, they have to eat and and uh, breathe and get in, get in, uh, oxygen through their. Uh, it's a type of a gill that they have. So, but they're found by the closed, petrified by the billions all over the world, and it's a common fossil, including the top of Mount Everest. I think the flood explanation of rapid burial, if the tide's coming up 200 feet and coming in at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, it's going to make a layer of mud 50 feet thick in 10 seconds. Now, if you get buried under 50 feet of mud, now they can't come out. But they typically have their own tunnels down into the mud and back up. They may go down, you know, 10 inches or a foot or so. That's normal for their, that's part of their life. But to be buried under, to be buried deep enough to be petrified closed, I think it would take rapid sedimentation like Noah's flood would do with the tidal pumping. Thank you, Kent. Doc, since the question and argument was originally for you, did you want to have a final word before we move on to the next guest? Yeah, I, I guess I'll just repeat. Many of them close when they die, and many that don't bury themselves, they live in the sediment. So they won't open. There's a lot of variety out there. Life is pretty amazing. All right, Doc, appreciate it. Brian, thank you for the question. Feel free to stick around. Mr. Archaeopteryx, good to have you again. Certainly not your first time here for these open mics. And so how you doing? And what was your question and who was it for? I'm good. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're a little bit distant, but I can maybe turn you up from no, here. Not, have, I, here, I put my little mic on. I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me on it. My question for was uh, for Kent. Um, it's not really about the geologic column. It's but it's it's about a lot of the stuff Kent says. Um, 
So uh, he says that uh, when he looks at life and everything, it, it looks designed. You know, he sees it's very obviously designed. And then he's also said that uh, before the fall, everything was every all the animals were vegetarian. There was no death. Um, so I tried to try to figure out um, how do you reconcile um, the animals, the organisms that look designed to kill. For example, uh, like say snakes, they have they have fangs and venom sacs that actually inject venom, or like um, spiders, same thing, fangs venom sacs they make web to capture prey and, and the verse side too like the prey you know you got turtles with these shells or uh you know like uh all these animals with really eccentric uh camouflage it seems like you would say those are designed but surely you don't think they were designed to kill and you know when god made the world all you know peaceful and vegetarian and such well, it's way off topic from the geologic column, but I'll be glad to take the question. I do believe the Bible is true, and God made everything perfect, and up until the flood, everything was vegetarian. I suspect you know what a panda bear is. I would actually ask you to look at the teeth of a panda bear. Sharp teeth. They live on bamboo. Maybe some of the animals had sharp teeth or big teeth for crushing you know, pumpkins or um, coconuts. I don't know. I'll find out when I get to heaven. But I do believe they were all vegetarian. And then after the flood, God said to Noah, now you can eat meat, Genesis chapter 9. So something changed. We go through that on my video number two. But to go from like a vegetarian lion to a meat-eating lion is a minor change compared to what the textbooks teach. Let's see. The textbooks teach our kids they went from a protozoa to a lion and that the lion and the protozoa and the aardvark and the sunflower are all related. This is propaganda. This is not science. So I think the, the, the problems or the questions about the biblical, uh, biblical teaching are very minor compared to the teaching of evolution that every, I got a smaller chart, that everything is related and you're related to a strawberry and a, and a sunflower. You believe you're related to a strong sunflower, Mr. Arcaptrix? Yeah, of course I do. Of course you are. Okay, sure. Well, as Mr. you know, Mr. did you want to have a follow-up? If you wanted to follow up, uh, Archaeopteryx, you can. Oh, uh, not really. I mean, you can say, you know, a, a panda bear and a, a grizzly bear, you know, uh, there's minor subtle changes, maybe, yeah. Um, I, I, but when it comes to, like, uh, animals with venom sacs or, you know, uh, turtles with these big shells that shouldn't need such a thing if there's no death in the world, I, I just try to figure out how that, you know, that it seems designed in a world that's full of death. Can maybe, the, maybe the turtles like their shells. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we have a bunch of turtles here in our science center. You can come pet them or out in our 17 lakes. You can come. As far as venom sacs, that's an interesting, brings up an oh, interesting topic. There are two types of venom the spiders or snakes inject is hemotoxic and neurotoxic. Both of them can be straightened out with an electric spark. We've got a little thing, sparker thing. I, was, I thought I had one in my pocket. It's in my Jeep. Well, if you get bit by a mosquito or a bee or uh, something like that, you just electric spark, a, hydro, a, little, uh, a high voltage, low amperage spark will straighten out the molecule and your body can now digest it. It's actually good for you. They use bee stings for certain illnesses at the hospital. I forget what it's for now. Is it arthritis or something they use bee stings for? What? And cobra venom. So that they can be, it could be when you, let's say you sprain your ankle, that part of your body will show up as warmer on a thermograph at the hospital. So, oh, you have a sprained ankle. Just hypothetical question. Hypothetical. Suppose the rattlesnake was designed. Oh, Adam sprained his ankle. Let's inject this. Uh, today it's venomous, but back then it would not be. It has changed uh, from, uh, it's helpful. Like the cobra venom used for different medicines. Maybe I can look, Google that, brother, find out about that. That's just a theory. But again, the little minor, the minor problems you're trying to bring up about the creation view are so minor compared to you believing you're related to a sunflower and it all came from a dot of nothing. That's insane. Uh, if I may, I feel a lot more people have died from rattlesnakes than had their knees healed. Uh, and also, Donnie, would you mind uh, putting up what I'm sharing right now? And as a side note, nice to see a fellow dinosaur on here, Mr. Archaptrix. So, um, there's a bunch of different types of shellfish. Uh, two of the main ones are bivalves and brachiopods. Bivalves open up when they die, like Ken's been saying. Brachiopods close tightly when they die. They have a different opening mechanism. So 
and we have a lot of fossil brachiopods, including the ones at the top of Mount Everest. So there's your question, Kent. When they die, they close. Case closed. Thank you. Kent, any any thoughts on that before we move on? Uh, Joseph just looked up cobra venom. I'm, I'm multitasking here. Cobra venom treats what now? Thrombosis, arthritis. Thrombosis, arthritis. Cancer. cancer. Many, other diseases. Many other diseases. Ah, Google it. I don't know. Maybe maybe God made them for a reason. I designed them. I don't know. Okay. So the uh, as far as the shells being closed, the fact is we do find clams by the. I'm going to mm -hmm. use the word billions. Okay. Certainly many millions petrified closed clams. I think that's a, a logical explanation would be they were all buried too deeply to, uh, to get back out and save themselves and buried too quickly to open up. And Noah's flood would do exactly that. So I think that's an evidence, not necessarily a proof, but it's an evidence that the Bible story of Noah's flood is true. See? Well, and again, there's an entire group of shellfish that close when they die. And those are the ones you're thinking of on Mount Everest. Okay, do Brachiopods close when they die. Do they petrify after they close? Well, I mean, yeah, their shells are made of calcium carbonate. They're practically already fossils. Walk along the beach, you can find plenty of shells. Do they petrify? Mm -hmm. Was the question. Do you think that you they think they can? That yes. In, in the numbers that we find them, like billions. Yes, they can. We find reefs of them still growing today. I would say the clams were buried quickly and petrified slowly over the next fifty years or something. If they're buried in the mud, it takes a while for the minerals to, to uh, go into the uh, calcium carbonate, replace it. It's called a replacement fossil. So mm -hmm. I think the, the burial would be quickly. The petrification <sighs> might not be so quite so quick. But even soft things are fossilized jellyfish. Yeah, soft they can. Body. Hmm? Oh, actually, that's a whole different topic. But soft bodied things would not, they would not be preserved in the kind of cataclysm you're talking about. Those require very special circumstances. They do exist, soft-bodied animals, fossilized. Uh -huh. I That's agree. A, okay. They do, but they require very specific conditions, and we know what those are. A Noah's flood. No, they require very still, very, very gentle conditions. Okay. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the banter. Very good. Let's move on to the next couple people here. We've got just talking about, and then also Caden. So, Caden, you were next up. And so, to be fair, let's now give you the opportunity to present one of our debaters or guests here with a question. Go ahead, Caden. Appreciate having you. Ah. Hello, everybody. This is Caden Slinker coming to you live from Alabama. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Anyways, I have a question for Dr. Kent Hovind. Go ahead, present your question. Kent, I you have a idea in your head that I, I think we're losing you, Caden. Oh, sorry. That was uh me moving around a bit. Anyways, as I was saying, Dr. Kent Hovind, I want you to explain how you believe, why you believe that birds are not dinosaurs when they clearly are, and how radiometric dating works if, radiometri if radioactive decay rates aren't consistent. Is that, is that two questions, Caden? It's two questions in one. You need to enunciate, articulate, elucidate. I'm not understanding this. You want me to explain? I'm sorry, Kent. I'm word? autistic. I have trouble talking with people. Type it out and send it in, okay? Okay. I want you to explain to me your reasoning for why birds are not dinosaurs. Why birds are not dinosaurs? Well, why aren't elephants frogs? Why well, aren't fish uh, mammoths? Birds are birds. Dinosaurs are dinosaurs. There's no, there might be similar bone structure because the same guy designed them. The name is God. But to but, say that birds turned into dinosaurs is real close to the flat earth mentality of stupid. Okay. 
you just called me stupid, Kent. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I said to believe that birds are dinosaurs is stupid. That is stupid. Whether you are or not, I don't know. But the, birth, the idea birds that birds are, are dinosaurs, dinosaurs is stupid. In fact, I know they are dinosaurs. Okay. Enjoy yourself. You, so you have chosen death. I think elephants are birds. Okay. So, Kent, the thing is, there's a lot of evidence backing up that birds are a type of dinosaurs. You can say that they were created as they are, but they would still fit into the into a category of dinosaurs. Like they just are. Their anatomy is exactly like many theropod dinosaurs. Um, well, that proves that proves my point. Man and dinosaurs live mm -hmm. together. We got birds right out in our yard. I fed the ducks a while ago. Wow, Kent, I didn't know. It was humans have out. lived with avian dinosaurs, but not non-avian dinosaurs. That's a different topic. Kent Tobin, can Fact. I explain yeah. some of the reasoning for why many scientists believe birds are dinosaurs? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in because, Caden, uh, your audio is not very good. So until you improve your audio somehow, I just want to make sure that this is a smooth stream. And so I do wow. appreciate you being here. I appreciate the question. We're going to have to move on to the next person. So Caden, thank you very Don. much. That's the, no worries. That's okay. All right. So next up is just talking about you. And so appreciate having you. What's your question and who's it for? Oh, if, you, if you're talking, we're not hearing you. So you might have to hook up an external mic or I'm on. Hi guys. Oh, I heard something. Is that coming from you? Just talking about. Yes. Hello. Okay. Can you okay. Hear me? Yes. It's good to have you. Uh, we can hear Hi. you now. Perfect. Go Sorry ahead. about that. Thank you everybody no for being here. I appreciate everyone coming out and expressing their opinions and ideas. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Dino very simply about the clam situation because you guys had brought it up. Uh, I'm wondering and curious about the conditions required to fossilize these types of clams because you had mentioned that it needs a calm, still environment, but as we might know, fossils would be requiring a rapid environment, to, you know, a rapid fossilization. So how, how, how does that happen? How does that clam preserve itself and get fossilized in mm -hmm. still conditions? Sure. Uh, this will just take a quick minute. So I think you're mixing up a couple different things, or I might have said it wrong. My apologies if I did. Um, when it comes to soft-bodied things, they require very gentle conditions to fossilize. Harder-bodied things, like, say, clams or other seashells, they don't need as gentle conditions because their shells are made of calcium carbonate, which is basically already a rock that's the main component in limestone. So they can basically just sit on the ocean floor for years or decades. In fact, we see this with modern shellfish. They just sit at the bottom of the sea, and some of them can't move, so they just sit there until they get buried. It just happens. We see them forming today in all kinds of water bodies. Uh, in fact, if you live near, say, the Great Lakes, and you were to pan the sand at a beach, you'd probably pull up a bunch of little shells from something called a zebra mussel. It's pretty neat. Okay, Kent, any, any thoughts on the question and then the answer provided by Doc? Well, I agree, you could live by the beach and pull up a bunch of shells. Now, whether you can see them fossilize is a whole different story. Uh, there's replacement fossils, there's uh, impression fossils, there's uh, uh, castings, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. But to get a replace, to a complete replacement fossil, I think it would take quite a while. And to be buried quickly, die in the closed position, and then over the next, I'm going to pick a number and say 15 years or 20 years, it would slowly fossilize. Petrified trees mm -hmm. are an example. There are billions of petrified trees in the world. And petrified logs petrification is petrified materials found all over the world okay i think so, the wood I, especially okay. the minerals have to soak in and replace it uh so i don't think you're going to see fossils forming today anywhere we see shells you can dig up seashells you can walk along the beach and find seashells that probably died you know, 10 years ago because the shell lasts a long time 
but slowly grinds it into sand, the, the wave action does. But to find them fossilized, I would defy somebody to show me where fossils are forming in any great number. A lot of animals died in the last five years. Colonel Sanders killed a whole bunch himself. None of them fossilized, none. So hey, that's partly, yeah. well, if I may, that's partly true, Kent, and that's partly not true. As I said before, clamshells are calcium carbonate. They are essentially already rock. They can be preserved just as the shell. I have plenty of those. Um, for another thing, fossils forming today. Yes, they are forming today. I have plenty of bones and fossils in my collection that are partially fossilized and fresh and fully fossilized. There's an entire spectrum out there. You can find them just by wandering a creek bed. Okay, let me jump in. I appreciate uh, it, Doc. Yeah. Kent, since we only got you here for about two more minutes, and I really appreciate your time, we do have one last panelist who would be on the evolutionist side org. So to respect the time also org that, that you've provided us for this, let's make you the last one for Kent. Then we'll transition since we'll be at the two hour mark into a general Q and A. So org appreciate having you. Uh, what's your question for Kent? Hey, uh, is my sound okay? Yes. Real good. You're coming. Fantastic. Good. Um, hi, last time we talked, uh, Mr. Hovind, I brought up paleomagnetics and their association with the geologic column, how paleomagnetic dating lines up very well. And I was wondering, you said you didn't know much about that topic. I was wondering if you looked into paleomagnetics at all in the past, probably been a year since we chatted last, uh, and if you had any comments on that correlation on top of everything else that's been discussed. Yeah, I think uh, there's a, I did find it, it's been a year, like you said, but there's a great article on ICR.org, Institute for Creation Research in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. Some good friends of mine work there. So yeah, they had an article about answering the paleomagnetic thing. I think we, what we found is the magnetic field of the earth is declining. I don't think too many people argue with that. The magnetic field is getting weaker, which is a strong indication the earth is not billions of years old. Nobody has come up with a mechanism for how it can reverse. The whole idea of magnetic reversals is pure baloney. There's stronger and weaker magnetism in the mid-Atlantic Ridge, which has nothing to do with reversals. So I think you need to watch my video number one, seminar part one. Uh, let's see, Doc Dino doesn't like this. He, don't, he does not have to buy one. Okay, but you can get the whole series for 50 bucks, 18 hours. And I cover on video number one, the, uh, that very topic about the magnetic field does not reverse. So I think paleomagnetics was answered thoroughly on the ICR.org article. But it doesn't match the geologic column at all, in my position. There is no geologic column. There's nothing to match. Uh, can I respond to that real quick before, we, before you go, Kent? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, my When I was doing my research for my master's, I was working on building the paleomagnetic link with the geologic column. So um, I haven't read the ICR article. I can look into it. But, like, I personally have a stake in this game. It's been a while, but the research I did was matching the parent polar wander path with the geologic column, and they did match up. And like I've like touched the rocks and seen the data. So that's for whatever that's worth. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, sorry, is it Orhe or Orge? Whichever you want. I, I like the ambiguity. Right. Well, uh, Senor Orhe. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the paleomagnetic bands line up perfectly with their radiometric dates, as well as what, as well as the rates we estimate for sea floor spreading. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's um, the especially the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, those things line up very well, which is why I bring up this topic. Yeah. Come over to the old Earth. We have cross corroboration. <laughs> Okay, let's give Kent the final word, and then we're going to let Kent get out of here for the night, and then we'll transition into our next phase of tonight's two-in-one event. Kent, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Walt Brown wrote the book in the beginning. He deals a great, a, a great whole section on paleomagnetics and about the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field cannot reverse. It, it, there's no it, it, the dynamo. Anyway, that's a long story. I would recommend you go to Walt Brown's website, uh, I forgot what it is here. Creationscience.com, I think. Just go Google Walt Brown. I think he, if he's still alive, he's got to be 100 years old. But uh, he did a great section on that. So, but then, even then, this the fact that it, you're claiming it lines up with the geologic column, 
The geologic column doesn't exist. He, he admitted it tonight. It, can't, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So how can it line up with it? All, all right. right. Thank you, Don. Donnie, I love Thanks. these. Please schedule more debates. I'll take any on, but two hours is about all I can handle. I have to work all day, too, before this. So. And you were up before breakfast, brother. Yes, yes. Ha. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to let you out of here. Appreciate it. Okay, God and bless. You're, you're, all all right, invited, nice. you're all invited to come to Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama. We'd love to have you. Give you a tour. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kent. Appreciate it. All right, gentlemen, that was an excellent first two hours of tonight's two-in-one event. I am very content with the fact that for most of, the, of it, we, we stuck to uh, the geologic column. It was comprehensive. Now, we are going to transition into just a general creation versus evolution open mic. But with us just wrapping up the geologic column aspect of it, I have a feeling several on the panel currently want to maybe focus on some aspects dealing with the geologic column in geology. I've just had uh, T-Rock join us as well as I am going to take just a five to 10 minute break and uh, and then I'll be back as well for the open mic. So let's hand it to T-Rock. T-Rock, he's going to kind of help guide along the discussion for the first little bit here. Is there anything you heard T-Rock in terms of tonight's topic that you'd like to uh, discuss? Maybe a question you'd like to ask that'll help kick us off with, with a good discussion? Quick mic check. Yeah, you're coming in good. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Brian, how you doing? <clears throat> hey. I apologize. I'm not super familiar with some of the people on the panel right now. Um, yeah, um, I was going to see if I could get Doc Dino to reiterate um, one of his points he was making earlier about the very calm conditions for, I think you were talking about fossilization specifically? Yeah, for some fossils. So you were talking about soft-bodied fossils require calm conditions? Most of the time, yes. You rock. You took my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's what I was exactly. asking. Hey, exactly. I'm yep. waiting for it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit on that, Doc? I know. Sure. Sure, I can. Um, before I do, can I just ask, do you know what a bed form is at all? I'm not familiar with the term, but I, I think you're referring to, um, I, I don't know, something like lake bed or how a, 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 a kind of yeah. Is formed. So, so when water flows over particles, it'll usually pick up and carry them and then deposit them as it moves. Uh, depending on the speed of the water, the size of the particles, what they're made of, stuff like that, it'll create different head forms like ripples or dunes or all kinds of stuff like that and since these structures require moving water if we find a rock that was deposited without bed forms it's a pretty good guess that it didn't experience much water movement meaning that it was deposited in a gentle area uh like i said before we can test this in the lab and we see it happen today at, like, say, the bottom of a lake or the very bottom of the ocean. There is almost no movement at the bottom of the ocean, so it all deposits really nice and flat. And in the fossil record, when we find really well-preserved fossils, like jellyfish or feathers or, like, uh, Archaeopteryx, you know, the good, good feather of our earth, uh, fossil of Archaeopteryx, they're in these watery deposition layers with no bed forms. So they were probably at the bottom a very slow moving, gentle body of water, like a lake or lagoon. When there's a lot more movement, say in a river deposit that has dunes and ripples preserved, we usually don't get those finer details. Uh, in fact, the bones are usually pretty busted up. Stuff like that. Same for, like, a seashore, you know? So the gentler the water, the easier it is for weaker things to be preserved. Does that make sense? 
Sure. Do you have a um, do you have a specific formation um, in mind that you're talking about where you're saying you see soft bodied soft bodied fossilization with basically a, 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 a what sounds like you're saying a flat bed form with no rippling or obvious you know stream braiding or something like that. I sure do. I think Donnie is out of the room. Did he give you uh, admin privileges? No, I don't have admin. Ah, uh, dang. Uh, well, if you just search uh, Berlin Specimen Archaeopteryx, you can see a lot of good pictures of Archaeopteryx. You know, the famous dino bird. It's from a deposit that is all really flat with very tiny grains of sediment. And, like I said, no bed forms, so it was probably very gentle. And, sure enough, we have feathers. Really, really gorgeous feathers. In fact, some of them are so well-preserved, we can figure out what color they were in life. Really so, cool. So, so you're talking Berlin, Germany, where some of the original Archaeopteryx were found? Yes, let me see if I can find the name of the formation. I should know this. Mr. Archaeopteryx, do you know it? Oh, he left. Um, uh, the Sonhofen Limestone. Sonhofen Limestone. Yes. So uh, It's really for a Lagerstadt. It's basically a so, place of deposit. So basically you're saying that a land animal was fossilized mm -hmm. in marine sediment in a calm environment. From what we know of the area, it was a, like a, oh, what's the term? I forget what it's called. Uh, it's basically an inlet of the ocean, like a bay, but isolated enough that there was very little water activity. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but it's very, it would have been very gentle water. Yes, so, and Archaeopteryx is a flying animal, so it kind of makes sense that they might fly over the lake and die. There's a lot of other like pterosaurs and stuff preserved, and fish. Okay, so bear with me. So what is the, the um, altitude above sea level at the Solhofen formation? Well, at the time it was formed, at sea level. So, yeah, that's um, so. You're saying you're saying arch Archaeopteryx was fossilized in a very calm marine environment at sea level. Submarine, but yes. Well, that's that's kind of my question. How uh, so? So you said at sea level. Now you're saying submarine, which is below sea level. Um, what, what I'm mean, saying is it's like an inlet of a bay that sure. was very that didn't experience much wave activity. So it is ocean water, but it doesn't have big waves like the ocean does, at least not at the depth the fossils are from. So lagoon, that's it. It's a lagoon. <laughs> Sorry. It's it's a lagoon. Yes. How how what's what's the square mileage area of this lagoon? Uh, that I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I don't know that. Let's let's look at that real quick. So, because kind of what I'm getting at. So, it's limestone, calm environment, a, mm -hmm. a, a land-based animal. I I mean, what, what are we saying? This this bird died and fell into the water, and then sank to the bottom. Yeah, birds do it all the time today. And oh, okay, but we're talking specifically fossilization because I seriously doubt birds are fossilizing in the bottom of a lake today. Why? And, and because... we find dead animals at the bottom of lakes all the time, half buried in the mud, sure. and continuously getting more buried. So you're kind of alluding to this idea of an anoxic condition because water is a, yes. a weak acid that that um, tears bio materials apart very quickly not always in fact water can be pretty basic especially when it's in contact with limestone limestone would neutralize a lot of the acid 
So if there are dissolved carbonates in the water, it's going to be basic and preservative. Hey, Which, considering uh, this right. is a limestone, it probably was. I have something that I want to cite. Is it okay if I cite it? Yeah. All right. Uh, I've got a... I wish I could show this on screen. I've got a uh, site from americangeosciences.org. And I'm reading it right here. It says, for animals without skeletons like worms or jellyfish, fossilization is a very rare event. When paleontologists find a well-preserved fossil of a soft-bodied animal, it's an occasion for celebration. For soft-bodied animals to be fossilized, its body must be protected from decomposition. The body is usually exposed to air and water with a lot of oxygen, so it decomposes rapidly. The animal is likely to be fossilized only if it is buried soon after it dies or when it is buried alive. Even then, it is likely to decompose because the water seeps through the sedimentary sediment around it, usually rich in oxygen. Sometimes, however, mm -hmm. the body is buried rapidly by fine mud. Water seeps through mud much more slowly than through sand, so the body does de uh, not decompose as fast. Mud often contains a lot of other organic m matter as well, and that uses up oxygen faster. Some animals' bodies then escape decomposition under just the right conditions. A delicate impression of animal might be preserved. So, uh, so I think that rapid, I think rapid burial would explain the reason why soft body animals can be found in the uh, in the the, the rock, uh, rock record. Then, then. So I I hear what you're saying. And that's I, I hear what you're saying. Well, let me ask you this. Sorry, your name's Brian, right? Yes. Sorry, the, I just want something shorter than apologetics one one. So, yes. uh, Brian, no, do you know I, how oxygen? Do you know how oxygen enters water bodies? Oxygen enters in the wa water's bodies. We mean like like through the water and stuff, like so, like the. Yeah, how does oxygen like get into the water? It's already in water. <laughs> Well, yes, I mean dissolved oxygen, like the stuff that fish breathe. Fish don't just breathe like water molecules, you know? Well, they, they um, take in the water and it, it separates the oxygen from it, doesn't it? But no, that, they, they're they actually they breathing it. dissolved oxygen gas within the water. That's I'm what they're sure, breathing. I'm not sure if I understand what, what you're talking about. What's that got to do with what I'm saying here? So the rate at which oxygen enters water depends on a few factors. The first being how much water is exposed, the concentration of oxygen in the air, and how much the water is moving. Because if the water is moving more and mixing more, then the oxygen can get down deeper and get down faster. But if you have a very still body of water, where there's not much motion, so there's not many waves, there's not going to be a lot of oxygen getting into the water, and what does get in doesn't penetrate very far down. Because oxygen's lighter than water. It's going to stay near the top. Then you don't have rapid that burial. That means you're going to get an anoxic zone, so very little to no oxygen at the very bottom. Most bacteria need oxygen. So if you have an anoxic zone, you're going to have a very low rate of decay. It's meaning things have time hard. to lay there and get buried. The side even mentioned that it can still decompose rap unless you have rapid burial. You have to bury it and, fast. And, and, you know, and not always. Yeah, it's not but necessary, not but it helps. Regarding the bacteria, I, I got to jump in here. I understand what you're trying to say about the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide in a body of water. I understand that completely, mm -hmm. that a body of water that has no movement on the surface layer is not going to be able to absorb, let's say, uh, and, and displace the gases. I understand that completely. However, you're mm -hmm. incorrect in making the assumption that a still body of water with zones that don't have oxygen are not going to read any type of bacteria that ends up decomposing any soft-bodied organism. For example, you have areas sure. of anaerobic bacteria activity that occur in pockets of uh, low or no movement, uh, lo no flow of water, let's say, uh, in, a, in a larger body of water. And in those areas, you have a formation of uh, bacteria and the detritus that that and the breakdown of or organic material, even though there is no flow and there is no oxygen and there's no quote unquote aerobic bacteria, there's just the anaerobic. So that still occurs, it still happens. 
And so it, if that's happening, if I may. and the fossilization process requires a relatively longer period of time than the amount of time that requires for that material to fully decompose, then it only speculate it only leads to the point that it requires a rapid process. It's a rapid burial process so because anything you have a lot of time is going to decompose. If I may, you yes. are right that there are ox sorry, there are bacteria that can live without oxygen. However, those bacteria often have a lower metabolic rate than bacteria that breathe oxygen. So they will decompose things slower. And that slowed rate of decay can be enough for softer-bodied things to get completely buried. Especially if, say, the limestone is forming from uh, diatoms or something like that, which is very common. Okay, if there's a diatom so, bloom, yeah, not you not have a lot of them at once, and they'll bury quickly. Not before there's other factors involved for metabolic rate, such as heat, right? So temperature and mm -hmm. saturation of carbon dioxide and other uh, elements yes. in the water can also impact the metabolic rate of an anaerobic bacteria. It can increase and uh, make it more rapid. So it's not just Agreed. one variable that you're talking about. There's other variables, too, that will actually yeah. make the metabolic process quicker. And how warm are the bottom of lakes usually compared to the surface? Well, it depends. It all depends because if we're talking about a period of time where there is a lot of geographical activity happening under the ground, for example, magma flows, volcano, volcanic activity, you will actually happen to have, you'll have pockets of very, very hot steam, very, very hot uh, liquid and, and, and just mm -hmm. all this material that's there, and so you will have pockets even in the in this large body down deep in the water. You'll still have pockets of heat still. forming, and we also so and we I know hear that you. because we still have, for example, we have we have underground. You know, if you go down deep down, you have like uh, these these guys are like things. You know, where 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 we have very hot water and steam coming down that, that's coming up from our core. It comes through the bottom so, of the lakes. If I may. You're right, that can happen. But different minerals form at different temperatures. So if we have cold water minerals forming, that means that the temperature that area experienced is pretty low. And that's what we have in the Solnhofen. It's very low temperature minerals. Now, can you detect the temperature in the fossil that you're analyzing? Or in the specimen that you, you have, how can you detect the, the temperature? You don't detect it in the fossil. So different minerals will form in different ways depending on the temperature around them. And the minerals in the rock are cold temperature minerals. I see. I see. So we would need to then do a study to, co to see if mm -hmm. there's a correlation between the type of sediment and the, let's say, the decompo decomposition rate that would have been in that area for any soft-bodied water, right? But you mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to. I, I'd have to do a bit of hunting, but I'm sure that has been done. Yeah, but, well, but in other case, we're running around loops because we're talking about a process of time for fossilization that would still relatively be a lot longer than even the slowest metabolic activity of, of decomposition. So let me, in, let me break in, in here for just a minute, guys. Yeah. Let me break in here for just a second. So I, I was trying to look at some of the uh, physical characteristics of the Solnhofen formation and um, some of what they're saying is very similar to what Doc Dino was saying in terms of a, a calm uh, a calm lagoon mm -hmm. kind of environment but um, there's some things that are seriously not adding up with the explanation of this calm environment and fossil formation so a couple key characteristics um, some 24 species of pterosaur flying mm -hmm. reptiles, um, sparrows. Um, uh, uh, Solnhofen is a pretty fossil rich area, but probably one of the more um, kind of disjointed things that they said uh, from the story that they give is that it actually supposedly interacted with the Tefra Sea. <clears throat> so here's here was my point about the, um, the altitude above sea level earlier mm -hmm. 
So you have this supposed shallow lagoon inland, um, but close to the sea and interacting with the sea. So bodies of water like that are known for being teeming with life because where you have an inlet where water comes in at, you'll get a lot of things like crayfish, shrimp, uh, those types of, of, uh, of aquatic animals that feed on debris coming in and out of that system. And so here we've got 24 variations of pterosaur and some different birds and, and other types of fossils in this thing. And, and they're like buried in very fine, pretty much pure limestone. So a couple things stand out to me that are, are very contradictory to the, to the slow formation in a calm or, or the, the, the calm uh, lake bed or lagoon bed, as it were, environment for fossilization. One is that you can't interact with the sea and be calm like that. Um, coastlines are notoriously um, um, erratic in their in their water movement. Um, number two, 155 million years ago, allegedly, <clears throat> the moon would have been considerably closer. And by considerably, I don't mean like tens of thousands of miles. It's just that the inverse square law dictates that um, it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, distance closure to turn into uh, uh, significantly increased um, tidal pull. So the story doesn't add up because you've got the moon too close and the sea is too close and it's interacting with this lake bed. And there's, there's nothing that says that would be a calm environment where a whole bunch of flying um, animals just fall in there, lay in the bottom and fossilize. So T-Rock... What is a lagoon? You can you can tell us what a lagoon is. We don't have to have a QA. and a I, I, I'm just curious. You're the one saying it doesn't add up. What is a lagoon? Lagoons are if you don't know, you can say you don't know. I, they're typically, as far as I do know, they're just typically uh, inland shallow bay areas. That and, and I think most lagoons are kind of defined by the fact that they have a narrow neck coming into them. Yeah, they are very... Lagoons are bodies of water connected to the ocean, but barely. Like, they're usually, like, big sandbars or reefs, something protecting them from, you know, oncoming waves. That means that the water inside a lagoon is going to be moving much slower than the water outside of a lagoon. Still connected to the ocean, there's still nutrients flowing in, but the water is much more gentle than it is outside. That's why, like in a lot of Caribbean islands, like the places you go swimming, they're usually in either a natural or artificial lagoon. Because they're gentle, and it's easy for you to swim without getting sucked out by a riptide. That's, that's interesting, because you're talking about the other side of the world from where the Solnhofen is. The Atlantic and the waters around Europe are a lot rougher than the Pacific waters are. Uh I've I've been to both. It depends on where you go. It also depends and, on what time of year. And yes, but and try, and, and the, so like the in, rock in, we in, have, the rock we have, can only form in very gentle waters. That, that That's is, the only that place where it can form. That is completely no. Untrue. No, there are no bed forms. If there are no bed forms, the water's not really moving much, especially at depth. That's um uh, like I, you I know waves the... waves don't move sorry, words. You're an engineer, right? Um does the surface of a river flow faster than the bottom of the river? There in most is cases. A, there is typically a difference in the uh, and I'm not a civil engineer, by the way. Um, okay, but but there is typically a, a, a differential velocity in the the various depths of water. Yes. Okay, and the deeper you go, the more exaggerated that gets, right? Can be. Uh... So if you have a very deep body of water, and the stuff at the surface isn't moving very fast anyway, because it's protected from the waves outside. The water at the bottom is going to be moving extremely slow, right? It can be, sure. But Meaning that but there's not much oxygen transfer to the lower depths. You've got a couple. And that, hmm? 
you've got a couple unwarranted assumptions about this this whole story though because you've got all these these land animals just mysteriously falling in and and um and fossilizing in this limestone but, but t rock um, if i may just, it's it's not mysterious this happens in lakes today um, a lot you don't, you don't have any any animal fossils lithified in modern times in the bottom of a lake you, you have so, animals dying and falling into the lake maybe you mm -hmm. have animals dying falling into the lake and being stuck in the mud maybe but that's a very different thing than lithifying and turning into a, a, a permanent fossil so stuff fossilizes over time if an so animal would that be uh, it's probably Dr. not going to be a fossil yet. But that stuff that died a thousand years ago or two is going to be more fossilized than something that just died. Well, Especially see, if it's in a place where it's not going to really rot. At least so, not as fast as the sediment is piling up. So a, cu a couple things. Um, one of them is the, the bed form that you talked about. Um, and so I... I it's it's pretty obvious to me that whenever whenever people say that limestone has to f or, or lime calcium carbonate has to settle out of the water in a very calm environment right that's the typical explanation right sorry could you repeat that limestone or, or lime calcium carbonate has to settle out of the water in a very calm environment right Yes. So, Generally, yes. <clears throat> how thick is the Solnhofen limestone? I believe it's at least a few dozen meters. Let me check. So this is this is part of the problem. <clears throat> if you have if you have birds and pterosaurs and other land animals living around this lagoon. The only reason they would be living around there is if it were rich with vegetation, insects, food source, and then you also have the rest of the food chain. Like I said, you've got the uh, bottom feeders um, that, that hang out in these uh, transition zones between water bodies. It's what they do. I used to, I used to like to fish a lot. And um, one, of the, one of the things that fishermen like to do, like myself, that I, I like to walk banks and do the do that kind of thing to fish as opposed to being in a boat and and one of the things you can watch very closely is where water comes into a into a body in a narrow form it's a hotbed for fishing because all of the the little debris stuff comes through there and you've got all this aquatic life hanging around the mouth of the opening and so this story about birds falling in there and just laying there and no crawdads no none none of the crustaceans or anything else in the in the water there are touching them they're just leaving them alone to so to, to rock? What? At, at what point does this this lime in the bottom of this lagoon actually uh, lithify so t rock we've so we've been over part of this so i'm gonna try to walk you through it um so at the bottom of a lake is there typically more or less oxygen it depends on the lake. Um, some lakes have inlet. Uh, have, Typically, uh, well, I'm I'm from Arkansas, and some of the lakes there have um, um, underwater streams flowing through them. So every lake is very different in in that regard. What would you say typically, especially so, if there is no evidence of a, an underwater stream? So less I or think more. What you're referring to is some of the larger flat bottom lakes where you're going to have um, uh, kind of a lower oxygen content at depth. I think is what you're referring to. Yes, that. thank you. That would be a good analogy. Yes, there's going to be a lot less oxygen down there. In some cases, there's going to be pretty much no oxygen. So how when so, that so, happens? So now you're you're kind of I don't think you're going to get a lot of fish eating things. No, so I'm not. Yeah, you're you're kind of question begging a little bit because how deep do you have to go before you get this depletion of oxygen so that crawdads can't live there? It depends on the body of water. Some can do it in less than ten meters. 
And, and, and so we're talking specifically Solnhof and limestone formation. How deep was mm -hmm. this lagoon allegedly? I can't tell you how deep the lagoon was off the top of my head. Then how but... do you know what kind of oxid oxidation levels to expect? Okay. But Good. it doesn't it doesn't matter. The oxidation level does not matter. We've already been over this. It's not gonna have an impact on the metabolic activity of any bacteria that's decomposing the uh, the, the dead organism down there in, in a in, in a long enough period of time for it to be fossilized in, in the traditional sense. It, it it that's not gonna happen. And then and also another problem with the still body water issue is that in those same in those same areas we're finding the hard bodied shells right uh, clams they're still they're fossils too so what if we're finding fossils of hard body and soft body organisms in the same area and it we're going to use the still water excuse that's not possible because even in still water a clam a snail whatever it is that has a calcium based shell is going to decompose it, it's it rather the calcium is going to diffuse into the water and it's going to break down very quickly within a matter of days to weeks, not a longer period of time so allegedly required first, by a natural fossilization process. So first, fact. I'm going to have to, I don't think that's a fact. I'm going to need a it source is. on that because we'll put some there are seashells that have survived water. in the ocean for hundreds of years. Second, T-Rock. Soldhofen is estimated to be up to 200 meters deep. That's more than deep enough for you to get an anoxic zone in the lagoon. Lastly, up to, two, up to 200 meters. Using the exception, using the exception is not going to work. I'm telling you, you put some snails in a bucket of water and they're going to decompose, and you can do that with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of snail shells, my friend. Bucket of water with no oxygen in it, they're going to they're going to break down within days. Just if you found one species, one shell or two shells that managed to survive for 100 years, that's an exception. It's not going to prove the natural observation of, of, of and, and the data that you would get right now if you go try it. We're talking about an actual Did experiment, right? That's for science, a source. Right? So, no, we're talking about science. Science is a measurement of observation, right? So go do a science more complicated project. complicated than that. You but... go put some, some hard body shells in a bucket of deoxygenated water, Right and see uh, still the oxygenated yeah. water and see how long it takes for it to break down. It, hey, it breaks down quickly. So for for you, just talking about here is an article that talks about shell decomposition rates and forests, which are going to be faster than at the bottom of an anoxic lake. Again, you're gonna you're now gonna you point to some that exceptional study you, that was done by somebody sitting in a chair when I'm telling you about a natural you process that you can share. observe and you can put, you can go do yourself if you want. I've already done it and I can show you some pictures of some shells that I okay. put in the water a couple of days ago. I saw Muhammad split the moon. What does the that moon have to do split. with what does that have to do with science, sir? We're talking about science. Are what you you're scientist? saying doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm telling you to put together a source for that, please. A, a source of what? A source of what? The calcium dissolves in water? <laughs> That seashells have you ever readily put, dissolve have in a you matter ever put of a days. Calcium tablet in a cup of water? No, yes, no, those I'm, are designed to dissolve. Those are not the no, aragonite calcium, of calcium shells. Okay, hey, T there are uh, different they So, calcium does. We are talking about calcite, specifically in the form of a mineral called aragonite. Aragonite is fairly chemically resistant and fairly uh, durable. Uh, that is that, is, that, is that what snail shells are made of? It is of? not just calcite. Is, or it is, is not that, just is that calcium. What are made of? Okay, guys, listen. Yeah, for a lot of them are. Uh, yes. No, no, because, Brian, because Brian this is, you're, you're throwing everyone in a loop here. You're trying to talk about exceptions. and you're try, I'm you're not throwing anyone in a loop. In a loop. Yeah, you guys yeah. keep dragging us into a loop when I've already addressed no, everything no, you're no, saying. Is, Hey guys, you're, let's, you're let's, right. let's let's stop the crosstalk for just a minute. Brian has a question. Well, I, I, actually, I was going to um, um, ask you something, T. Rocks, real quick. Has Rameski uh, uh, commented at all? Uh, he's on there, so I didn't know if he had a chance to say anything. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great point. If Rameski has something to to. 
talk about. Go ahead. Is he there? I, th I think he's tuned out in the background. So one of the things we haven't talked about, though, for, um, you know, we're talking about this, this fossilization process. So a, a quick question and then a... Um, and then I've got a, an observation to make about this this story about this shallow marine environment. Um, the question is, what is the physical evidence that the Solnhofen Lagoon was 200 meters deep? Hey, I'm not going to read through the study that says it. I will post it to you. However, I can tell you that the Solnhofen limestone experienced very little water activity because it has very little in the way of bed forms so we can uh, test this okay we so know this happens forms. okay bed forms um we'll we'll come back to that in just a second because that is actually very interesting to me and and i really do want to talk about that but before we get there we, we've been talking about this this whole process of fossilization and and uh anoxic conditions and the the um the bacterial um activity and and so forth but so i did i did a little bit of research here a while back and i was looking at um forensics completely agnostic to the origins debate and and so in in forensics whenever they're investigating you know a, a homicide or a, or a death of some sort um in bodies of water one of the things that um, um, has been noted is that uh, the salinity of the, the water can actually accelerate the decomposition of the, of the body. The, it's the salinity, not the, not the oxygen levels. The salinity accelerates the, uh, the decomposition to the point that with only within just a few days, a human body with much more mass than a bird can become disarticulated. And so one of the problems you have with the Solnhofen formation is it is a marine environment. It does have apparent salinity. It's got limestone and so, or lime in, the, in the, the alleged body of water that existed at that time. And you've got these very well-preserved fossils that did not sit there for days, let alone thousands of years waiting to be lithified or covered or anything else. And they're not disarticulated. Okay, so first, that is a claim you don't have a source for. Second, many of the fossils in the Sonhofen are disarticulated. Second, sorry, third, I think, was that study carried out in, oxi in oxygen-poor or oxygen-rich salt water? That is important. So you made a claim that I don't have a source. Why did you say that? Because you are clean. What I was referring to specifically there was that the what you were referring to specifically there was that the specimens in the Sonhofen could not sit there for years without disarticulating or rotting away. Yeah, it's it's virtually impossible that that would have happened that way. In an anoxic environment, with. And actually, sorry, I looked up the rates of sedimentation. The average rate of sedimentation in a lagoon is about four millimeters a year. Okay. That's more than enough to cover many small fossils in sediment completely, and even larger things like birds, in a matter of years. Now, contrary to what just talking about has been saying, andoxic bacteria usually work at a much slower rate than oxygen using bacteria. They do still eat organic matter, but much more slowly. So that's plenty of time for an organism to get buried and be inaccessible to the bacteria. So no. it's it's also obvious. I just linked in the chat the book with the source for that claim. It's in German. My apologies. So it's it's pretty obvious that the whole story about how all these these fossils get so well preserved in by miraculously just dying and falling into the bottom of a calm lagoon and sitting in limestone that's and and 
I, I guess, Doc, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the natural assumption would be in the bottom of this lagoon, the lime in the bottom is not lithified until when? Depends on the area. I can't tell you exactly how long it took for the limestone or for the lime to become limestone. I'm, I'm not. I'm not asking how long it took. I'm, I'm asking what process. Because in, in the bottom of the lagoon, I think the natural assumption is the lime is not lithified as long as it's and if it's as long as it's submarine and it doesn't lithify until it becomes submarine. No, okay, sorry. I understand what you're saying now. It does lithify under the water. Limestone generally lithifies due to compaction. Basically getting buried by more and more material until the water is forced out. So, That's how a lot of limestone forms. I, I had a feeling you would say something like that. So, so what you're alluding to now is you have to have a pretty thick bed of something on top of the limestone, so it'll lithify at some depth below the the uh, lagoon floor. Over but, time, but yes. Within the first, but within the first what couple meters at least, it's not lithifying because there's not enough compaction. There's not enough weight on top of it yet. I'd say most likely, yes. So that's that's another problematic deal with this this story. You've you've got this. You're you're saying that you can get four. Would you say four centimeters a year? Four millimeters a year. Four millimeters. Um, yes, that is literally less than a, a sixth of an inch in a year. And. And so you need lithification to happen before too many um, tidal storms come in and out of this Bay Area. So, T-Rock, we can tell when a storm is bad enough to touch the bottom because they leave very distinct bed forms. Those aren't in the Sonhofen. The, the, okay, the lagoon well, yeah. is deep enough that the bottom is not affected by storms or tides or waves so so yeah we need to talk about the bed form now and and so when you say when you say we can tell when the storm is bad enough to touch the bottom what do you what do you, what exactly do you mean okay so we've been over that moving water moves sediments around and it well it moves sediments around and creates structures on the bottom of the water right? Okay. There are a lot of different types of bed forms that form in very specific circumstances. Okay. Like if a gen stream is running, raging river, or if there's a big storm where the waves are crashing back and forth all the time. When you have a big storm, like say during a hurricane, that forms a particular bed form well, it forms a few, but one of the main ones is called hummocky cross-stratification. That's a complicated series of words. I'll write it down in the chat. It's basically cross-bedding, right? A more complicated type of cross-bedding. It's very complicated and very, very easy to see. So it happens when the waves are going in one direction and then another and another and they keep going back and forth. So this this we don't gets, see that in the Solenholfen. So this kind of gets at, at part of the problem here with this this storyline is that you're you're equivocating um, today's environment with what was happening this alleged 155 million years ago. So you're, you're, it's equivocate, you're basically assuming that the the planet was just like it is today in terms of its um, uh, geoclimate activity. Okay, T-Rock, this isn't a matter of geoclimate activity. This is physics. Physics causes these bed forms to happen. We know the <laughs> physics behind them. So, Do you have okay. anything to say that physics were different in the past? Because um, other, if you don't, then your objection doesn't hold any weight. Doc, you're you're red herring here. 
nobody. No, I, I'm I, not. I think you're. I think the you're water well moves. No, T Rock. I think you're well the aware that we do not beg for different. The water the moves. The water moves and it moves sediment. That's all that happens. There is so, no reason why it should have affected it differently in the past. So what you're imagining, though, what you're imagining is that you have this lagoon that's sitting there in this calm environment. And then over time, a storm might come through. And so the storm has to interact with the particular um, landform of the lagoon at that time. And what I'm saying is... No, we're not ever begging for different physics in the past. That's that's why it's a red herring. You're 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 kind of getting okay. off completely off topic there. What I'm saying okay. is, when you, when you when you're looking for this very flat planar bed form that is essentially featureless, and you're saying that the only way to get this this featureless flat bed form is in a calm environment, and so now I'm going to get to the real point of why that is not true. Because okay. when you have sheet flow, you can get rid of ripple marks. You can have uh, surface flow that basically smooths off the top. This happens on beachfronts all the time. You can have waves come up, but whenever they retreat, they take and flatten everything back out. Now, that's a small okay. scale, granted. It's a very small scale. But in a large scale storm i.e. a global flood, the sheet scale can be large enough that you can have essentially um, featureless planation surfaces that look like they have no particular bed form. Okay. So your, your error this is, is the last, scale. This is the last thing I'm going to say on this because people are wanting to move on. No, a global flood would not cause those bed forms. We know what bed forms a flood causes. Those are not it. That's your also, this, again. this is no T Rock. Yes. Yes. This is not my just imagination either. Again. You literally just no, it again. I am not. <laughs> Gentlemen, now, <clears throat> let, let me finish, Donnie. Yeah, please. yeah, you can have the last word. Go ahead. With the bed, with the bed forms, and the environment that they suggest, that is not my imagination. Those are the environments those bed forms form in today and in the lab. And as far back as we can figure out, this isn't an assumption. It's not imagination. This is what happens in the world, according to physics, every time we've tried. Please stop saying I'm imagining things. This is what happens. Now, I'm going to go refill my water. Well, y'all go to a different topic. Okay, appreciate it, Doc. <clears throat> what I think would be good topic to transition into would be transitional fossils as that topic in a way has been brought up at least archaeopteryx and the audience does seem to want to move on to a different topic i know the subject matter of transitional fossils has been a, a big contention lately on youtube with with some of the videos coming out and some of the responses and so uh Doc, being a paleontologist, I know that's a, a topic he enjoys. And then Andrew Cumming, I know, said he might want to join for that as well. Fro, we got Fro in here, as, uh, who's a theistic evolutionist, if I'm not mistaken. Fro, good to have you. How you doing tonight? Nope, yeah, you're correct. I am a theistic evolutionist. All right, very cool. Why don't we, therefore, move on to transitional fossils as it does in a way, relate to the topic of tonight's debate, the geologic column, the rock strata in general. And anybody feel free to get involved. I think the two best questions to ask are, why do these interesting mosaics, the, these creatures that blend the traits or share features from different kinds of organisms, I call them interesting mosaics or stratigraphic intermediates. Why do they exist and which model best accounts for them or best explains them? And so we've heard Archaeopteryx discussed and brought up tonight. There's other interesting 
mosaic creatures like Tiktaalik, the famous fishapod. There's the mammal-like reptiles, right? The therapsids, you've got the synapsids. And so how about we start with somebody who's on the pro common descent side? How do you view these mosaics or intermediates? And why do you believe they're best explained through evolution, through common descent? Uh, Fro, do you want to do that or do you want me to go? Sure, I can go. I can go. All so right. the so um first of all, I'm gonna set I'm gonna set the record straight. Unlike uh, Doc here, I'm not a paleontologist. My uh, kind of where I'm learning is more or less in the humanities, but I can uh, give a few examples here. The reason why um the evolutionary understanding of transitional forms has taken on such academic consensus, like universally is because it more it more explains what we see with the phenomenon today. So for instance, one thing that we can um, one thing that we often see is that when we look throughout the geologic column and kind of the history of fossils as well, how we know which fossils are the oldest ones, how much are the youngest ones. First of all, there's clearly some genetic relation here. Like whenever you look at a um, when you look at a theropod dinosaur, for instance, uh, say, I don't know, Velo Velociraptor, and you see Archaeopteryx, you see modern birds, there's clearly some sort of genetic relation between these creatures that's direct. And typically, the reason you see this genetic, uh, when you're when you're genetically, when you have this sort of, uh, what I want to say, when you have this sort of uh, similarity, genetically, genetic um what was it? Being genetically related is the best explanation for that, first of all. And what we also don't find, we do not find uh, modern day birds in the same layers of Archaeopteryx, nor Archaeopteryx in the same layers where we find uh, true theropod dinosaurs millions of years before them. And so there's this lineage that we clearly see from, uh, how I'll put it, from those animals to the animals we have now. Uh, Tiktaalik is a very good example of that because we basically asked, okay, if everything's commonly descended, then what should we expect to find? And if all life comes into the ocean, especially, what should we expect to find? And we should expect to find some sort of um, fish that is capable of land locomotion. And we should expect it to find in kind of the fossil layers and rocks uh, about, about such and such age. And we found it. So the fact of the matter is, when we look at transitional forms, first of all, I think it's so, somewhat of a misnomer because we have the understanding of how to put it. When we say transitional forms, we have the understanding that there's a intent behind this. And again, as a theist, yes, there is. But when you're looking just at the rocks, when you're looking at the fossils, that is a mis that's kind of mistaken. It's so it's not it's not like there's like. I want to say it's not like there's this naturalistic intention to come from A to B as much as A works and A works so well that B comes about too as uh, the world changes. And it well, would I also, guess so. And if it we could stop it, there because we, we just have, we do have a lot of points on the table. And I do appreciate it. I, I like the fact that you're comprehensive, but maybe let's stop there just so we have enough time to engage everything. So I guess my first question to you would be since you mentioned genetic relatedness. Mm -hmm. linking these different creatures, both extinct and extant. Do we have the DNA or genetic data of a lot of these transitional like creatures, Tiktaalik, yes. Archaeopteryx? Well, of those particular creatures, no, but we know they were genetically related to us. And there's a reason that's because thus far, without fail, every organism on earth shares some genetic relation to another. For instance, as unbelievable as it is, um, strawberries and human beings, I think, share about a 40% genetic overlap. And you wouldn't think so, considering that the fact they're plants, but they do. Similarly, when, it, when we look at whales and humans, it's about, I think, a 60% genetic overlap. And because of how recently mankind have evolved from apedom, um, the chimpanzee is 98% related to us. But if and we're. You can, and you can but... kind of compare any sort of species and there is genetic relational overlap so like uh we know tiktaalik well, let me stop you there bro because I, I you did answer the question correctly we don't have the genetic data right of a lot of the 
famous or most prominent transitional form. So how can you link extant organisms to a lot of what we see in the fossil record? For example, even today, there are oftentimes, I just want to finish my thoughts. There oftentimes exists a lot more diversity or variation within the same species Mm -hmm. than across species. So when we look to the fossil record, if we pick up a fossil where we don't have the genetics, I would argue that genes traits genetics, right? That's what's inherited sperm and egg, not a rock, Mm -hmm. not a fossil. So genetics is the best way to determine ancestry. So how can we determine the difference between, let's say, convergent evolution or homology in the fossil record, especially if we're comparing those fossils to extant organisms today? You brought up one other point, the genetic similarities that we see across the biological world. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, does genetic homology, is that best explained or only explained by the common descent model or the separate ancestry model? Because there are a lot of lines of evidence, Fro, that I would argue are agnostic. Right. They're and not so, a way to do well. I, I, I gave you a lot of time to, to respond. You got a lot I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. <laughs> no, that's okay. I understand. <laughs> it, it's a passionate topic. So, for example, if I were to say, well, creation's true because the sky is blue or the earth is round, well, you'd say evolution can also explain that. And so, just because we see homologous patterns in the biological world, we see homology in form, we see homology also in genetics. Now, when you think about the fact that humans share 50% of their DNA with a banana plant, then it's not a surprise that we share, let's say, somewhere in the 90s with a chimpanzee. I understand that's contested. We can get into that. I don't really think it's it matters all that much because regardless, we do share the most with a chimpanzee than any other creature. But just look at a banana plant, look at a chimpanzee. A five-year-old could say, yeah, I I would predict that we're going to find more similarity in the genomes of a chimpanzee and a human than if you were to look at a human and a banana plant. But then there's portions of the genome that I think defy common descent, like the Y chromosome. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Y chromosome between humans and chimpanzees and you consider overall architecture, overall gene content and size differences, you only get about 35 to 40 percent similarity. and so. Fro, go ahead. What are your thoughts? So right. So what you kind of, and here's the thing, is what you're kind of comparing is that how do we, like, what well, I want to say this. Okay. Well, uh, what you're asking is how do we know modern day Mongolians are related to Genghis Khan when we don't have Genghis Khan? Okay. That's kind of what you're saying. That's kind, of, that's kind of the more or less what you're saying. The very fact that we have kind of like, what was it? The very fact that we have Mongolians and Chinese what, that share g- distinct genetic markles, markers suggests that at one point they kind of had a convergence point where they kind of uh, uh, disseminated from. In the same way, that's also how we know that Africans, European, Asians, and North Americans are all related, okay? But we, at the same time, we don't have too much genetic evidence for ancient Africans, Asians, or North Americans. A lot doesn't survive the uh, ravages of time. But we do have current genetic uh, information of all these people that suggests we were all related at some point. And even you would agree with that, Donnie, with your literal interpretation of Adam and Eve. In the same way, when we look at things like uh, humans, banana plants, uh, well, what's what's what, what's another one? Apes, uh, gazelle, they all share at least some genetic overlap, and you're gonna get that if there was a convergence point at, at some time where it all came from one organism or one type of organism, rather. And I think that, and so. The same kind of works in my favor, and I think a little bit better, because your creation model has to explain why there's a large amount of, why there's quite a bit of genetic similarity between us and other things we clearly aren't related to anymore. And I think you're going to have a harder time doing that with creation, because if you assume evolution and you assume especially abiogenesis, this all makes sense because our earliest common ancestor um, sprung into all the forms of life we see today, and we still shared that relation in the same way that all human beings share relation to a single ancestor at some point where we converged. Does that make sense? Are you a, propo- are you a proponent of abiogenesis or chemical evolution that non-living chemicals? Yep. 
evolved I didn't into the first to, well, yeah, living self? I didn't self? used to be. But, well, yeah, I didn't used to be. But in the last year and a half, uh, my uh, my opinion on that has changed. Okay. So you're just one step away from atheism. <laughs> I mean, even I, no, abiogenesis. I, I or, no, not at all. Where do we Don. put God? Okay. Well, anyways, there's a lot of points there I want to uh, address and engage. So yes, we can look at specific genetic markers today between people groups, and we can determine that all people go back to a single common ancestor. We can we can see that just by known DNA data. We can look at mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome DNA markers in. Uh, in the autosomal nuclear DNA. Okay. But the whole question of transitional fossils, and I understand people like Andrew, you know, you're going to have an issue with this and, and that's why we'll engage it. So overall, the design model would look to Genesis as a starting point. Genesis says that we're created in the image of God, right? So that means there must mm -hmm. be something about us that reflects the divine. And what that is, we could discuss for hours, I'm sure. But a really basic prediction or expectation is that, okay, maybe we can get an idea or maybe we can get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on the way we as humans design things. And so we could look to modes of transportation, for example, and it just so turns out that human engineers design and build in homologous patterns. We also mm -hmm. design and build in nested hierarchical patterns. Fro uh, mentioned the fact that we can look to a, a human and a chimpanzee and we share more with a chimpanzee than we would with something that the evolutionist would say is more distantly related. The, the, the evolutionist looks to those differences as being a marker of time. OK, since divergence, essentially. And so the question is, why do humans and chimpanzees share more with each other than, let's say, a human and a banana plant or a human and and a bacteria? But we see the exact same thing in the design world where you can pick sedans and you could pick another vehicle like an SUV. Well, sedans have a lot more in common with an SUV than they do with another engine powered vehicle like an airplane or even an unpowered vehicle like, like a bicycle. So the design model would expect similarities, but the discriminatory lines of evidence that we would look to, and I like to say it's the differences that make all the difference. And so we could look at the fact that even in your shared genetic sequences between humans and chimpanzees, you find uh, differences in the way those are regulated or the way those are expressed. We see differences in epigenetics, alternative splicing. We could talk about these all day. And so I think it's the differences, since we both expect similarities, it's the differences that point better to the creation or separate ancestry model. In, in terms of transitional fossils, and then this is where I'll wrap it up, we'll get some thoughts. We, again, would look to the design world. And what do we find? We find interesting intermediate forms in the design world. For example, here we see three vehicles. These are called crossover SUVs, at least two of them. One of them is a Jeep Gladiator. So the point is these resist classification, the perfect transition. Mm -hmm. It blends the features, I'm almost done, of a van and an SUV. And yet vans are already very similar. SUVs are already very similar in the same sense that, okay, you got fish that are pretty similar to amphibians, amphibians to fish, and then we have a Tiktaalik. Okay, and so we have a confirmed expectation here. You can also look to vehicles that were made in the past that are no longer made today. They don't exist today. For example, here's an interesting, interesting one: 1961 Amphicar. So oh, this that looks cool. Features, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at this guy. He's just going to cruise right to work. He could go right across the lake or the river. And so this no longer exists today. And so when the evolutionist says, "Well, what about TikTok?" Well, there's a lot of diversity in the pre-flood world. Basically what we're looking at in terms of the uh, diversity in the fossil record is not necessarily transitional forms. I would call them stratigraphic intermediates. Doesn't mean that, that they're a, a transitional form that has implications there, of course, but there is a lot of diversity and th this is just reflection of uh, pre and post flood uh, diversity, at least post flood initially with some of these creatures. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. I see somebody is trying to speak, go ahead. Hey, Donnie, uh, quick question. Sorry, guys, I'm butt in. I, uh, you touched on the topic of design, and I was wondering, um, do you think, so there's a video on YouTube, that, uh, Professor, uh, his name is Dr. Jason Lyle. He presents a theory uh, called the Mandelbrot set. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it. And um, 
So he, he, she shows through these equations on the grid that this pattern of the Mandelbrot set, in the end, if you keep diving deeper into the Mandelbrot set, the more you zoom in, he showed, he was able to show ways that God, God's mentality to have some percentage, he, he, he creates according, uh, all creation is based off, if you look at it, like beaches, forests, and all their designs and patterns, flowers, the buds of them, all those designs are based off of supposedly the Mandelbrot set. Uh, I just want to ask your opinion. What would you think about that? Yeah, I've I've heard uh, Dr. Lyle speak on this. He's also put out a book recently. I think it's called Fractals, where he goes into some pretty amazing evidence for design. I wouldn't disagree with it. I'm also not an expert at it, but I would okay. agree with it. In in terms of and in good point, I appreciate you bringing that up. In terms of the yeah. overall picture here, and then I want to hand it to one of the evolutionists to to interact. Now. Okay, yeah. so basically, the bigger picture of the transitional forms argument is just like homology. Just like nested hierarchy, I hear some background noise. You might have to mute, brother. So in, in the same way we look at homology, nested hierarchical patterns, I would argue that it's overall agnostic to the debate because human engineers design in homologous patterns. And so they also design in hierarchical patterns. So why shouldn't God? Okay. So, well, and then, uh and then the evolutionary model would expect that humans and chimpanzees would share a lot more in terms of morphology, anatomy, genetics, physiology, because humans and chimpanzees share a more recent common ancestor than let's say humans and a dog or humans and a fish. So those differences are due to time. Okay. And then homology, you would look to these uh, patterns as reflecting descent with modification where these, these structures do modify and change over time. So both models can explain that. But it's the differences that make all the difference. I think it's, it's the differences that we are to, to look at to decide what model best explains the uh, overall data. Separate right. ancestry or common mm -hmm. descent? Go ahead. Anyone can speak. Yeah. So uh, let me kind of respond to that. So first of all, Donnie, I, you made a brilliant representation of how evolution works because it's basically the same design. But it is updated every now and then to basically meet at different challenges that it finds itself in. That's that's kind of oversimplifying it. But yeah, that's more or less evolution. I'm sure Doc will correct me if I say something wrong. But more along the lines, you can't actually think of you, you can't take this premise yet also not have it contradict because Donnie, as I said before, and I think you'd agree with me, you have you are married to a literal interpretation of Genesis. And that's problematic for what you just said, because what you are imagining is that God makes a design and in his creation, um, especially creates all other uh, uh, creations that have similarities to that original design. The problem is that's not how Genesis presents creation. What we see first is that God creates kind of like, you know, the, the skies and the seas, but then he creates plants just out of nothing. Then he creates uh fish and all the other um, creatures of the sea. Then he creates the land creatures. And finally, man, these aren't the same design. They're based, they're separate creations entirely. There isn't one design he's making and then just takes that same design and moves it into the sea or into the air. No, like these are completely separate creation events that- Right, that's why we believe in what's called the- same the... design with each other. Well, but, hey, first I got to correct you. It's, it, it, we interpret the Bible literarily. And so we understand that which is historical, a historical narrative. We understand similes, imagery, symbolism, prophecy. But that's why we hold to, based on Genesis, that God would have created original creatures with internal diversity that can be utilized for change, adaptation, speciation. And so, yes, God would have created a diversity of creatures. There also would have been a diversity of ecosystems and environments in the pre-flood world. And so a lot of the intermediate forms we look at in the fossil record are simply reflecting the intermediate ecosystems that they existed in. Very similar to your military amphibious assault vehicle right here. Human yeah, engineers. I would like to say something about that, Donnie, because I think that's a false analogy. Sure, go ahead. 
Yeah, so it's a false analogy. Um, vehicles don't breed, they don't pass along genetics, none of that is done. It, it To find an analogy to um, something, it has to have the characteristics that meet for those two things. So if you want to make an analogy um, between amphibious vehicles and, you know, so some some kind of car that would be fine because they have the same characteristics but the the way that genetics are passed down is not the same as designing designing a car um and your model doesn't explain things like atavisms for instance like why a car doesn't doesn't suddenly have a bonnet of a model t ford for instance your model also doesn't understand uh, I, I explain. Sorry, wh why why we we don't have prototypes? You know, some some kind of car that's completely unrelated to any other car because it's like a a um um sort of a a, a, a proof of concept kind of thing, um, and that car would have absolutely no relation to any other car um, because it, it has got unique parts to it. We don't find that. We find everything interlinked. So your analogy fails on multiple levels because it doesn't actually take into account what we see in real life and cars do not breed with one another, pass information to one another and create baby cars with a combination of that information. That doesn't happen. So I appreciate that. I'd argue that that's an overall straw man. You've been corrected on that multiple times. I'll correct you on it again. And so as I iterated earlier, the design model would start with Genesis. This data, what I'm saying, didn't have to be true. We are said to be created or made in the image of God. And so therefore there should be something about us that reflects the divine. And so we are arguing, we are predicting, okay, if we look to the design world, then we What's should be able to get man? an idea. We should be able to get an idea into how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. And so it didn't have What's to turn man? out that, well, I'm not done. It didn't well, have to turn out man? your straw man is, well, cars don't reproduce. We understand cars don't reproduce. No, you're no, misrepresenting that's not, our no, model. No, no, that's well, not a straw man. I want to I'm not misrepresenting your yes, position. Yes, you are, because you're misrepresenting the design hypothesis that I'm putting forth, and then you're tearing down that misrepresentation. So you're not actually refuting or addressing anything. And so it didn't have no, to be I'm true. I'm addressing your analogy, just the analogy. No, the analogy does not break That's down simply because cars don't reproduce. We but understand that cars don't reproduce. I'm not straw manning your analogy at all. I, I would argue you are because the first thing you now, said was mm -hmm. cars don't pass on information, cars don't breed. We Do you understand agree with that? that. Adding. Do you agree with that? Yes. Then how am I straw manning? Then how am I straw manning? If because you you're misrepresenting that, the overall model that is no, making not. predictions. No, I am refuting making... your false analogy. No. That's all. Well, it's not a yeah, false analogy Duncan, because he provided a valid critique hey, of your analogy. Hey, it's hey, valid. I, I just want to finish I, making my point because I hear a lot of crosstalk. I just want to finish man. making my point. No if if there's man. something that someone disagrees with, write it down. You'll have an opportunity to, to respond. And so it didn't have to uh, be true that if we were to look at the design world and we find that the design world, the way humans design things, fits the overall patterns that we see in the biological world. And so, yes, we do see human. Now, here's the thing. Reproduction adds complexity. Control it me. adds challenges and problems to the evolutionary model. Oh, that's sweet. That's for sure. Okay. Humans are not quite on the same level as, as an infinite God. So, yeah, God was able to design his creatures with the ability to reproduce, pass on their genes. Imagine human engineers were able to build these prototype vehicles that at that point could simply replicate. Well, they're going to save a lot of time, money, and maybe another 100 to 200 years in the future, we might get to that level because we're in the infancy of recognizing design. Okay. So, uh, so hold on. If I may interrupt you real quick, Donnie. So, uh, why don't maybe you have a question? My... Maybe you have hold on, maybe you have a question, but so well, I was addressing them, but Fro interrupted. Oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I like, could just real well, quick. I, I, I... I'd like to get to atavisms and and sort of factory mo like factory versus uh, prototyping. Well, can, can you repeat your point about link? Because I would agree that all these vehicles can be linked due to similar materials used, similar metals. Uh, th they all share tires, have a lot in common where you can link them. Even a lot of these interesting, hard to okay. classify vehicles. 
So, so the thing is that a prototype or, or basically a proof of concept model is one that they've used to sort of do everything different. Like you, you have a few for prototype models that that have come out that where they're unique, they're one of a type kind. They don't they don't come out in lots. They're a unique vehicle as a proof of concept that someone has has made, right? So where are we finding these? Because for a start, I didn't straw man you. I, I your analogy is these things are analogous, and I address that analogy directly. That's not a straw man. That is your actual argument that these things are analogous. And I've pointed out where they are not, and it makes a big difference. So they don't breed, don't reproduce. Um, atavisms, you haven't addressed that. Where, where do these atavisms come from? Because we don't see cars produced with suddenly a bonnet from a Model T Ford, like this throwback. Can you, and yes, part of that atavism. is Atavism. Can you define an atavism? What's, what's your understanding of an atavism? Well, an atavism is where you have a characteristic of a uh, previous um, model or, or a previous um, organism um, that, that no longer appears, like when chicken are mm. born with teeth, for instance, or humans have a sort of uh, a tail section to them. Like these- I understand, okay, up. yeah. But here's the thing, birds in the fossil record, like Archaeopteryx, for example, had teeth. And so they've already yeah. got that information in in the genome we're sure that could that could come about here in in extant versions that's not my point that's not my point my point is that we should see the same thing if it is an analogy we should see the same thing happening with cars and we don't well, no the analogy analogy is like we don't see a car being produced today that has like a model t ford engine right we don't see that can i say a real quick point sorry because i'm fixing to have to go yeah go ahead brian go ahead all right. Uh, the point of his analogy was the engineering uh, aspect. Uh, since we see similarities in engineering, if creation was in fact designed by creator, we would also see those same similarities. Um, and I, I, so I think you're you're just kind of trailing down the wrong road path there. Were you born but, or were you engineered? Were you born or were you engineered? I was born. But God created there you go. mankind. There you go. God no, you were born. Mankind. It's not the same process, so, so it's not an analogy. No, 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 no. No, it's not. You're a fault. I think I think Donnie is right. You are attacking a straw man argument there. You're okay. Misrepresenting so for analogy. But anyway, I got to get going because I've got to uh, 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 help. Uh, my son needs my VR oh, headset. Oh, thank you. But uh, anyway, or nice right. or whatever it is. There. Oh, okay. First, right. I will Colleen, say, Mark, my doc. Sure. Have a good one. Thanks for coming. Um, and I will say, I agree. Mark's position or Mark's response was not a straw man. He was directly Correct. addressing Donnie's analogy. With that said, Correct. if we are to follow the analogy, cars are engineered by humans. Humans are imperfect beings. I think we can all agree with that. That's why oh, yeah. cars fall apart and you need to get your oil changed and fill it up with gas. But if all living things were engineered by a perfect god, why is it that human beings and other animals have so many flaws? Sin. Okay, so a few points there. I, I would still argue that it is a straw man because the analogy pertains to the patterns. Okay, we should be able to look to the patterns in which humans design and find similarities in those patterns in the biological world. And we do. We find homologous patterns we don't. in the biological world. We find that human engineers design in homologous patterns. We see human you, engineers design interesting intermediates. Can you tell me like, what a false analogy is to you, Donnie? Like what, what that means to you, a false analogy or a faulty analogy? Well, if you were to try and compare something, let's say, from the biological world to... I don't know. The definition of a, a faulty analogy, like or a false analogy. Well, if I'm trying to make a point based on looking to something in the man-made world, I, the, what's your exact definition of an analogy? Is that what you're asking? What's, what's your definition of, of an analogy? Well, a, a false analogy is one where because two things are alike in one way, they must be alike in another way. 
right? That that's what a false analogy is. But it doesn't have analogy. to be it, that. That is the exactly definition equivalent. of a false analogy. So if you're sort of saying, "Hey, these two things have these traits in comparison," so therefore, as a result of them being similar in this way, they must be similar in other ways. That is what a false analogy is. Just because they're similar in some ways doesn't mean they're similar in all ways. And that's why it's a false analogy, because you're saying, hey, they all have characteristics that are shared. They all have. That's sort of like me saying, well, because bats and birds both fly, they must all be from the same lineage or something. Right. That, well, no, you know, I, that, that would be a false analogy. But my comparison, again, has to do with, with the patterns. So do you disagree yes. that we find similar patterns? I'm not saying it's an exact apples to apples where every last minute detail is the same, but the overall patterns of, let's say, homology nested and, and nested hierarchies, we do find a pattern in, in man-made things and a pattern in the biological world. Would you agree with that? Uh, not the there same. Are patterns, but they're not um, the same. Yeah, because there are things, like I pointed out, like atavisms and concept cars and things that fall outside right. that hierarchy. They're things that that are put into practice. You have people that, um, like I, I saw a article, and this is actually quite funny. A guy was arrested in my city for driving down a road on a motorized um, esky or a motorized beer cooler. Okay, which is just hilarious for a start, but we're not finding things like the motorized beer cooler of the the um, nested hierarchy of evolution of the cladistics. We're not finding that, right? So there are these exceptions to the the vehicle analogy that you've got that show that the analogy does not work, and the fact that they do not biologically reproduce, which is an, a, a a pivotal factor. Of, of this this analogy is that, hey, they can't all be related because we have this as well. It is a false analogy. You're saying, hey, they share characteristics, therefore they'd most, but they, they have to both be designed. No, that isn't the case. False analogy. And that's not a straw man of your position. That's a, that's, that is a, a, a logic and rationality based evaluation of your analogy that you're making. No, yeah, but so you're, I, you're I, I, using I, the I, same. I, I just want to. I just want to respond. I just want to respond. I'm simply comparing two things: something in nature, something in the design world, and I am showing some similarities, some ge a general pattern. Now, I'm not saying that it's exact it in every single minute detail, because as I've pointed out, humans are just in the infancy of even recognizing design. We've just recently recognized the fact that designing intermediate vehicles serves a, a function for certain people that, that are looking for that type of thing. Okay. But the biological world, as you've said, which we would argue God has designed, has the ability to reproduce, to pass on their genes. We also understand based on what doc was saying that there's been degeneration. There's been death, extinction, mutation, accumulation since what we would argue was the creation event. OK, but with humans, yeah, every single vehicle, they have to design themselves. They have to make themselves. We haven't excelled or advanced to the point where we can make a bunch of archetypes, as the design diversity model would suggest. And then from there, those archetypes could replicate. I mean, so there'd be a lot of people out of, out of a job, but that would be brilliant design. God's already yeah. thought of that. He's above and beyond that. So, yeah, it's not a perfect apples to apples comparison but we can discuss those differences atavism sorry it's, um, Go ahead. you talked about uh, what i said earlier hold may on, i doc. first t rock hold, hold on doc um I, i've been listening for quite a while i just wanted to, to say something real quick donnie's analogy is perfectly valid because the whole point of separate ancestry is that you can reuse a concept without reproduction you, you create the first thing. You don't need reproduction to create the second thing. You just create it, but reuse the concept. And, and so it's perfectly valid. And one of, the, one of the points to be made there is that when you see homologies and, and things like that of, of any sort, atavisms um, included, one of the points to make there is that at the very best, 
it's agnostic. You can design it that way, or it can be inherited that way. Still a false analogy. So this actually gets to the, the, what I think is the real crux of this art, or one of the real cruxes of this argument that I'd like to ask you a question about, Donnie. So you're saying your, your argument is basically these nested hierarchies that we see in life, um, granting the premise that there are nested hierarchies in man-made vehicles, which I don't accept, but just running with that, um, that there are similarities there. So we should expect uh, the same kinds of, of patterns of a nested hierarchy in life that we see in design. My question to you is, if human beings are limited by physical constraints and the materials they have at hand in order to design what they ultimately design, whereas right. the entity you're advocating for, God in this case, or the common designer is supposedly not restricted by any of that, um, has no physical limitations. He could do it however he wants. My question to you is, you're saying we would expect this nested hierarchy what would you not expect of this common design model uh, in, in terms of these patterns of similarities versus differences? Please answer. Great. That's an excellent question. So that's where I think this comes down to the discriminatory lines of evidence that we could look to to answer the question, which model is true, common descent or separate ancestry. What we would not expect to find is at the genotype or looking at the genetic content of the biological world, we would not expect there to be mostly junk, evolutionary leftovers, uh, genetic mistakes. You know, let's let's say the genomes of living organisms were only about 10% functional. Well, that, then that would be really related to the, the question I brought up though, because my question was specifically about what we would expect and not expect of common design regarding similarities versus differences among biological organisms, not junk DNA or anything like that. That's well, right, tangential but, to the question. But I'm saying that the homology, the nested hierarchical patterns, and the interesting mosaics or intermediates that we see in the design world, they are there for functional purposes. So we would also expect that the homology, the nested hierarchies, and then the interesting intermediates that we find in the biological world are also there for functional purposes. But if we were to find that they weren't there for functional purposes, then that would not be analogous to the design world because the design world, those patterns are there for functional purposes. Does that answer? I feel like it answers your question, but maybe not. I, I think so. But then I would disagree that the biological world is shared form for shared function. I don't think that at all describes right. what we see in I understand. And, and, and that's where the debate is. Once we recognize that these patterns exist, and then the creationist model would predict that these patterns are there for functional purposes, for example, with the intermediates, I would argue that what we see in terms of stratigraphic intermediates in the fossil record, like the mammal, like reptiles, tiktolic, archaeopteryx, they are intermediate in their form. They blend the features of, of these different uh, creatures because a lot of these creatures exist in intermediate ecosystems. Intermediate form due to intermediate ecosystems because we understand that environment oftentimes does dictate morphology or phenotype. And so that's a so, working hypothesis right there. Done. And that, that focuses Not on all function. transitional forms we find in the fossil record are, are living in Exclu exclusive or intermediate environments in the way you're right. raising it. Right. That's why I said most, yeah. because I think environments have changed well, over time. I don't time, think you've been right? most, so. but that's potato, potato. Well, Tiktaalik. Does, does Tiktaalik exist in, in a, an environment? Well, that's, that's one example, but a lot of other know? examples don't fit that criterion. Hey, wait, 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 wait. I need, I need to ask Can this. I... Donnie, what environment did Tiktaalik live in? I think it's found in at the top of my head Devonian, which no, that's the age. What environment? Okay, like, what was yeah. the environment like? So uh, was it very swampy because it was a, a it was suitable okay. for the fact that it it could go on land. It, it was a, a bottom dwelling lobe fin fish 
in in some respects and so it was able How to you... leave its water environment come up on land and so i would assume some kind of so swampy or so, but, but, yeah. let, let me finish some let me finish this mark so you think that all of the rock layers were deposited in a flood right like the global flood of noah not all of them so I, you know, I, why, I well i'm just okay not all of them that's interesting but let's say the majority especially the lower rock layers like the devonian ones do you agree with that yeah i, I would hold to uh, uh okay. probably high cenozoic boundary so if they were deposited in the flood then why do you agree with conventional geology that it probably lived in a swamp shouldn't it like shouldn't all traces of its original environment have been destroyed well where did it how do live? you know it lived in a swamp no, well, it, the answer is it, no, it, that its environment should not have been destroyed. Didn't the flood wipe away everything? Wasn't that the but point? No, but, 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 but firstly, Doc, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on your original question in terms of the environment it lived in. What, what I, I understand it was in the Devonian, but isn't isn't the Devonian represented by the actualist thinking of, of a very specific kind of environment during that time period? What, oh. what was that environment? Not all what Devonian I'm saying, Donnie... Yeah, not all Donian environments were the same, but also, right, Donnie, I, I know how conventional geology reconstructs that environment. How right. do you reconstruct an organism's environment using flood geology? Are, are how do you, you saying know what that, environment it lived in? What data do you look at? Well, is it? It sounds like you have an assumption that the global flood would have destroyed any any trace of what that pre-flood environment for that species would have looked like. Or comprised the purpose of the flood was to wipe away all traces of man's sin right right so it should well, have wiped I, I would everything assume away. there are ways that we can re-establish certain aspects of of the pre-flood world based on looking at, at some of these ecosystems that were buried yeah most of what we find would be transport transported from one area to another but typically aspects of those environments were transported with, with those creatures T -Rock, T -Rock would, you, would, you, would you agree earlier, with that the flood would wipe away a lot of the geological features wasn't t-rock arguing that no, it, that's what he sure. was arguing earlier a lot of them no, but that's no. what he was arguing earlier yeah no. you were T -Rock, what are your thoughts yeah, you were. the context it's the context that matters it, because Donnie kind of made the point already that, that what Doc Dino said um, alluded to this idea that the environment itself, all traces of it, have to go away and only Tiktaalik is left behind. And that's not what anybody thinks happened. No, I'm, I'm really talking about you sort of saying earlier that the lagoon features the... Um... The beds. What was the name for it? The bed forms? Was it... So, uh, yeah, bed forms. forms. The bed forms would be wiped away by the flood. So it seems like, to me at least, no, um, that you're sort right of saying, anymore. hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's, that's what right. you said. That's think, what you said. I think that's that was just uh, It seems to me, it seems to me, it seems snow. to me that this will wipe away whatever is convenient and leave whatever is convenient to you. That's yeah, but that's not what he was talking about at the time. It was just a hypothetical that we were discussing in regards to snails and and uh, shells and hard body and soft bodied fossils. So I think you're mistaken in regards to what he said in regards to the claim. It was he was still better. saying the environment should be wiped away, so we can't Correct. reconstruct the that's environment not, from what is in the what area. Correct, because he was disputing that it was a lagoon. I was paying very close attention because he was disputing that it would be a lagoon. Yeah, in, in, in either case, it was, it was a hypothetical. So it's it's not like he stated that every, each and every Oh, it's it's all across the world is going to be exactly the hypothetical like that. isn't the important no, 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 part no, the I important think, no, no, part is I consistency you you're, you're making an extrapolation it's a, it's, it's it's a logical fallacy you're trying to say that because he made a statement of, in, in regards to one particular scenario that we can extrapolate this and say that every single scenario every single area that we look all across the world in that period of time was exactly just like that that's, that's right. Wrong. It's called yeah, that's, you, that's you, that's you, that's 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 you started off with no, no, sorry, but you started off with this false dichotomy. I want to bring this back a little bit because you're kind of going away from the whole patterns what, thing that what, Donnie was what talking dichotomy? about. No, no, you brought up this dichotomy? false dichotomy about saying how what dichotomy? Donnie, what was the how dichotomy? Donnie's observed observation. What was the dichotomy? Hold on, hold what, was the dichotomy? Stop well, what was the dichotomy? I don't even know what the dichotomy is. You got to stop talking here, buddy. You got to stop talking here. Well, you got to stop talking here. I'd love to know what the dichotomy is. No, no, no. I'm talking. I'm telling you, 
Danny brought up this whole very interesting uh, start with the patterns of observation with the manufacturing and design that we can observe. And he was trying to say, you know, hey, maybe this is a good start to making a natural observation and saying that no, maybe this is, it alludes to a, a common des uh, a designer, right? So we started off that way and you guys jumped in, dogpile, and that's okay. But just to bring it back there, I think it's better off that we discuss the idea of how we allude that to nature and think of the pattern concept in regards to what we can observe in reality across different species that have nothing to do with each other. Instead of sitting here and trying to extrapolate that this person said that and this person said that. So let's take a moment and go back and think about how common, how, how these design the elements. Remember how I just said, you were trying what to say. That that, no, no, no. Do you understand what a dichotomy is? I don't understand what a dichotomy is, apparently, but that's not the point. Okay. okay. In either so case, you understand. A okay, a okay. No, 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 I don't well, need the explanation. Me, I didn't ask you for the explanation. Then. No, I don't need it. Okay, so you don't want to know. I don't want the explanation from you. I'm talking here. I don't need you to sit here wow. and start acting like as if you're some authority. Okay? Don't pontificate. We're trying to have a nice conversation about... Whether Who's or not pontificating right now? What? <laughs> I think. Okay. I so here, okay. I, I'd like to address this because this really was aimed at me. This really was aimed at me. So I'd like to address it now. You, you sort no, of said, it's yeah, not about you. Some... It's not about you at all. Please don't make this about you. I don't understand why you're trying to take the mic. Okay. Don't make this so about you. Don't talk about a false dichotomy that doesn't exist. Mark, if, if, if I the dichotomy was incorrect. Let's move on. Well, you're, this, you're, you're a big boy. You well, this idea of a dichotomy, did you mean just talking about because if we're comparing two things, you know, black and white it, is, you know, uh, if you look at political systems, is it just right, left? You know, that's kind of so some would say that's a false dichotomy. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. And so this dichotomy of the biological world versus the design world, is it extreme? Is it just black and white? Or is, is there a, an overall analogy there in terms of the patterns? But then when we look to the details, we are going to find some, a, a level of deviation from the overall analogy simply because we're dealing with a biological world that we're arguing God designed versus an engineered world that, that man is, is essentially in charge of. Mm -hmm. So it's not really right, black. And it's not as black yeah. and white as I feel like, Mark, you may have been uh, attempting no, to and, and AR, no AR, i don't, I don't think great this point. Can, 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 I, can, I, great say point. can about, I say something i think i think we're going no, back because to you just talking about and i haven't been able to say anything at all i've been cut okay off let's do this to be I fair mark we'll let you go yeah to be fair we'll let mark go and then um just yeah. talking about what yeah so so i'm not making a dichotomy between the biological world and a human designed world for instance you know there are biological things that are human designed you know we have um sort of you know monsanto creates biological organisms that are designed to eat oil and and do these things so i'm not making a dichotomy between those at all what i'm saying is and and sort of you can point to natural observations and say hey um, we design things. I think the world is designed. That's fine. What I'm saying is the analogy between cars and human-made um, engines and, and things that are um, um, sort of uh, 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 human-designed is a false analogy because it lacks a lot of the traits that we would associate with the biological world. That's all. So this sort of, well, um, it, it can't, you know, I can't say that. It's like, well, yeah, I can, because the analogy falls down on a number of crucial, crucial areas. And one of those is is the the, the way that we, we pass along um, design blueprints of these things. Like right. the, the cars aren't replicating. They're not passing their blueprints right. to one another. It, it's because we haven't advanced that far well, technologically just, just, just speaking. Let me, let, me, let me talk. Let me talk. They're not passing along the blueprints to one another to merge those blueprints to create a car that is an amalgamation of both design blueprints. So it cannot be a decent analogy. It is a false analogy. Because I think it's it a great analogy. Traits. No, right. Oh, it's right. terrible. It's one. So it's a great okay, analogy. Okay, but the thing so is, we are simply yeah. saying, hey, because these things are designed, they will share all these other traits, kind of thing. B because right, Mark, thank, cars thank you. Thank you for reminding us about common. what you said. And thank you for reminding us about what you said because that's what you were trying to interrupt me before about to Yeah, to, I, that's to not a that false that analogy. Okay, so, all right, all right. so now now that we are reminded of what you said, 
it's actually so this whole thing is very cool so you're saying that this pattern idea is uh you, you can't take the pattern idea and compare it to nature all right fine yeah okay but it's just it's a very nice way to start thinking because also you can't take two two fossils that are kind of similar to each other and say hey they're related they're evolutionarily linked because you, you'd be oh, using the same exactly logical what policy do, that you but... just used about Ghani's mm -hmm. argument but nonetheless we can kind of take it from there and say hey Maybe there's something that we can observe from our natural world and see if there is a natural law behind it, because that's how we have discovered a lot of different things, such as gravity, you know, an apple fell. We're like, oh, hey, maybe there's something to this. Let's see if it's right. So, yeah, we can actually observe the natural behaviors that we as humans do and even animals do and say, hey, maybe there's something behind it that could possibly be a law of nature. So I think it's very val it's very valid what Donnie said, especially when you think, when you say, oh, these two fossils where we have no uh, possible idea about any soft tissue linkage, we just see a skeletal system that kind of look alike. We're gonna say mm -hmm. they're different mm -hmm. and they're evolutionarily linked rather than just claiming they're I mean, nuts. Both, they're both, I mean, on, it, on both sides it, of the equation, right. they're both logically fallacious. If you want to say I, Donnie is mm. logically fallacious, you are also logically I, fallacious by, because there are no actual transitional fossil links. We it, can start if I may, if you, you want to talk soft tissue, we have tectonic no, skin. I, like, I like what ARE brought up before. He said, if God was going to design this whole system, would he design... Would he be so simple or would he be more complex with the mm -hmm. types of different things, that. even if they're the same parts? And you know what? That's th These are the types of questions we should be asking. Are this a systematic questions of the whole evolutionary slash uh, change slash natural, whatever you want to call it, process. That's what we should be talking about. You know, not I mean, whether we that. can't you spend 20 that, minutes that's not on science. logical policy. You can and believe that, but that's not science. science. Right. Because what that is done, exactly science. What you that have is exactly done, what science. Science is you what make you an observation done, in the you natural have done, world, what you have and then you create an experiment. Hey guys, a little bit of cross no, 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 I don't want you to. I don't want you to miss what you have done. You've taken your conclusion. You've taken your conclusion that they have been designed. And now you're looking for places where you can go, no, oh, what's designed? I, no, How, what does that incorrect. have in common with what we see in the biological literally world? literally did not just say so that. So you're I starting said that, with no. your conclusion and then working towards it. did not. I did not. I just described things the whole like No, like this is wrong. Like please, that. please. You this said is, it was what you're saying is wrong. Okay, guys, it's, it's turning thinking. into a bit of a dumpster fire. I'm trying to be nice, cordial. No, it's just I'd like to make sure that I'm not... Being, I appreciate the uh, point. You know, from, having this red herring straw man go, going on, yeah. You know? okay. hey, hey, guys, look, let's, let's go back to uninterrupted responses. Mark, you start, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so you said it's a nice way to start thinking about it, but it isn't a nice way to start thinking about it. it it's uh, irrational and it's illogical when you start to use false analogies. When you start to say, hey, um, you know, these guys are on a baseball team. People have brothers on the baseball team. Therefore, they have brothers. That's a false analogy. Um, you can't start making conclusions based upon similarities and then extending those similarities to cover everything. Like I gave you earlier with the bats and birds have similarities, therefore they they came from the same place. You can't make that analogy. But that's not what we're basing okay. evolution on. We're basing evolution on a number of scientific principles where we're saying, hey, we observed this, let's do testing, let's do this process and find out what the conclusion is. You guys are starting the other way around. You're getting the conclusion and then using a false analogy to try to fit what you okay. think with the natural right. world. So I need to stop Make you there because you obviously you're mixing up what I just said and you're misrepresenting everything I just said. And in fact, you flipped it around. What you just described is actually what is going on when you're trying to try uh, trying to use two different fossils and uh, and shapes to link them together through an evolutionary process. And uh, what uh, I described yeah, is I said I said, "Hey, you observe something in nature and you're like, wait a minute, maybe there's something more to this." And then you go on using the scientific method to set up a series of tests that you can repeat that could re re lead to observable data that you can st study and put together. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that Donnie's observation of a repetition of patterns between and, uh, and different things between created items in our 
natural world is something that we can observe and try to then move forward to see if this is something that we can conclude is a part of the natural, uh, uh, the genetic coding. I didn't make a conclusion. I said, we start off with an observation, a hypothesis. That is science. This is the scientific method. You start with the hypothesis and then you go on and you start and test it to see whether your hypothesis or null hypothesis is more likely to occur. That's so what I said. It what to you're that, saying is I started off with the conclusion? That's wrong. That's a misrepresentation. So, it, so please, no. let's be if more I may, simple and I think about something? this from an esoteric perspective and how this could relate on a larger systematic uh, scale. Esoteric perspective? I thought you were being oh. scientific. What do you mean oh. by esoteric? Like oh. hidden knowledge? Oh, okay. I see. So what what, what about everything else I just said? Before you answer, what, please, what Donnie, can I, I request said, something? Hmm. Okay, sure. Donnie. I mean, I can address that. If okay, you let's throw it to Doc. Let's throw it to Doc. He's, but I, I'm he's, like, okay. letting Doc go. Just First, just a, just a quick request. Can we please keep responses to 30 seconds or less? I feel that would be beneficial for the flow of the conversation. Just yes, a request. I'm not, the le I'm not the leader here. I, I think, especially for the last 30 minutes here, as I did say we're going to do about a four-hour show, let's try and make mm -hmm. it a little bit more organic now with uh, responses that are not as, as lengthy, I guess. I, I think we've all had a, a lot of time to make our points, which is good. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would like to make a quick point, and then anybody can jump in. It'll be really quick. Because, again, it does go back to what Mark is talking about in terms of testable predictions and also mm -hmm. what Andrew was talking about in terms of what would we expect versus what we would not expect. And so, yes, I would argue that these overall patterns, although they're not perfectly analogous to the biological world, because we are in the infancy of recognizing design, we have not advanced enough where we can design archetypes, let's say vehicles. Let's just say we were able to design this amphibious, military amphibious assault vehicle. We design one, an archetype. And then from there, it can just replicate itself. Yeah, we haven't advanced that far, but we have a, an overall pattern that we can work with here. And now we can make testable predictions. And so we would argue, okay, these patterns exist in the man-made world due to functional reasons. And so the biological world, those patterns should also be there for functional purposes. So rather than nested hierarchies by descent or through descent, we would argue it's nested hierarchies through function. Okay, and then that's where we can kind of, I think, advance the ancestry debate is, is engaging that issue. Go ahead. Anybody can jump in. So, so, may, may, I, may I ask oh, something, okay. please? I've been wanting to ask something. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, sorry, Doc. Yeah. You're, you're fine, Mark. So to the creation side, and anyone can grab this, does anyone know how, let's just stick with Tiktaalik, anyone know how Tiktaalik was predicted and why it was predicted? Anyone can take it. I can answer that. Yeah. I'd... Uh, well, I'd like a creationist I, 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 first I, I, if none of them want to. Though. I'm happy to, but I don't want to hog. The, if T Ronk wants to do it, I can do it. Whoever wants I, to do it. I know roughly. I'm not going to be super pristine with it, but I know roughly the idea was that um, some pre Devonian layers contained fossils from like a marine environment and some post. Devonian fossils contained organisms from more of a land based. And so somebody said, hey, somewhere in between there, we should find a transitional fossil. And so they identified a particular formation. I think it's in Canada, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, that mm -hmm. said, um, okay, so this, this transition between this deep marine and this land environment should contain organisms that um, are approaching sort of an end amphibious state well, well more, sure also more that's actually not a bad well sorry i have a line of questioning here that's not a sorry. bad that's not a bad summary that's pretty accurate related to that how was australopithecus predicted again anyone can take it because it was well, predicted does anyone know well when they're making predictions from my understanding the evolutionary community are going to look to two species or organisms that they believe their starting point is that these organisms are closely related like humans and the non-human primates 
Okay. So rather than saying, well, we're going to find a transitional form between humans and a banana plant or humans and a fish. Well, those two organisms, they share too distant of an ancestor. So they're going to look to humans and the non-human primates, and they're going to look for what's called, if, if I understand correctly, they're going to look for both uh, basal and derived features that should be present in a common ancestor in a certain layer if, if that existed. And so the evolution community would argue that the Australopithecines meet that criteria. So they, they predict a very specific morphology. Okay, that's well, pretty good too. So they, 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 here's, here's my last point, and I'll need about a minute for this. So we know how we got, how we predicted Tiktaalik, how we predicted Australopithecus. To add to Australopithecus, uh, Darwin hypothesized that it, or at least something like it, would be found in Africa because chimpanzees are very similar to humans and they're in Africa. Now, lastly, Archaeopteryx was also predicted. And it was predicted because a lot of paleontologists noted the distinct similarities between birds and dinosaurs. And then, two years after The Origin of Species was published, we found Archaeopteryx. The evolutionary theory, because it is a theory, consistently makes these predictions, and those predictions are consistently fulfilled. Just add so, one can any creationist give a good explanation that. for why that is? So, or, yeah, why are these still are creationists like, making? What predictions uh, are creationists uh, making? Let me make, let Actually, me could I it. tackle that real quick, T Rock, maybe for 30 seconds, then you take the last 30 seconds? And to the evolutionist side, if you disagree with what I say and T Rock says, note it down, you'll get a chance to respond. So, I would argue that the predictions are not that specific. For example, you look to an environment like the Devonian where Tiktaalik is found, and then you predict the kind of creature like Tiktaalik that would actually fit that environment, and then you find it. It'd be like me pointing to the sky and saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up in the sky and find a bird today. Well, yeah, birds fly in that environment. That environment is, is suitable for birds. I don't think it's specific enough, especially the fact that with Tiktaalik and the Australopithecines, we see a lot of overlap. We see a lot of uh, intermingling and coexistence. And so with Tiktaalik, they actually discovered tetrapod foot tracks in Poland that predate, here's Tiktaalik right here. Here's Archaeopteryx mm -hmm. right here. Okay, they found tetrapod foot tracks that predate Tiktaalik by about 20 million years, according to the conventional time. And so that means you have uh, true tetrapods down here before you actually have Tiktaalik. And I understand the evolutionists would say, well, the transitional form doesn't have to be the direct ancestor. It's just that this is a, repre uh, a representative of what that transitional form would have looked like, but, looked like. But that's the point is now it's agnostic because that's what the creationists would mm -hmm. argue is that we have coexistence. We have intermingling between all these different kinds of, of creatures. Go ahead. So I have something to okay, say after so, T-Rock. Okay. Just so, Doc, you go um, Echoing Donnie's sentiment, the, the problem with calling Tiktaalik a prediction that specifically endorses evolution above creation, the problem is deep time does not have to be true for you to identify that an amphibian lives between a, a, a deep water environment and a land environment. Deep time does not have to be true. If you want a, a valid prediction that matters, you need to demonstrate that deep, deep time is a critical part of the prediction because that's what separates uh, creation from evolution. Tectolic oh. isn't an amphibian right. for a start. It's I not didn't a, say a, it was. That, that wasn't the point. Well, you said oh. I predicted an amphibian, and that's not the we're case. Talking plus, we're talking, we're talking excuse transitions. Excuse me, excuse me, T-Rock, T-Rock, T-Rock. Excuse me, you did say an amphibian. It's not a great big deal to predict an amphibian. It's not an amphibian. It's a fish with wrist bones right and a rudimentary lung structure that is not as mm -hmm. as um that is not a vague prediction as don is making out that's a very specific thing and they they said mm -hmm. hey it will be found in this layer and it will be found in fresh water because we know that the more basal forms that we've been seeing are from fresh water so they went and looked in the one of the very likely spots that fresh water did exist and that those organisms were and they found exactly what that was. That's not a vague prediction. That isn't a, and, oh, well, we'll find something roughly like 
this, they made a very specific prediction. Darwin made a very specific prediction in saying we'll find a bird with, Ooh, with Mark, unfused can I, can I take wing this? fingers. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Doug. It's okay. It's just I think Mark and I have uh, convergently happened upon where I was going to go with this. So with Archaeopteryx, dawn of evolutionary theory, Darwin predicted we would find a bird that looked like a dinosaur with teeth, clawed hands, and a long tail. We find Archaeopteryx years later with exactly what Darwin predicted. With Australopithecus, Darwin went further. He predicted we would find a bipedal ape in East Africa with features intermediate between humans and chimps. And he was more specific than that. I'm generalizing for the sake of time. And then lastly, with Tiktaalik, we predicted, again, gills, lungs, wrists, and the particular features it would have for the environment we predicted being basically like a fishy crocodile, a uh, ambush predator. We predicted the time, like the age of the rock it would be in, and the location so well. The first Tiktaalik was found, I think, within just a couple of weeks of them starting searching. Yeah. We predicted very specific things, and this happens all the time in evolution. These are just the most famous cases. If and evolution just, okay. and deep time don't work, how can we consistently make these predictions and have them fulfilled? Right. So quick and just to, just to say Doug. one last thing. No, no, just one last thing. Just quickly, T. I'll, I'll be real quick. Um, because just talking about said this thing about, oh, well, we see observations, we do testing. So I really want to push on this. What testing and what testable predictions have creationists made for their model? Well, I've already gone over at least one major prediction, which has to do with function function for the patterns that we see. So if we look to the genetic patterns that are homologous patterns that are nested hierarchical patterns, we would predict function there. And we have evidence for activity, but we don't really know for sure what the very specific functions are for all of that activity. So that is a future testable prediction that future observations and well, sort of what you have laboratory you experiments what you have made what you have made that has come true not sort of things into the mm -hmm. future but like we're talking about times when um the evolutionary model has predicted certain things like very very specific things creationists don't mm -hmm. seem to be doing the same if you could point out where creationists are doing the same thing i would love it and if i how, how, how many of these have been more... found well just how, a second like, what's, what's the if i may it's more well, in words. fairness, T Rock did want to talk as well. I'll just say that. Yes, yeah, so never mind. My brain. I had a question. A hey, 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 T Rock, if, if I could just real quick, because uh, Mark Reed asked a question, I just wanted to pull up a slide. So, what's fascinating about the head to head prediction on DNA function versus mostly junk or evolutionary leftovers is it's a prediction that is more and more verified or confirmed as time goes on. Because the more dna testing we do firstly your gold standard of dna testing i would argue is most likely genetic knockout tests but obviously it's unethical to knock out genes in humans and so we're always going to be very limited in our ability to determine what is and what isn't functional but over the years every every single month you're getting more and more papers dr rob carter he's been doing a two-part commentary i think he might be continuing it going over a, a slew of new 2024 papers that's discovering more more function and so this is just more and more confirming creationist predictions on dna function because if you go back 30 years mm -hmm. what we now know about the genome is completely different. So I got a I, quick question, a quick yes or no mm -hmm. question for Mark. When you asked the question, what what predictions does creation make? Were you wanting yeah. to limit the scope to only the biological world? Well, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Fair enough. That's fine. So also, if I <laughs> may, kind, real quick, kind of funny. that felt like a non sequitur. Sorry. It, it, it kind yeah. of funny, but I actually had one of my own predictions. 
Well, we're talking about sort of um, um, fossils and, sure. and sort of seeing what occurs in the record. So, yeah, sure. um, I, okay. I think sort of if if the model of separate um, created kinds, which I mean, that raises some questions alone, like like was Tectolic a separate created kind? Was was, you know, some the uh, Archaeopteryx a separate created kind? I don't know. But if we're talking about that, what predictions of creationists used with their model to come up with finding these kind of fossils? Okay, so so to answer your question, what kinds of predictions? So there's there's a variety of different types of predictions directly associated with the biological world, but um, most of what you guys have described is actually just um, pattern recognition, not um, worldview specific kind of predictions. It's pattern recognition. But I have, I actually have my own personal prediction that I made that I found out, um, a, I think a couple years after I, I said this, that it was true. And that is um, C14 in soft tissue. And so there has actually been a Korean study showing that uh, C14 is um, originating from soft tissue finds not external contamination is that a paper how do you know it wasn't from external contamination if i may ask yeah that's i mean that's a that's a good mm -hmm. question because what the study was doing was taking um a, a variety of samples from the point of the uh the fossil and basically tracing samples away from the fossil in in okay. in the ground in the in the the stone in which it was encased and so what they were doing was hey, Rock, do you have a link can you can you listen for just a second um what they were doing was plotting the concentrations of c14 from the center of the fossil out away from it and so if it's contamination it should gradually decrease c14 concentration as you approach the fossil but if it's coming no, from the fossil it should decrease moving away from it not necessarily no not not necessarily because no. if you have like something like um bacteria in the organism like gut bacteria or something like that that after it dies it starts to eat its way out um that's going to th completely throw off that that thing i don't think you can sort of um judge whether c14 is a contaminant or not by its levels around the organism i don't, I don't think that's a thing T it, it, if it were contamination i would actually expect the concentrations or ratios you measure or the ages you're getting for different parts of the fossil or around the fossil would vary quite a bit but still be yeah. within yeah. the error bars of the experiment that would naturally and be the result so of it, if, I may, if i may real quick thinking is that you have to have a pathway for contamination to get to the fossil yeah. it's kind of the whole point you have to have a pathway yeah. for this contamination and if there's a so, pathway Rock, that means the concentration be background contamination be well one at a time one at a time guys yeah sorry I brought in by enforcer T Rock, can yeah. you please tell me at least one of the authors? Can you get a link, a title, anything, please? I think last time we right did that paper like this, you I guys you were from, misreading you guys for a background I'll readings. Some, hey, I'm, you I'm guys chat for a minute, and I'll post you something, Doc. Okay. Have. So, in terms of the prediction, specifically on the fossils. I've been pointing out how environment oftentimes, and I think it's a good question for Mark, environment oftentimes dictates phenotype. Well, Creatius have been saying for years, I know Dr. Kurt Wise, he has a PhD in paleontology, if I'm not mistaken, that we should find these kinds of morphological intermediates. I hear a little bit of background noise, not sure it's who it's from. But Sorry these kinds that. of morpho oh, that, that's okay. These morphological intermediates that will be inhabiting these intermediate ecosystems like what we find with with tiktaalik as tiktaalik was so found can i provide in an a, environment a, that's suitable to how to many phenotype of them i mean that's we pretty vague can I, can I give a counter example to that sure that that environment intermediate thing so uh w one example off the top of my head is uh bacillosaurids and species of cetaceans closely related to them they're obviously fully aquatic yet they still display transitional morphologies between modern whales and uh more basal cetaceans so that what environment intermediate thing doesn't really work 
what kind of intermediate environment would exist in the ocean for some of these oceanic intermediate exactly no, what? none of them yet they still just they're fully aquatic they live in the open ocean yet they still display transitional features so that's would you point. say that's an except would you argue that's an exception to the rule or the rule no your rule is I not a rule say that's generally the rule i mean i just i just joined so i'm not sure how you're defining intermediate environment but i would i would think that uh if you have um tetrapod fish coming on land that some type of a wetlands or like a mud environment would be intermediate there's no intermediate land and water. environment there's yeah no I, intermediate I've, I've never heard this term yeah, we yeah, do. It's, it's made right. up. It's not. Well, for example, thing. Tiktaalik exists in an aquatic e ecosystem. No, no, no. Able no. To Look, go from sea to land. Donny, Donny, things are intermediate. Like they will have a change in environment, or they'll have an environment where maybe a different morphology would be a, a more advantageous. And so the 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 organism itself, like its population, becomes intermediate between two stages, like land and and water going. But it's not that the organism, it's not, sorry, it's not the environment that is intermediate. It's just right. that the organism changes and the stages in between are in the intermediate, like the Psilosaurus, which lives in open ocean, but does have morphology for um, um, real legs, isn't it, Andrew? Um, and, and sort yeah, of... Uh Residual um, hind legs, yeah. Or, well, actually, actually, yeah. pretty visible hind legs. Uh, yeah, that, okay, that so distinction b between like a land and water environment, like that kind of thing, where it's pretty cut and dry. That that's not what you typically find with these these fossils. Are you saying that Basilosaurus has vestigial hind legs or actual hind legs, like a? Uh, they're like they're vestigial in the sense creature. that they obviously can't support it on land, but they're they're still visible. The the bones are all still there. They're they're hind limbs in that sense. In, in the same way that we animal. see, in the same way that we see aquatic whales today, having no. vestigial. No, hind they're, legs? they're 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 not as reduced as modern whales. They're actual hind limbs, but they obviously couldn't function on on land as hind limbs. So in that sense, what was vestigial. their function for, though? Are you saying I'm not that sure how I like left? you're implying that vestigial means there's no function left? You seem to right. Be well, it would be agnostic. I, I would argue that this is revisionism. I, I I think you can go back far enough to where vestigial organ or structure was defined as something losing its function once oh, they discovered that. that, that I can that show you. I, I, I've got some articles from Dr. Jerry Bergman where he has quotes. I, I, I can they show define, you. What's, what's, with the, what's with the crosstalk? I'm trying to finish my point. I got three yeah, evolutionists. Let's, let, uh, let's over let people talking, finish. Okay? So I can Nobody show talk you. Donnie's talking. I can show you <laughs> articles from Dr. Jerry Bergman who's documented quotes from the evolutionary community going back, I don't know, 80 years ago, where they defined vestigial structure organ as not having a function. Then when they started discovering all these functions for these vestigial structures, then they said, well, it, it's all, it, it can also alter its function. So there seems okay, to be some and I can provide quotes from Darwin's writings and his, his contemporaries that don't use that definition of useless structure. What was Darwin? Can share my screen? Can you please share my screen? Uh, the, the, same, the same true. definition I am providing of a, a reduced or leftover structure in that sense, but not necessarily completely useless. Even if we so grant you that, a, I mean, words change their meaning. I mean, well, I, I would just argue worst case meaning. scenario. I, if that was the true definition since the beginning, I would just say it's another agnostic line of evidence. We would say, okay, it has a function, so it's there for a functional okay. reason. You guys would say, well, it's altered its function. Okay, well, so it's this is then. <laughs> this is Bacillosaurus hind limb. Okay, this yeah, is the, the actual bones of the, the hind limb of the Bacillosaurus. And this is a uh, animal that lived entirely in water just as a whale does. So um, we, we know that this limb absolutely could not support it on land and it did not go on land. Like it was a ocean bearing creature. This, this hind limb is, is tiny, atrophied, but it is there. Do they have those hind limbs or is it inferred based on a few? That's, that's it, the it skeleton. It's found with the rest of the skeleton, that's yes. The actual, yeah. And uh, modern yeah, it, whales. Are we assuming uh, that it, there's nothing else there that it did as far as the soft tissue? Because we can only see the bone. We don't well, know what was there. I, I can say, doctor, sort of I, 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 I can point out the fact that doctor. Like that. Okay, I, I can point out the fact that Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, he did confirm that they have these small hind limbs, but he argues that they were probably used 
for grasping during uh, reproduction, as many in the evolutionary community have even admitted. Okay, so why so they look like that's what I was alluding to. Why not? Some sort of sexual designed it completely differently. Well, the Basilosaurus is a very interesting whale kind of creature that looks different than any kind of whales we have today. So it's it's form. It's it's morphology is therefore slightly different. I guess its hind limbs were a it little bit larger than the one the the well. yeah, because the yeah, the one on, the one on the top. The one on the top is the Basilosaurus, just pointing that out. Because it's just very interesting what Donnie mentioned, because yeah, there's there's also these dimorphism features that we don't we don't know. Maybe it's a sexual characteristic that it uses to attract the female or the, uh, the opposite sex, and there's something with the soft tissue that we don't understand. So we can say from a skeletal perspective, we could maybe there's no purpose, but there but, but this is just part of the story. Well, see, that's oh, it, it looks like there was no purpose. I said dirt. It looks like here uh, the I didn't say they had no purpose. I was saying they have no purpose as hind limbs. For, right. For and, and, I, and I'm right. saying, right. And, and so that would be your interpretation. And, and it's interesting. Okay. But I would argue that it's it's agnostic because then we would say, okay, is, is there a function? Is it using it for something? And Philip Jandrich here, he says, it seems to me that they could only have uh, been some kind of sexual or reproductive clasper. Okay, well, you would say it's been repurposed from being hind limbs to now functioning in reproduction. We would say it's it's designed, its original function was for reproduction. So now it's okay, agnostic. So, That's so, my whole point. so we have modern animals today that have claspers, though, for that specific purpose, and they don't right. look like hind limbs. So why were they specifically designed to look like miniature hind limbs in this case? Well, we don't yeah. have anything today that looks like Basilosaurus. That would be terrifying. No, but we, we do have different. modern animals that use claspers for the purpose you just described. Right, and, and Basilosaurus. Like so are you like saying Basilosaurus did not use this structure for reproduction? No, for, for all we know, it might have, but I'm saying they don't need to look like miniature reduced hind limbs with the hind limb bones there to have that purpose as we now right. see modern animals that ha that do that sort of thing, but they don't have any hind limbs. It's just variation in design. I mean, right, it, it's yeah. a good question. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question, Andrew. But it's just variation in design. I mean, go Google how many different kinds of steering wheels. So what are. variation it's would you not? How many, how many of those Brachiosaurus hind leg specimens are, exist in the world? Uh, we have a few. Like, how, yeah, can we uh, just, yeah. not, not uh, like, it's several like of them like the from, do you think maybe there's 20 have, of them in the world? If, if I may, we have Bacillosaurus yeah. remains from all over the U.S. and cool. Africa and the Middle East. We have a, we lot, have of a lot of very interesting, it, 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 like there's 20 there the be, because there was more overall dive, like today's just a, an overall snapshot of the diversity that's existed on this planet. So when we look to the fossil record, we find a huge multitude of interesting creatures that we could classify as intermediate or mosaic, or you guys want to say transitional, that don't exist today. That's because there was overall more diversity anyway. So yeah, we see variation in design, just like we see variation in the design world in terms of uh, man-made engineering systems. And we have claspers here in Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus is, is unique in the sense that we don't have any Basilosaurus today. And so it seems to have had a variation in the structure that is involved in reproduction. I don't see, I, I see how it's agnostic as in it is what you'd expect, but since it has a function and we predict function, then we can also explain the data. Well, so it's, well, it's well since you mentioned variation there, that's that's one of the points I was I was trying to make earlier. Is that okay? You're saying we would the in order to say my model explains the variations we see, you need to specify which variations you would not expect to see in this case. So I'm oh, asking you, what oh. variations here would you not expect under common design? That's a two. In a that's world? It's too difficult of a question because it would be like me too looking difficult. at, the, well, we have millions of different designs across many manufacturing companies in terms of vehicles that are made, and they each 
have variation in in the way their steering wheels are designed or the tires the rims the engines are oftentimes you can find vehicles with engines in the middle so am i going to be able to point to a, a certain vehicle that I haven't analyzed or examined and predict, well, the variation of the steering wheel in, in this vehicle is gonna look like this. It's just variation in design. I can't make mm -hmm. any real specific predictions on that. Well, well sure, but you can hear from the people the question, though, we haven't had a are chance to talk yet. Like Grayson, uh, I would like to hear. Yeah, so my Sorry. biggest question is, you say that there are these like supposed intermediate environments, which is, not found in any of the actual literature, but you're saying that it's these intermediate environments that create these fossils that have intermediate features. But my big question for you is, why is it that we only find these fossils with intermediate features between two groups that are genetically similar? Well, it's the same. Well, I, I'm not expecting to find some crocodile, you, a, a creature that looks like an ape, but also a fish as well. Like why not? Only, well, it, it wouldn't fit the design model in terms of God creating creatures that can reproduce, pass on their genes. So if he never created a creature that Wait, looks wait, wait, like... Donnie. But how does there being intermediates at all, like predictable intermediates, you're saying that the creation model can accommodate for these and predict because of some intermediate environments. How does that fit the creation model when it's only between two groups that are genetically similar? Well, here's the thing, though, and it's a good question. I appreciate it. Your your fishapod, Tiktaalik. Yeah, it, it has features or traits similar to fish and amphibians, but not fish and birds or fish and an ape. Well, in the same way, in, in the design world, in the design world, we have a crossover SUV. It's not like it's well, we got this SUV with a airplane wings coming out of it. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, whatever, go ahead. Just go forward one slide, please. Yep. There right, you go. Exactly. There you go. There you go. Right. and a boat, two distantly related vehicles with an intermediate, because in design, you can have intermediates between distantly related things. But in evolution and in the real world with the fossils, we actually find you don't find that. Is Tiktaalik not a tetrapod? <laughs> Or I mean, is, is it, it is, an, it is an not a tetrapod. It no, is. Or I mean, a is a sarcopterygian fish, meaning it a lobe fin fish like a coelacanth right. or a lungfish, and it has intermediate features between more basal sarcopterygians like a coelacanth and something like an amphibian, which not only was predicted by Neil Shubin and colleagues. That has been what the evidence has pointed to for decades. All right, that... amphibians. Okay, well, I just looked it up. Tetrapods. Wait, wait. Let, let me let me respond. Tetrapods include all extant and extinct amphibians and amniotes. Yes. Tiktaalik is a circle. Oh, no, wait, wait. I, I think Mark, you just said no. When I said amphibians or tetrapods, you said no, or were you saying no to something else? No, you said it's tiktaalik and uh, a tetrapod. Tiktaalik. Yep. You said tiktaalik is. Well, a, but a but tetrapod then I corrected myself real no. quick and said I mean amphibians, and then you stood. So you must well, have said no. No, no. I just said no. I just said no, and then you said well, you know, and then corrected yourself. Don't. And don't then you changed of... your tune. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Hey, hey, hey. hey, 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 hey Okay, so the hey, point I'm trying to make here is I feel, like, I feel like I'm being used here to make okay, some so, sort of... Hold on. No, you corrected yourself. Something. That's fine, Donnie. I just, I said no when you said it, you know, and then you corrected. That's fine. It's not a problem. Okay, that's fine. It's good. Let's move... Because you said no after I said amphibian, so I thought you were saying no to amphibians, but you're saying to a tiktaalik. So that's good. We're all good. Well, on, it takes people time to, to react to things. Hey, uh, Dr. Dino, I was trying to ask you something earlier. In regards to the tiktaalik situation where, you know, they predicted it and they found it, how many can you can you quantify like how many times that has happened you know in the last hundred years? Doc, like, has you hey, hey, before, I, I really want to respond to Grayson's I point don't here. Don't think Tiktaalik's so, uh, an amphibian okay. either. I would also just direct you to watch my video where I documented several yeah. like, <laughs> over a dozen of these examples of predicting traditionals and finding right. them. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Donnie yes. still wanted to respond to you, Grayson. Yeah, I just want to address the question. Yeah. So Tiktaalik is it blends the features of what fish and amphibians, right? So no, here, fish and no, right, it, it, a very it blends specific the features, fish Johnny, with, it with blends the features of lobed finned fishes and tetrapods. Right. Yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, uh, not amphibians. It's fish. not an amphibian. So, but right here with your amphicar, 
it is a, a car built for the land going from A to B, just a typical sedan, and then also a, a boat, something that belongs in, in the sea or the ocean, okay? And with Tiktaalik, same thing, something that's on the land, and then also something that's built or designed for the water, for the sea, the ocean. So that's what we see with this Amphicar. But we don't see like a sedan and then somebody just slapped on a couple of airplane wings. And sure, okay. humans can do that. Humans can get very We creative. can do that. That's the point, Donnie. And look. Obviously, really because we can go in and just make something up, exactly. but it's probably not going to last very long. Exactly. That's the entire well, it's point. not look, exactly, because I've never picture, said that it's just this black and now, white. With that picture, okay. First of all, lobe finned fishes and tetrapods are two adjacent groups. Okay, they're they're genetically similar. Well, so are SUVs and vans. They're they're adjacent. If you go exactly. to any car wait, lot, no, you're gonna have vans hold, on one side. Hold on, Donnie. You're hold on. Have SUVs right next to it. Hold on, very... Donnie. Are boats an adjacent group to sedans? I wouldn't say they are. No. And yet, in your slide, in the next slide here. There is an intermediate between a sedan and a boat because right. when when things are designed, when these intermediates are designed, you can make an intermediate between any two groups. Like you said, you could design an airplane sedan or an airplane truck or an airplane SUV when you're designing these things. Right, but you could have a four wheel any intermediate. Right, but but you could have a four wheeled sedan kind of vehicle that's designed pretty close to what a boat is, but not quite as a boat. And then you can mix in and get a, a vehicle like this amphicar because an amphibian does walk on land. It is okay, a tetrapod. You, you realize that there's also boat airplanes. There's a there's, boat there's airplane. Hybrids that are there's designed bunch. between any yeah. two. Right. Humans can design some pretty wild things, but guess what? People aren't buying those. Usually they go extinct. Like for no, example, you can't buy No, they're used to go. Listen, you can't go to your local car lot and buy an amphicar. You can't Same buy a plane. bond bug today. The point can, is, they don't last, they don't work, about? people don't want them. But something like a crossover SUV, people like, people want, it's functional, it's a big seller. And what do we have? A van and an SUV that are, what's the word you used? Adjacent. And we've got a crossover well, SUV. And guess what? That Donnie, works. Will you just people acknowledge like the point that when you're when these things are designed, you can design hybrids between two non adjacent I get we can well, get well, I, I'd like to say I something because I haven't I said anything for a while. Please. Um so you're, you're you're completely ducking away from seaplanes. They're a basically a plane with pontoons on the bottom that can be used as a boat because they can just wind the propeller and, and move through the water and you can fly them. They're literally seaplanes. Thank you, Donnie. That's great. I mean, yeah. I, I would say that, that supports my model. Yeah, we can find some very interesting mosaics. Yeah. No, we can design no. some very interesting. Donnie, please. Transition are extremely exaggerated. Donnie, will you acknowledge that when these things are designed, you can design intermediates between two non-adjacent groups? Do you acknowledge that? I do acknowledge that. But here's the thing: I've never said that it's this perfect black or white dichotomy. We find some vehicles like the crossover smart, SUV yeah. that nicely fits what we would expect based on finding something like Tiktaalik. But yeah, if okay. we find this boat that's so mixed with an airplane, yeah, that, that's that's very creative. That's the so creativity of man's mind. <laughs> if you acknowledge that you can design things that are have intermediate qualities between two non-adjacent groups, show us because you claim that life is designed. So show us the fossils that show intermediates between two non-adjacent groups. But here's Grayson, the thing. can you, you define adjacent? Find just based on the basics of biology, of reproduction, of gene flow. Okay, why, why would we expect something? Because God would have had to originally create something like what we're looking at, where you've got... How some, do you know that? Some a fish that has wings on it. God chose well, not to claim. How right? do you know that, Donnie? Listen, we only know what we know. We have the biological world. We have the fossil record. And we don't find anything like a fish that has wings on it like a bird. Exactly. Yeah, Despite the fact that mm -hmm. human designs mix and match features all the time. But the, the, my whole point is I'm not looking for something so, like we see on screen as a comparison in terms of the patterns. What I'm looking at is, okay, we got something did, like technology. Didn't you literally we say we, we don't have plane boats? I understand the evolutionary explanation that you're looking and I watched Grayson's video several times. It was well done. And he's picking two 
uh, species that you would argue are closely related, like humans and non-human primates. So you find astralopithecines. You're not looking for something between humans and fish, okay? Or bear dog. That's something between Ursidae and Canid, okay? So I went in looking for intermediate vehicles that match that same pattern. Yeah, we're going to find other vehicles that don't match it because humans can do whatever they want. I can go and build something exactly. crazy today. Here's I can go the thing. Here's my the thing. Board exactly. on my I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. Yeah, so we do find fish with, with wings, basically. They're called flying fish. And okay. But the, well, the whole go. point is, well, the whole point is, is that their morphology is based upon, like, um, um, their, their fins aren't like wings, right? Like, so you have seabirds like cormorants and terns and things like that, the, the diving birds that have wings. Um, their, their wings aren't wings like a diving bird. They're, they're wings as in their they're fins, gliding. they're modified fins. They, they glide, right? like they, flying squirrels. They mm -hmm. glide, right? Yeah. So these modifications are showing that they weren't just designed it's adapted from what already exists, just as a cormorant's wings that can be tucked up so it can dive really deep are modified by what already exists. And that supports evolution. It doesn't support common design because if God wanted to design a fish that could fly, it would use wings. And, and just to add on to that real quick, because specifically what you're talking about here, Mark, is... They, they adapted stru pre-existing structures that were present in their immediate common ancestors, whereas what Grayson was pointing out here, human designers are adapting structures from completely different design manufacturers and repurposing right. them from there, They're mixing and matching them. They're, They're completely and different patterns there. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And and when you talk and, about those hind legs that are used for sexual uh, for for copulation, that's what we're talking about with this definition of vestigial is that they're changing the function from its previous function. So I wanna, it's, it's really may, I, may I touch on a couple things? There's been a couple things I've been wanting to talk about for a bit now. Yeah, me too. Well, you you start. Um, Doc. Go ahead. Okay. So first, I want to address. Uh, what T Rock said a business week ago about a presentation about carbon 14 being found in dinosaur bones. I just want to say, T Rock, I read through the lab results that that guy was basing his presentation on. It is contamination. Some of the bones he had tested, they were literally charred, it had been in a fire, they were contaminated. Sorry, it's not evidence for a young Earth. In fact, most of the dates that they even got are between, or sorry, they're either 20 to 50,000 years old, or they're like 200 years old. And you can't really do radiometric dating, or sorry, you can't really do carbon dating on stuff that's that young because of the Industrial Revolution. Real so quick. either way... His results don't work. Real quick, Doc, you do realize that in the secular version of the story, dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor impact with a lot of ash and stuff like that falling out, right? Is that a yeah, it has question? nothing to do with this. Is that a serious a complete question? Non -sequitur. The, the I'm point sure being, Doc, Doc knows about that. Uh, yeah, me too. Yes. That's the point. Me, oh, so wait, you know that Doc knows about that, so you're just being intentionally condescending? No, get to no. the point. The, the the point is, where did the char come from? What the was char? the source of the, what? Yeah, was the was, was it fire? contamination okay. after the fact, or do you think that was there already in the specimen? So, let let me answer that. So, T Rock, what happened when the dinosaurs were obliterated? Was an asteroid the size of Mount Everest blasted into Mexico? That did send a lot of ash up into the stratosphere, laced with a ton of iridium. That's why there is a layer of iridium in rocks almost exactly 66 million years old, everywhere on Earth that they're preserved. Literally everywhere. Where we have dinosaurs below, mammals above, and we don't see much mismatch. Yeah, it made a crater 12 miles deep. On the bone, char refers to 
like charcoal, the direct after effects of a fire, not what we would see in a not what we would see in a fossil. I'm so, sorry. This so you're you're kind of making my point for me. You're 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 saying that neither meteors nor volcanoes can produce any kind of burned material. Yeah, but so can fire. No, they can. It's just that this was in a fire. Like, this bone was burned. And that's the one that's 200 years old. It made a um, crater 120 miles wide. I just like pointing that out when, whenever this is caught up. Yeah, it's sorry. Hey, Rock. You I, 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 no, I think it's hilarious that you're, you're basically saying this. Point. That you guys know got a where bit this of fire came this from, and yet nothing. you have no study whatsoever to show. Is there any way you know where the fire from the study. Who, who dug it up and burned it 200,000 years ago? And and also, did you. 200,000 years ago, it's 200 years ago. Doc, did you know no, that there was more than one type of dinosaur in that study? You do yes, know and they grew occur. between 200, 2,000, 25,000, and 50,000 years old. Yeah, so probably contaminated. The bones in the study are too old to fit in your young Earth, even if this was accurate, and it's um, not. That's a, that's a complete red herring, because the... the, the no, creationist, the creationist that is the creationist you don't understand. Are... The creationist position is that those are not ages at all, Doc. They the, the point is is that C fourteen cannot exist for in excess of a million years. Sorry, it can't, no. It can't exist Rock, in here's your source. That's this, a red herring. This is your Rock, source. Hey, this is your source here. And sorry, I was wrong. The charred bone is twenty five thousand years old. This is your source. They calculated the age. You haven't looked up your source, have you? Um, because you sent me a link to the guy's presentation on YouTube. This it's, is his actual results. This is what you share to prove your point. Those, do you not see that column that says PMC? You keep saying age, but they're giving an age equivalent, but they're it's called percent modern, modern carbon for a reason. Hey, Rock, it literally says radiocarbon C13 corrected age. That's where the mouse point. cursor is. That's, That's literally what point. it says. There, there is a term called that. carbon age. There is a term called carbon age. The whole, the whole point is that it is not an actual age. It's a carbon age. It's called that for a reason because it's not an age. And they do not I need you to age. understand this. This I is the this is the, the independent between. variable. This is the percentage of modern carbon. That's how you get this number. It's a simple equation. You um, don't know doc, what you're talking about on this. It's called a carbon age for a reason. They call it a carbon age because they are acknowledging it's not an age. What? It's, what it's are not you a simple point. What talking about, T-Rock? I don't there think is, he knows. <laughs> when, yeah, when do you, like, T-Rock... The age is given there. Like you're you're putting across this as to completely Sorry. like put the age is shown in the paper. The radiocarbon the age after correcting for age. modern carbon is what Doc is saying. Mm -hmm. It's a corrected age. And what so I'm saying is if account. there's a specific terminology it's called actually, carbon age that tells yeah. you they don't think it's the age. Iraq, that's exactly what it means. It means that the no. that's the age of the specimen. No, no, there is a difference between an age and a carbon age. And you don't Iraq, you're it. talking to a paleontologist and what are you, right. Grayson? Are you a geochemist or a biochemist? I have a degree in biochemistry. I don't know which one. Biochem and organic chemistry. Yeah. Or this is what this means, T Rock. That's what it means to an evolutionist. Ah, oh, no, that's not me. Do you not understand that they, the, the, they deliberately stop? Do you, do you wait, not wait, understand that they basically deliberately saying, you're basically saying, you're basically saying, your faith hey, in a means God. This, it means this thing to scientists, but I'm going to take my own meaning with blackjack no, and hookers. No, I mean, Mark, come on. Read some literature. They distinguish between age and carbon age. It's two different Rock. things. I have a degree in this stuff. 
Okay, no, I don't. really Nephilim you Free wants to join. I about. really want I really want to see this happen. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna jump out so he can go in. Because this well, is, I think this uh, is gonna be hilarious. But I, I, I want us to listen, I'll, I'll, I'll have a degree in this. I'll, I'll have it go for another 10 minutes or so, but we are at the four and a half hour mark and I'm getting pretty tired. Yeah. But I did want to ask, yeah. And my wife wants to hang out a little bit before she goes to bed. So, you know, we got to make, we got to make the wives happy. So I no, wanted no, to ask you guys to stay for another five hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's tempting. It's tempting, but man, yeah, it's been fun. I was curious as to Grayson, since he's the TikTok, TikTokologist. Is that what it is? You got a PhD in TikTok? No. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on what this article is saying? Was it you that brought up the uh, the, the bones of the wrist in, in TikTok in the hand, the wrist and I finger like bone? Me. I believe that was me. But I've mentioned the wrist bones and the neck bones before in TikTok, yeah. So, and I'm agnostic on this. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts of what this article is saying about how the fins of lobe fin fish have a lot of variation in their bone structures and Tiktaalik's bone structure is not surprising or unusual in that it could uh, be argued that the bones of a modern lobe fin look more like a wrist with fingers than Tiktaalik's. And here's the different wrist and finger bones. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Speak to it. How does it look more like a wrist than the modern ones? No, no, like the, the coelacanth is the only one there that's modern, right? All the other ones are extinct. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I don't understand how the modern one is supposed to look more like a, a wrist. And where is this source, by the way? What is this paper? It's uh, back to... It's a, it's a creationist source, but that's why I'm curious. So, you can Don, find can you here. back up to the image real quick? Chris Roop did a big study on TikTok, and I'm just curious as to yeah. it, maybe you can read this, Grayson, and see where you oh, disagree. Donnie, oh, could you go to the comparison image again, please? Yeah. Okay, let me walk you through this. So we have TikTok over there. TikTok has what is analogous to the humerus, radius, and ulna, the the bones of your wrist, and then your fingers. That's what TikTok has. The coelacanth. If you know the anatomy, it has an extra bone, which is like your shoulder socket, mm -hmm. then your humerus, then your radius and ulna, then your fingers. And then attached to that shoulder is another little arm. It's, it's not more similar. It has an extra arm there if you want to talk if you want to talk homologous features. Okay, so you would challenge this this sentence here. Its morphology is entirely consistent with that of modern lobe fins. You wouldn't agree with that then, based on what you just said? No, its morphology is entirely consistent. I'm just saying the modern coelacanth isn't... It isn't more analogous to, let's say, a human limb than Tiktaalix is, if you read the anatomy. So could it just be natural variation within lobe fin fish then? Not necessarily transitional? No, because, okay, not exactly. Tiktaalik has a wrist joint, a developed wrist joint. That's not present in the coelacanth. I'm also, I'm like looking at skeletons of coelacanth right now, and they do not look like that image that is presented in that paper. Like the actual coelacanth lobe fins the the anatomy looks pretty different than what that that cartoon in the paper are you, are is you showing. looking at modern or or um fossil coelacanth yeah latimeria or yeah both yeah. i mean I'm, I'm looking at a modern one um and it just doesn't look like that at all i mean i maybe i could share my screen or whatever yeah you want to share it? yeah let me just do that real quick uh share screen Oh, also, a real quick, Donnie, I'm going to set up an after show on my channel. I'll send you the link. Okay. So that's what I'm seeing. Um, and it's like multiple, too. It's not just this one picture. Like if I zoom out. Um, oh, yeah. Wait, which bone did he pick? Like, and here's one that's in a museum. Like, <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I'm not sure what the image is supposed to be showing, but I can't find any. Like, here's a fossil. It just doesn't look uh, like the, the picture. It's not tight. We'll put him on trial. Put him on trial. 
But Donnie, can you pull up the original image again of the comparison? I want to see if I can find what fish he's looking at. That did not look right. You're going on trial. You're going up against Mark, Grayson, Doc. I mean, honestly, I think Gutsuck Gibbon did a fabulous job of putting Roop on trial. He's not very good at this. I, I told Chris that he should respond to Erica's series. I do my best. <laughs> oh, that'd respond. be hilarious. So, sorry, I'm not trying to be condescending. My brain is. Oh, I agree that creation is yeah. gender. That is not point. a silicanth. What is that? Well, it says silicanth uh, or similar modern lobe fin. So maybe he's just. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's that's see. Figure D. No. Well, it, it, says, it says figure D here are the bones of lobe finned fish and show a natural variation, is his argument. Is it the tail fin or something? I, I don't even know where that came from. Hold on, let me do a Google image search. Let's find out. He says it is hard to imagine how one looks any more finger like or wrist like than the other. I'm also well, looking I, at I found a fossil. I mean, okay, here's another. Uh... <laughs> okay, let me present my screen one more time here. Um, here's a comparison of some other fish. I mean, they don't look like what was presented. This is like a Canthostega. So this is similar to a Tiktaalik, but like this is a long fish. This is a lobe finned modern fish. It looks very, very different. So I don't know what where Roop was getting that image from. Honestly, whatever that is, it looks more similar to Sauropterus than it does any kind of coelacanth I can find. Well, what are your thoughts uh, on that? As we start to wrap things up and allow people to transition, hey, no pun intended, over I to think you might have labeled it. Unless I can find <laughs> the actual image. I, I not I find that's it right. search anywhere. Neff, what are your thoughts on Tiktaalik? And what's been said so far. Bro. Hey, am I in there? It doesn't look like I am. Am I in? Yep. You're here. Oh, oh okay. Oh, well, I love this subject of fish to land dwelling thing. I've written an extensive article on it. There are massive problems with this idea. The snout bones, roofing bones of these creatures that they put in this lineage, it doesn't work. It's a fish tail, that's for sure. What? You can't, the genetic pathways to create these kinds of up and down increase and decrease in complexity and the number of roof, uh, roof and snout bones on those creatures, it makes a preposterous story. It's like believing a bicycle became a Mercedes Benz, then went back to a motorcycle, then became a Dodge truck, then went back to a bicycle, and then became a Mercedes again. It doesn't work. Okay, there's lots of big problems with the fish to land dwelling thing. And Acantha Sega. It, that's a that's a giant uh, salamander. That's all that thing is. They picked a creature, a, a, a um, giant salamander fossil out of the uh, ground. Not a canthostega, but um, yeah, a canthostega. That's not. It, look at the anatomy of it, and then look at a photograph of a giant Chinese salamander. That's what it, it is. Looks like an amphibian. Yes. How many adult salamanders do you know that have internal gills? Just out of curiosity. Also, Donnie, there is the link to the stream yards. Okay. Thanks. Um, I I set it to start at twelve fifteen, so that gives you they an do. out. <laughs> they have they have them. Maybe you're not aware. <laughs> what? Uh, how how do you have similar? Any, do you have any? Uh, can I get a citation on that sort of you know this problem with the the upper palate and and um, sure. sort of okay. mouth bones and stuff? Like something oh, saying, hey, roofing bones and the number roofing and arrangement bones. of roofing and snout bones in these creatures that they put up as a lineage goes from fewer to many, many more to fewer to many, many more to fewer to many, many more. That's a preposterous story. Why? But what's the problem? Why? Because the genetic pathway to produce the bones is, is what creates it. Okay. There's nothing imaginable in natural selection which would cause a creature to develop, to suddenly develop over a period of, let's say, one million, two, three million years at most. Did you know that evolutionists believe that the whole transition between fish to land dwelling creatures they've been saying for uh, 60 years took place in four and a half million years? 
Now, you take four it's and a half so, million years and try to, to, to come up with a scenario with, with natural selection, which is going to take a creature and create time and a half as many bones in its skull. That's just not true. And then fewer, hey, and then twice so, as many, and then fewer, and then more again, so and then fewer. So, Neff, Neff, mm -hmm. so the amount of bones in your skull is actually a highly variable trait. Humans have variable numbers of bones in their you skull. You realize the gravity the of the problem. Do you know how many? No, okay, Neff, 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 you let's Yeah. It, hap it happens a lot in many organisms, again, including humans, and especially in fish, because fish have a lot of bones in the skin, and those change all the time. They can change between generations. Also, Neff, I just want to say that uh, Acanthostega does have did have internal gills and Chinese yeah. salamanders, which you said it was like, do not. There's a lot of other skeletal differences. Okay, there's much, much to be said about this subject. You don't realize the gravity of the problem. We're not talking about one or two little bones somehow, uh, you know, a, a genetic variety that produces a bone. We're talking about gross difference in anatomy. I'm not talking about an increase of three or four bones. I'm talking about 50% as many bones all of a sudden appearing. And then going away again, and then coming back Fine even, all even of a more, sudden. and going and and well, it, what you think is sudden is what two hundred fifty thousand. No, no I, I want I want to know what years? you Maybe think less. is sudden. What do you he mean? Just said, you said, just said in the genetic and, and, years. and the evolutionist timeline, a hundred thousand years is a drop in the bucket. That's so, nothing. so Neff. If the but bones now, in the skull you can to to change from yeah, yeah, generation let, to generation... Let, let Doc speak. He's not interrupting you. Yeah, Doc, go ahead. Speak. Go ahead, Doc. So, Neff, if the bones in a skull can change from generation to generation, and, I don't know, let's say your average amphibian has a generation time of, let's be generous, 10 years? How many generations can you have in 50,000 years? <laughs> the, the problem is more than that. Can you imagine, tell us what is a logical scenario by which natural selection of a creatures that live in the same kind of environment now, they are in the same kind of environment. What in the world possible natural uh, selective pressures would exist to cause the bones in the skull of an animal to increase by 40% and then decrease so, again when they live so in the same question. environment? There has to be an environmental pressure that would cause a, ra a radical increase and then decrease and then increase and decrease and increase so, again in the number of roofing yeah. and snouting bones. What logic would answer your question? Let finish could there be? your question, dude. Just to answer your question, first off, the answer was 500. That's 500 generations minimum. Second, they can have a lot of factors that influence the joints in the skull and how many individual bones you have. The more individual bones you have, the greater amount of flexibility you have, which can help you get more food or fit into smaller spaces. It can even make breathing easier. A lot of things can happen when you change the number of bones in the skull. On the other hand, if you want more protection, Reduce the number or thicken the ones you have. It's pretty easy to explain the pressures. Mm, uh, but the creatures, here's the problem. They live in the same environment. That's the thing. They both live in an aquatic environment. There is no common sense that, to believe that the number of roofing and snouting bones somehow needs to change so that the flexion of the skull increases and then decreases I mean, again. So, so here's so the problem. If Within we're talking this, about tectology... Please, let me, let me finish this one thought. This is really critical. All right. In the same environment, something. in the environment in which they increased and then decreased and increased again, and, and they did this more than once, mm -hmm. twice they would have to have at least... The in selective pressures are the same. They still live in an aquatic environment. You're telling us that the selective pressure is the ability for the bone, the skull to flex so that it can eat larger prey. Okay, sounds logical. Can but be. then they decreased, okay, and then increase mm -hmm. again and decreases and then increase again in the same environment. There's nothing okay, in sure. Neff, so, Neff, so, Neff, Neff. I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. Yeah. I've been very quiet. So Neff, like you've sure. got to, like you're sort of straw manning evolution because the environment yeah. is always changing and selective pressures are always changing. In most areas, even savannah and stuff and, and, and whatever environment that you're talking about, you will have competitor species that are also changing in order to get some sort of advantage. I know you don't believe in evolution. Let's, let's say they're adapting. 
right? So if one fish, and, and great, uh, uh, sorry, Doc explained this really well, if one sort of thickens its armor, they might have an advantage. So another one might, they might have smaller bones so they can fit into crevices to hide. So there is always selective pressure provided by competitive species. So the whole idea that because an environment is always wetlands or always this environment, that there aren't selective pressures, I'm really sorry, Neff, that's just wrong. You didn't answer a thing. You're just telling us in the same environment, selective pressure is bouncing up and down. That just well, doesn't make it. sense yeah. because the environment is the I thing that it. creates the selective pressure. And moreover, no. the, another problem, great problem no, real is quick, real quick. the genetic, Can I answer it? The, the genetic pathway. Do you agree? Oh, please. Yes. The genetic I, I pathway. Real to quick. This. One sentence. Hold on. We, we, we don't know of any genetic pathway to the creation of new bones. Nobody okay, Neff, who knows of such a thing. Before Nobody. you start bringing I'm sorry, up new bones, we do, but Neff. sorry, Grayson, you first, but we do. Before, no, Neff, but we before don't. you start bringing up new points, let's just address what has been stated. You should agree that there are multiple niches in the same environment. And if an organism goes from one niche to another niche in the same environment, that will be different selective pressures. These creatures have similar anatomy, they have similar diet. You're telling me that selective pressure changes radically when they live in the same environment and have the same kind of diet. How These do you know they have the same diet? I mean, they're both aquatic. What are they going to eat? Things that swim oh, around oh, in the water. All, all okay, aquatic things aquatic, have the same yeah. diet? Yeah. No, it's just an imaginative story you're giving Oh, no, about. no, Neff, please answer the, this. The do environment all aquatic doesn't organisms have the same diet? That, that raises a Our whole other problem because now they're eating of, themselves. At the same time, so some how are they evolving fast enough and eating themselves? Listen, they yeah, all they're, like they're, McDonald's. They're, they're they love Arby's. Arby's. I, trying to undermine the, the, the brevity of the situation. With I, I'm, I'm just curious as, as to the thoughts from the evolution side, Mark and uh, Grace. I appreciate your points. So, basically, and if you disagree with this, just tell me why. If environments are always changing, based on what I've been hearing, and environment dictates phenotype, and organisms we would all agree also change and adapt. Why can't we have creatures like Tiktaalik that are simply a product of their environment and not ne necessarily transitional? Well, why not both? the organisms, I mean, you can have both. So you have a, a sort of stabilizing selection where um, like sharks, for instance, they're stabilized because they're very, very well adapted to their environment. So as time progresses, you will get this stabilizing selection where something will be more and more better adapted. So something like a tectolic may find a niche in order to, like, for instance, they may be able to escape the, the very, very selective pressured um, fish in the water by having an ability to walk upon land. And that is the selection pressure. Like this is, I answered your question, Nephilim. I answered it. It's basically other organisms provide selective pressures. This is still considered part of the environment that the creature is in. So the, the environment is changing. It Excuse is. me. What you're trying to tell us is the diet I'm sorry, of the rescue creature. You? You're trying to oh, tell no, us that the sudden... creatures stopped eating small animals and, and then went for the big ones, then went to the small ones again, then to the big ones. Why it, not? It, it, it doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense, Neff? Right, because yeah, it's it always a just a story. Fish today. Again, this deciding factor is the environment and the genetic pathway. Firstly, yeah. we don't know the genetic pathway to the, to the increase in, in, in number of bones and arrangement of bones. I'll, I can cite for you an article from paleos.com, which criticizes uh, the reconstruction of ichthyostega by Per Alberg, University of Uppsala paleontologist. They, they, so they, this is what they said about his ideas that ich, uh, the ichthyostega gained bones from fins in this fish thing. They said it's like a, ra a, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat because we don't know of any now this these articles are written by paleontologists sorry we we don't okay. know of any what we, we don't know of of a mechanism which causes a bone to split to become two bones that's what they had to be to do the bone okay that's just blatantly gets false a process no they the bone gets a process where no, the bone okay. begins to diverge i'm telling you what evolutionist scientists say no, you're the not. bone begins Nephilim, gets, i am one of those people so, so let me finish my sentence please 
the the bone gets a, gets a process in it. It's called a bone process, and that process begins to split the bone, and it develops over time, and you get two different bones. Now you have another bone. That's what the evolutionists believe would have had to have happened to create. So wait, wait, bones, wait, wait, right? wait, wait. Nephilim.com you... says that's like a rat Neph... pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Neph, you've been gone for a while. You just said well, we didn't have an explanation. That is your explanation, and it's not fantasy. We can see this happening in living organisms. If, if we, see we know that how happening. bones. Now, Neff, you wanted to finish. Let me finish. We know how bones develop. There is a bunch of. There are several different ways, but let's take the bones in your skull as an example because we were talking about that earlier. The bones in your skull mostly form from plates of cartilage. Now, those plates of cartilage can be split up into smaller pieces or fused into bigger pieces, depending on the expression of a couple different genes. Those can happen, again, from generation to generation, resulting in more or less bones. If the change in bone number or shape confers an advantage, it will be selected for in the population. I'll also so I know that's a, that's a story. Really quick, more. Neff, before, you jump in, before you jump in, Neff, really quick, I just want to point out that there are species, and within species, that you would agree, like, new bones have been the result of mutations. There are humans that have more than 206 bones. There are humans that have more vertebrae than normal. There are, like, domestic pigs have more vertebrae than wild pigs. So you even agree, in your own model, new bones can be the result of mutation. Okay, so you're, you're confusing that subject. That would have to explain five minutes, the error that you just made. But let me just cite for you. I'm just going to quote for you. <laughs> Paleos.com on this matter of the El Elgenopterans femur are coming into being by a bone process. And they state, and I'm quoting them from my own article, quote, several parts of Per Albert's paper have a Cuvier-like magical quality to them, in particular his reconstruction almost an entirely pelvic girdle out of a little nubbin, a broken bone, which is like watching a magician pull a living tetris donsel out of a hat. One is tempted to applaud and gasp, even when he explains very clearly just how this trick is done. It is an incredible performance, particularly since Zoological uh, Journal of the Linnaean Society doesn't permit the use of bikini-clad assistants, deceptive lighting, and similar distractions. The section of the femur is almost as good. How However, there is a limit to what human reason can do with badly abraded example of the middle third of a single femur. And that's a quote directly from them. They, they are scathing. They, this is a scathing, your, scathing. Your citation for what you've claimed before. This I can is a, notice no link this, in private chat. This, Could you link that one as well, please? Like this, right now this so is we a can have a look at it. This is a scathing criticism of Per Albert claiming that a new bones arise in the pelvis of these creatures by bone processes. It's an absurdity. So, so we don't know. A so thing. Nephilim free. What you're calling an absurdity is apparently a growing condition in a lot of young adults no, around the world. You're what you're looking you're at right here, things, is sir. Nephilim free. What you're looking at is a spur of bone at the back of the skull that appears to be caused by changes in how the muscles attach to the skull because a lot of people are down staring at their phones, or at least that's what this article says. This is a change in a bone occurring within a generation or two. And this and I just want to point out, I just want to point out, I just want to point out that Nephilim isn't linking and, anything. Link and, and, what and, you've got there, Nephilim. And, link and, it right now, or and, else and, I'm just going to have to call you out and say that you're full of it because you're not uh, linking anything. Yeah. So what, what you're confusing yeah, is link it. a deformity, now, it. which has not become fixed in the genome no, and become part of the species. You're talking not about yet. genetic deform. Please let me finish. You're talking about genetic deformities which or, the organism always reverts to wild type. This is a process, what you're claiming is new bones arise by a new genetic pathway, and then the bone becomes fixed in part of the creature. That's not what we observe. We observe the organism reverts to wild type because deformities don't get passed on. What? They, they don't become a part genetic. of the genome. They don't become a part of the genome. Deformities are abnormal. Natural selection removes them. Genetic recombination removes it. It's gone. Okay, you don't get the deformities your child has. 
your, your children won't have a deformity. They don't give it to their kids and their grandkids don't give it to their great, great grandkids. It doesn't happen. That's evolutionist nonsense. What we don't have <laughs> is, is deformities <laughs> becoming fixed in the genome and becoming part of the anatomy. You That's are the so thing. silly. And, and, and that is what paleos.com is, 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 is criticizing. Oh no, paleos.com. Oh no. I don't even know what this site is. What, Can you what, link? what are you saying? Like, link it, Neff. Like, you must have the link okay. in front of you so to be I referring have... to this thing. So, link it. Well, I, I, I can try to, okay, but that, that takes me a minute. You can try to, to link copy. something. Sir, are you please, so three, just, you click the listen. link at the top of the page, hit okay, Control C, click chat with everyone in the uh, studio, and press Control V. Uh, it's okay, not so listen, listen for a second, please. Just for a second, stop you gang banging. Okay? We've listened to you uh, for just, a long just time. Just listen to now. me for a second without talking over no, me. No, it's okay? not going to be a second. Can one of you elect a leader from the atheist camp to talk at one time? Just one of you elect one person to talk from the atheist camp and interrupt Neff. All of you Actually, guys, let me just oh, jump oh, yeah, in. Because, three or four of you at once. Because I, I just want to jump in because Doc is having an after show anyways. We've been going for five hours. I got to wrap things up. I'm pretty tired. We got another long show tomorrow as well. So this has been fun. Some people in the chat said all-star panel cast. It's been fun. We've had a good group and mix of uh, creatious and evolutionists. So everybody, if anybody wants to get something in there, final word, final thought, say it all at the same time if you want to, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for being here, guys. Sure, Next I can time. go last. Okay, well, as we've seen, the the analogy with cars and vehicles and hybrids does not work because it's not similar to what we see in the fossil record. These are two distinctly different patterns. One is the result of design, the other one is clearly different than the pattern that's the result of design. In terms of what Neff is saying, it sounds like he literally just said that just a genetic that deformity way. does not get passed on to your offspring, which anyone listening should recognize immediately is complete nonsense. He's just completely making that up. And I will oh await goodness. with bated Came breath to for Neff to link his quote. I already did. Sure is not cherry picked. I now just did. Well, I already had, I already, I just did. Okay. Did in the so, private chat? Uh, no, it's in the public chat. Oh, okay, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's so, in the uh, YouTube chat. Do, do no, my takeaway from this do is we're going to end up the, the evolutionist is representing misrepresenting biological science here in a grotesque manner with a with a uh, just a story. So wild types creatures revert to wild type after deformity. Deformities don't get continuously passed on. There's only one example that I can cite in, in history where this happens, and it's a duplication of a, 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 a homeobox gene that causes an entire family of people in Africa to have six fingers. That's the only one we know of. Only one. Okay, uh, so that, there, this, this is an imaginative part of the evolution fantasy. How about the families but, with tails? But what, what you don't also understand is this. What Per Alberg put forth and what the evolutionists put forth is not that new bones arise ex, uh, ex nihilo. Right. What they say is a bone diverges becomes it becomes begins to split at a bone process to become two bones over time. That's how they think these things got new bones. Not you're you're believing something that evolutionist scientists themselves don't even believe. You're thinking a new bone pops into existence because a genetic pathway to create one that's somehow morphologically just the right shape to fit and somehow provide a new function pops into existence. What? We've Even literally just, seen that. We've literally that seen that. That is not what evolutionists what evolutionist scientists believe. They believe bone processes occur and the bone diverges into two bones. That's where the new bone comes from. Not the, a deformity occurs and the creature gets a brand new bone out of thin air. Pow, there's a brand new bone. That's not what they believe. You don't even know what your own scientists believe. You're, okay, you're Matt, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. Grayson, have a quick final word, then we're going to shut it down. Anybody who wants to continue the conversation, head on over to Doc's channel. I just posted his StreamYard link in the chat for people. Thank you. And then like I'll I was do my saying, closing. we have literally seen examples of what Nephil and Frigis claimed was impossible in real time. And Neff even has to agree with it in his worldview because wow. guess what? You misrepresenting the science. have different numbers of bones than wild pigs. You're misrepresenting the science. Please <laughs> mute enough.